Good morning, everyone. Sorry that we are a little late, but we are just we just fixed the last technical issues, I guess. Yes. So, uh, welcome to the second day of the Boleyn days. We will be starting this day with a result from something that we informally call the Valentine's Workshop. That was a meeting on the 14th of February in 2018, where the Boleyn Center met the Human Science Academic Area at Stockholm University and uh, therefore we call it the Valentine's Workshop. And now we have some outcome uh, from this workshop because the workshop inspired collaboration uh, between these two areas. And we have a whole session that is titled Climate Science and the Humanities and we have five talks that are the outcome uh, of this workshop. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing about the results. And the first speaker is Lisa Delmont about climate change, natural disasters, and United Nations disaster relief. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. Hang on a minute. Oh, sure. <laughs> 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 Should I? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Really, this is for the live stream, so I started the Do you have a pocket? Uh, I do, here. Can I put this in here? Yeah. And then just keep this somewhere. So, okay, now I'm well equipped. Okay. Um, well, thanks for having me. My name is Lisa Delmott. I'm Associate Professor of International Relations and I was going to present together with Frida Bender uh, from the Department of Meteorology, um, who unfortunately is home with a sick kid. Uh, but uh, I suppose that's what happens in November in Stockholm. So, um, so I present our joint project on climate change, natural disasters and United Nations disaster relief, which was generously funded, among others, by the Berlin Center. Um, it has been funded between 2018 and 2019, so we're currently wor working on two peer review papers that we hope will uh, be the main deliverables of this project. Um, we start from a basic, well-known research problem. Um, future changes in climate will impact the frequency and severity of natural disasters, both in the developed and the developing world, and we have been repeatedly alerted about this um, by several IPCC reports um, and a, 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 a broad and lively global debate on these matters. National, nat natural disasters, which basically are the consequences of extreme weather events, if they are recognized by a sufficiently large audience as causing damages, the natural disasters pose significant threats to human security these days and thus to the international community. Their transboundary nature they cannot be addressed by nation states themselves, so we require effective responses by international organizations such as the United Nations, the Pacific Island Forum, and there are about 200 int other international organizations um, that could be held accountable to addressing natural disasters. <coughs> So in short, we need to understand how and why international organizations, short IOs, respond to natural disasters. Um, there is a clear and striking gap in the existing social science literature on this matter. There is a vast literature on natural disaster consequences, but these have mainly focused on the influence of disasters on issues such as individual political attitudes, economic growth and media framing. And much data comes from the United States. Um, so we know very little about how international organizations such as the UN target disaster relief funding. So out of the vast repertoire of um, political instruments that international organizations can use to address disasters, to help people on the ground, um, we are interested here specifically in disaster relief funding. <clears throat> to tell you a little bit more about uh, the types of natural disasters we are facing in the current world, um, this is based on um, a, a widely used database by um, uh, disaster scholars, conflict researchers, other social scientists, and also United Nations agencies themselves. It's only also the only database about natural disasters we have. Um, it's called MDAT. Uh, and here you can see that about half of all the disaster types are made up out of floods of different kinds. Um, we see also um, many um, different types of storms and droughts. 
Um, and storms, for just to illustrate one example for you, storms are large rotating systems. They develop over warm oceans. They pick up most moisture in the air. They pick up speed. And then when they hit um, the coast, they usually decay. But they, before they do, they cause a whole lot of damage. So for example, the world's um, most expensive a uh, tropical cyclone was Hurricane Katrina, which you surely remember in 2005, which caused um, the damage of about 800,000 houses and about 125 billion US dollars. Um, here we have collected corresponding data to match with this particular disastrous data set. On the right hand side, you see data from the um, United Nations pages on the types of the, 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 the occurrence or frequency of natural disasters that is funded. So you see this probably we're going to conclude that there's some correlation between the types of disasters out there and the funding they receive. But there's also large unexplained variation. So we're still interested in um, what can explain uh, uh, disaster, UN disaster funding. <clears throat> Just very briefly, some theoretical motivation. We contrast two large explanations for United Nations disaster relief funding. Um, one is needs-based, the other one is political. Uh, and under each explanation, we can subsume a number of ex potential explanatory factors that we will later use in regression analysis using U United Nations disaster relief funding as a dependent variable. Uh, so needs-based explanations, for example, um, would uh, posit that um, disaster magnitude or severity uh, or country capacity um, explains United Nations disaster relief funding. Examples for political explanations could be trade relations between major donors because arguably in the United Nations there are specific large donors who have exceptional influence such as the United States. Um, we could also imagine that countries' democracy levels uh, or, or media co coverage, public salience, uh, public debate and so on are motivators for why some natural disasters receive more UN funding than others. And we expect that these two explanations combine in explaining UN disaster relief funding. So on the research design, we have a natural science and a social science part. In the natural science part, we validate existing data on natural disasters using meteorological data. That's the part that Frida Bender is uh, responsible for. And on the social science part, I'm responsible for um, then using these data on disaster magnitude to regress UN assistance uh, to these different variables. Um, on the variation, uh, on, on the validation part, um, we use different tools such as error interim reanalysis. Um, we identify especially heat waves and cold spells using temperature, but also floods and droughts using precipitation. Uh, and I'm happy to afterwards chat with you about the various challenges that we meet. It's, it's a very exciting exercise. Um, and um, for the purpose of, 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 of this project, we will extract disaster severity parameters or, or variables um, that could predict you and relief funding. Um, I skipped the example um, and just show you one nice simulation that we have done. Um, so for example, for heat waves um, between 2006 and 2017, that's the time span that we can observe. Uh, we, um, it, it seems relatively short, but it's actually for a social scientist, it's quite a long time span. Uh, you get an impression of daily variation in heat spells above 30 uh, um, degree uh, Celsius uh, at least. Okay, and then before I conclude, I would also like to show you some data from the social science part. Here you see the dependent variable, um, United Nations disaster re relief payments in 1,000 um, US dollars. And you can see that uh, this line here below, the total funding received by different natural disasters through the United Nations is only a fraction of our arching humanitarian aid. 
and it's only a fraction of the total aid required identified by different UN agencies that deal with different types of disaster aids and its consequences. Um, and in concrete numbers, disaster relief makes up about 12% or 1.5 billion US dollar a year uh, of total humanitarian aid a year. Okay, um, these are the results so far. I hope maybe next year I can present uh, the, the results from our um, regression analysis and our publications. Um, I just skipped this. Let me just conclude with some broader implications. First, we um, have contributed by relating disaster database to reanalysis. And in doing so, we can include meteorological quantification as a potential explaining variable of international aid, which we think is, was both fun and innovative. Uh, second, we seek to advance theoretical knowledge on the conditions under which the international community responds to natural disasters, hopefully with validated and better um, meteorological data. And third, we um, will, in the future, probably next spring, formulate forward-looking policy-relevant conclusions for Swedish stakeholders and United Nations stakeholders in a policy brief. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. I would like to invite one question or comment, a short one. Yes, I'll pass you the microphone. <coughs> Hi, uh, I was just curious about fires. I didn't see any anything about fires in your first slides. We hear a lot about fires all the time. There are some wood fires, but they clearly make up a, a small fraction of disasters, and it could be that they are just here in this other category. I know there are wood fires in the data, but in, in, in terms of um, uh, frequency and damage they cause, uh, they're clearly minor. Most damage is caused by floods and uh, tropical cyclones. Thank you very much again, Lisa. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, our next speaker is Eva Mahotka from the Department of Asian, Middle Eastern and Turkish Studies here at Stockholm University. And when we are ready with the microphone, I don't have a pocket watch. <coughs> we have a talk on art in the time of greenwashing. Welcome. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity to contribute to the discussion on the climate science in the humanities. Uh, my name is Eva Mahotka. I am an art historian. I specialize in Japanese art. And as uh, my specialization doesn't seem like an uh, obvious fit for this kind of conversation. Maybe I will tell you a few words how I, how I ended up here, really. So I've been interested in sustainability issues for a number of years. Already 10 years ago, I was working, when I was still in Japan, I was working on, I was applying a critical perspective to the analysis of art and poetry in Japan. But basically, I started engaging with the interdisciplinary conversations uh, on the sustainability issues when I came back to Europe, first at the Leiden University. And then I co-directed a big project there. Together with uh, anthropologists, historians, and sociologists, we investigated what is the impact of consumption on sustainability. So that was our, our big thing. And then when I moved to Stockholm two years ago, I started talking or dating natural scientists. Yeah? So then uh, the Bolin Center event, which uh, was just mentioned before, the Pathways to New Collaborations, which was in February, the Valentine Day, was really important for me uh, because uh, it... Um, resulted in the collaborations with the hydrologist Fernando Jaramillo from the Bolin Center and from the Natural Sciences side. It also, and we wrote a paper together with other people as well, and it also introduced me to the Mirai initiative. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's a big, uh, high-profile collaboration between the Japanese and Swedish universities, and they work also on sustainability. And um, that two years I spent at Mirai, 
were really eye-opening for me because I engage in conversation with variety of disciplines, with different people working on, uh, I don't know, engineers, hydrologists, uh, marine ecologists, um, people who work on membranes, yeah? So it was like a great variety. I didn't understand anything at the beginning. I don't really think that I understand it now. But so it's not about that I learned about how the membranes work, but I actually, uh, I think that uh, I better understood these divisions between the two cultures, between the natural sciences and the humanities. And I also learned how maybe we can engage in the conversation, a productive conversation, despite these divisions, because we know that they are basically a major hindrance which stop us from resolving the climate change or other super wicked problems. So I also found a people who would like to talk to me there, and we started talking about a project. Uh, and um, this group of people include, for example, hydrologist Gia Destoni, or the water management specialist uh, Mikiko Sugiura, or Wakatana Betak anthropologist. And we were interested in, um, mainly in the unequal, unequal distribution of blue-green infrastructure in their urban centers, in Tokyo, in Stockholm. So this was our major, major point of when we met, you know, point of interest. And of course, this issue could be addressed from many different perspectives, and this is what we are going to do. We can map, for example, inequalities in relation to ecosystem services and to uh, social and economical factors. But what I am interested in, and what I could contribute to the project like that, is basically I'm interested in the social conflict that are generated by green redevelopment and the role of visual art in resolving in them and also aggregating them. Because art is a tricky thing. We never predict what, art, what effect the art will have on us. So basically, it is a mirror, but this is not a mirror of reality. It is a mirror, basically, whoever looks into a mirror uh, will see themselves. So that's why it's very difficult to understand these processes, but I think that they are important for the sustainability as well. So um, first, I would like to see maybe how I see the problem. So as we know, the cities are the sites of extreme social and ecological problems. And uh, many cities uh, engage in the green redevelopment. Yeah? And, um, but the problem is that this blue-green infrastructure is not equally redistributed among different communities and individuals. And the green redevelopment is supposed to resolve that problem, but in fact, it actually may lead to the green gentrification. Uh, where, for example, the environmental improvement may increase the quality of life, may increase the prices, so the local residents, less affluent residents, are pushed out from the area and the more affluent residents are welcomed. And culture and aesthetics, unfortunately, plays an important role into, in, in these processes, and that's why it deserves our, our attention. So the point is basically to link between the greenwashing, to explore the link between artwashing and greenwashing, uh, and I think that it is important for the sustainability science. So quickly, I would like to only show you an example of what is happening uh, in Tokyo. It's not that Tokyo is unique. Tokyo is, is you know, there are many different uh, cities which have the same problems. But this is a result of the Sumida River Renaissance, a waterfront revitalization project which initiated in 2000. It is very high profile and it's supposed to be effective, but uh, you know, it, the previously, the people who lived by the river, who was very polluted, it's really post-industrial area, very disadvantaged people, they were pushed away to make space for the parks, for the walkways, for the high-profile businesses, for the apartment, and for the museums, okay? So that's something, uh, an economy doesn't explain everything, because equally important is attractiveness of the green infrastructure, really, basically, uh, what, which induce people to engage with the blue-green infrastructure. Maybe not everybody would like to walk and be, you know, engage in walking and being in a park. Maybe some people would like to do the gardening. But the space doesn't invite people, this type of space does invite people to engage with the space, with the blue-green infrastructure in, uh, in that way. So, um, and what happened in the, how basically what happened is that um, the managers of the uh, Sumida River Renaissance try to reconnect people to the river through using the cultural heritage and artistic heritage. For example, by uh, using this kind of images, they are prints, early modern prints uh, produced around the middle of the 19th century uh, in, um, uh, as a model of social and environmental uh, revival. And they focus on entertainment. So here we have a Sumida River by the bridge and people are watching the fireworks. Yeah? Uh, and the, and today, they organize many events like that. For example, they have fireworks in Tokyo. They gather one million people 
in the same place, yeah, in the same night. Of course, fireworks are pollutants, so we can, you know, there are a lot of issues uh, there, but they succeeded on the social level. They reconnected people with the river. At the same time, they contribute to gentrification, for example, by constructing museums of this kind of art. This is done by the very famous, uh, I don't know, architects who received Pritzker Prize, for example, not long time ago. So they contribute to gentrification. And also, uh, really, this kind of project did not generate other ecosystem services, which the blue-green infrastructure is supposed to uh, generate. So the question is, how can we assess positive and negative impact of art and cultural involvement in the social and ecological change? Uh, what, how can we reconcile them? And also, how sustainability science can assess the role of art and art washing in these processes? And I think that interdisciplinary collaboration is the answer to that. Uh, and I hope that we will do it here at the Bolin Center. We will continue that work. And uh, because one thing is clear that environmental uh, issues are not, oh, sorry, the, the, the sustainability is not only an environmental issue, but it's also a cultural challenge. So this is what I prepared for today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eva. Question, yes, Karen. Do you have an example where this sort of development has actually contributed to enhancing ecosystem services? So far, I focused on the negative impact <laughs> rather than positive, unfortunately, because I think that we have this, uh, at least, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in the artists, in art discourse, there is this concept of socially engaged art, socially, and which has a, you know, basically, art can deliver a positive social impact, but at the same time, uh, socially engaged projects are very often co-opted and are used for art washing. So uh, there is a conviction, and there is, there is a number of projects when actually it worked, um, but uh, if I can mention one in Tokyo, there is a Kanda River rev revitalization project where the children are participating. So this is really a socially engaged and it's participatory and they, they managed to redesign the river so it better serves the, the ecosystem services. But it's an experiment, it's very limited. It's, it, has, it basically cannot be repeated easily and cannot serve as a model. It's rather an experiment than, the, than you know, a model, a policy kind of uh, guiding model. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is Jerker Jarsjö. Yes, conveniently sitting at the edge there. Very nice. You'll be talking about functions and services of man-made wetlands in just a second. So thank you. My name is uh, Jarki Jarsjö. I'm from the Department of Physical Geography. And I will present a project uh, together with Human Ge Geography and uh, Ecology, Environment and Plant Sciences DEEP here at uh, Stockholm University. So our interest is about uh, functions and services of man-made wetlands. You can see two examples here. Uh, to the left, it's an example from Halland in southwest Sweden. Um, many of these wetlands are, are actually recreated because 100 years ago and more, uh, the trend was the opposite, that you drained the wetlands uh, to get agricultural land. And now it has become very popular to recreate wetlands for various purposes. And we are interested in these mechanisms and the outcome of these mechanisms. And to the right, you can see another example from uh, just outside Stockholm in Solentuna, uh, where they have created a series of wetlands, so a little bit on larger scales to get other kinds of, of functions. So our interests are, you know, we were interested in how were the decisions to recreate wetlands actually made? Uh, and are there then differences in the functions of these recreated or even created for the first time wetlands uh, in comparison with natural wetlands? In some cases they may look similar, but that doesn't say that the functions are, are similar. And if you, what were the environmental goals and were they actually met? 
And this, I mean, this ob with these objectives, you actually need to integrate approaches in human geography and ecology and physical geography to, to answer these questions. And one thing that is important to remember is that you might think that wetlands are well investigated, and that's partly true. I mean, typically, if you investigate a wetland, the focus tends to be on individual wetlands. So you can, for instance, measure and see that an in individual wetland can trap nitrogen or pollutants, for instance. But the question is on the landscape scale, if you scale up, does this then help for the large scale problems we have, for instance, with the eutrophication of the Baltic Sea or to mitigate floods? Are these wetlands enough to do that? And that's another kind of question. So we emphasize here that rather little is known actually on the large scale functions even of natural wetlands. And that's one part of the research to try to understand that. And on top of that comes then um, the man-made wetlands. So if we go to the question, why are wetlands reconstructed or constructed? You can actually apply for money to reconstruct a wetland from the Swedish Board of Agriculture, Jordbruksverket. And you can do it as a private person. So if you're interested in making a wetland, go to the website <laughs> and apply. It's an online form. And you can do it as an individual. You can also do it as an organization. Uh, you can do it as a government. And you can do it also, it's not only from the Swedish Board of Agriculture you can do it, you can do it from other sources as well. So this is a very complex process to understand how these wetlands come up. Uh, and uh, so we envision that there are many different goals to mitigate effects of hydroclimatic change. We have even seen when we're out that, uh, you know, the kids want to go ice skating in the winter. So you can apply for a wetland, you get a nice view from the kitchen window, and hopefully there are also some ecosystem services, other, uh, you know, connected with that. Um, so you can see the different possible goals. And the basic assumptions are then that the social and economic processes relevant for construction wetlands can lead to different geometries and locations compared to the outcome of natural so uh, processes for the natural wetlands. And that we have to account for. And so the baseline for us is the natural functioning of, uh, of uh, you know, so-called natural wetlands. It's very hard to find a natural wetland in Sweden, actually, uh, because things are changing due to agriculture and the forest management and so on. But uh, we have a separate project, it was presented yesterday in RA7, uh, dealing with how natural wetlands function on larger scales and the ecosystem services of that. So that's our baseline in this project. And we have some money then to monitor and also to uh, do a research grant to, to actually get this research going. And there was one application that, that we submitted to the Swedish EPA uh, about uh, constructed wetlands as hydrological buffers. So we focus on one function to start with. How do, do these wetlands work as, as buffers? Can this buffering be maximized and so on? And an example hypothesis we have is that you know, if you optimize too hard on one function, it may be uh, non not constructive. So, for instance, we think that uh, man-made wetlands may better mitigate effects of floods if they are degraded or not optimally constructed for the original purpose, which might be nutrient purification and biodiversity. So uh, one reason is if, if you have leaking water, if it's not perfect, then uh, the water levels become lower when the flood come. And then you have higher storage volume in the wetland when you get the flood. So that's one example of different objectives, different processes that, that are ongoing. 
So to put it simple, I'll, I'll stop with a question. Uh, the, the question, the uh, main question is if it's rational to design multipurpose wetlands instead of trying to optimize the functions or not. So, so that's an open question we, we hope to answer. That's it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jerka. I think we have time for one or two, or maybe, I, maybe even three questions. Shall I, st I, st I start here in the middle? Thanks. It's very nice to have this overview, and wetlands have a long history. But I was missing one f aspect of wetlands, yeah. and that was especially to climate and microclimate. Yeah. Because when I read the literature for 100 years ago, yeah. Wetlands should be, you know, not only taken away because they provide agricultural land. Mm -hmm. They had such a bad impact on the climate. Mm -hmm. The wetlands are representing places where, you know, the mist are coming. Yeah. And they are also representing diseases and they are representing all type of imaginations. Mm -hmm. Many of those were perfectly wrong <laughs> and was just misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. But today we have also the, the carbon and mm -hmm. the catch of the greenhouse gases. Yeah. So what's your feelings about those climate connections? Exactly, yeah, you have these feedback loops the other way around also. So I think that's an, an important point. And uh, I mean, for some people, if they do a wetland outside of their house, you might get more mosquitoes. So, uh, and uh, you might get another climate, uh, microclimate. So, so that's yet another layer on top of this. Um, my question actually builds nicely on your question. Is one of the issues that we see with a lot of urban restoration projects looking at, at wetland areas is that they put a lot of money into establishing these wetlands, but yep. not a lot of money into establishing evaluation criteria yep. for how well they are at actually doing this. Have, is yeah. your project going to set up a series of criteria that incorporate these kinds of points about the hydroclimate changes and the carbon changes and yeah. evaluate it, some of these uh, restoration projects that, or, or recreate wetland recreation projects I and sort that, of establish that's a, a very checklist? In interesting idea. Uh, the first thing we want to do in this project is to see if the objectives that people state they have with the wetlands, if they are met or not on larger scales. And one example is actually from the very nice wetlands in Solentuna where you can see. We, and they might trap pollut pollutants and so on. And we walked downstream of these wetlands and we found basically an old dump of waste. So, so, you know, clearly you didn't see the whole picture there because downstream of the wetland you have new sources of pollution and, and uh, so, so you need to scale up and I think that's an important point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much again. I think we need to move on in the interest okay. of time and to be fair to the next speakers. Thank you yeah. again. Thank you. So we should have, yes, we do. Uh, Dag Retzer. Uh, from the Institution of Economic History and International Relations. Talking about medieval normative text as a proxy source for meteorological normality. Uh, okay. Um, I'm a historian, so I'm into uh, climate of the past, uh, trying to contribute to the construction of uh, some reference point to climatic change today. Uh, and for that purpose, of course, we use documentary sources. We read documents from the past. And uh, in Sweden, we are not very fortunate uh, in terms of numbers. Uh, from the middle, uh, middle Ages, we have very few documentary sources. Uh, in comparison with Europe, until 1550 or so, we have very little. Then, on the other hand, there is an explosion of documents in Sweden. And Sweden becomes one of the most 
well-documented countries in Europe. But before that, we have some methodological problems, uh, any historian dealing with pre-modern times, and specifically when it comes to climate research. Uh, as you can see on the first graph uh, up on the left, uh, the total number uh, is quite meager, and especially uh, the difference between primary sources, that is letters and diaries, uh, is something that is almost absent in the first centuries and then comes, uh, becomes more common in the 15th century. Before that, it's secondary sources, that is chronicles and annals, uh, in particular. And when you look at the second graph to the uh, or top right, uh, the story of these sources is normally uh, that of uh, abnormal conditions, weather conditions, extreme, extremes of some kind. And the bottom graph here shows that most of these extreme uh, weather data that concerns the winter which is not strange because uh, an extreme winter in Sweden means, for example, a stop to shipping, um, which is uh, one of the important themes of medieval Swedish history, the trade over the Baltic Sea with, with um, uh, uh, the towns of the Hanseatic League, for example. Um, and the distribution between different types of data, uh, you can see always also concerns mostly temperature, that is, uh, statements about a very hot summer or an extremely cold winter. Uh, the problem for us is to how to judge these um, statements on extreme weather. Uh, the question is extreme in relation to what? What was perceived as normal weather in those times? What was normality? Uh, so this is uh, partly a, a story about uh, mentality and human perception of weather which is the first stage to uh, understand how uh, weather was really like or climate was really like in the Middle Ages. And then I, I decided to look at some uh, normative sources, for example, laws, uh, provincial laws that were enforced in Sweden until the middle of the 14th century, uh, one law for each province, and then was uh, replaced by a national law uh, at that time. And in these laws, there are several uh, regulations that has to do with agriculture, for example. Uh, fences, for example, should be mended at a particular date uh, in the spring uh, for letting out cattle. Uh, already, okay. Uh, and as you can see, the dates vary from the south, uh, 8th of May in Östergötland and Västergötland, to uh, 17th of June in the north. And that this difference, this chronological difference, is of course a reflection that these dates reflect an agricultural physical reality. Spring simply arrives later in the north than in the south. Uh, so these dates can be seen as some kind of uh, benchmark for people uh, to think about the onset of spring. Inspection offenses uh, in, the, in the autumn, the same thing, that is, marks the perception of the end of summer or the growing season. Uh, there are also other deadlines that are regulated in these laws. Uh, collecting leaves, for example, should not uh, be done after September 29th, for example. And there are also uh, in folk, so-called folk wisdom, uh, uh, perceptions of uh, typical normality uh, here, the end of the period of safe ice covers, for example, 22nd of February. Uh, th most of these uh, rules are fetched from the province of Södermanland. Uh, and 22nd of February should then be the earliest possible date for the onset of spring. Uh, and there are also rules, uh, or rules, uh, ideas in, in, in the popular mentality about the, the best dates for sowing and planting of different crops. Uh, lastly, there is also a, a huge collection uh, in Sörmland, which I have looked upon, uh, of folk magic or agricultural magic. Here, for example, the first example here, uh, one saying says that if a hen drinks water dropping from the eaves or from the, from the roof on Candlemas Day, 2nd of February, the ox 
will drink from a hole in the ice on Lady Day. That is, uh, is a prophecy about an early spring. Uh, we don't need to care about the prophecy because you can't tell anything about the future from this. But the important part of this is the first part. If a hen drinks water dropping from the roofs, from the roof on a candlemas day as early as 2nd of February, which means that that was quite possible to happen. Otherwise, the saying would not have survived. Um, one difficulty with these um, uh, folk magic uh, sayings and proverbs and, and visions of omens importance is that we can't date them. We don't know really when they first emerged. But there is a, a way of, um, that is, uh, on, against the background of climatic change, these uh, uh, sayings could have grown um, useless after a while. Uh, the dates mentioned in these, for example, could change from one climatic period to another. But then the, uh, the uh, argument is that if these sayings would turn out to be uh, useless, they wouldn't have survived in collective memory. And as long as we can read about them, as long as we can see that peasants uh, follow them, that means that they were considered to be relevant still. And we have a point of comparison here. Uh, from the 18th century, we have quite a lot of peasant diaries, uh, uh, common farmers who wrote diaries about their daily activities. And uh, they have been published to a large degree, so that they are easy to read. Uh, and there you can find confirmations of when and where or even if such ideas about normal weather were still considered to be relevant or not. Uh, and to finish this, this is, uh, I, I don't have very much finished uh, 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 research results. This is an idea for a project that is uh, coming up, uh, trying to cover more provinces of Sweden than uh, just um, Sörmland. But there are great possibilities to map some kind of climatic normality in documentary sources in this way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have a quick question or a comment? Yes, I'm coming. I absolutely love this work. And I was wondering, it, it, do you think this is particular to Sweden, having just very, very people who were literate, they wrote a lot, the farmers wrote diaries, or do you think this is something you might be able to find in other countries? Um, I suppose so. Uh, the literacy in Sweden uh, in the 18th century uh, was, uh, as far as we know, surprisingly high. Uh, in the end of the 19th century, 99% of all adults were literate, for example. So literacy spread uh, very rapidly here. How far back in time that goes, I don't know. But we know that in the 18th century already, we have a number of uh, farmer diaries uh, written by farmers, quite simple people, and where they of course, we're very occupied with weather conditions because that was their way of living. So uh, in Sweden, we are perhaps a little bit more fortunate than in other countries, perhaps with the exception of other Scandinavian countries, uh, Norway or Denmark. On the continent, I really don't know. Thank you very much again. <laughs> we are moving to the last talk of the session. Uh, this will be a paired talk. Uh, both by Per Holmlund and by Kerstin Lindén. It's about glacial archaeology, a new and unwanted research area. And I think you have to explain why it's unwanted. Yeah, thank you. This is, uh, uh, we will have two talks uh, and, uh, within the same project. And, uh, and this is a collaboration between physical geography and 
archaeology. And uh, so after me, uh, Kerstin Lidén will talk about the archaeological part. But w w uh, with this view from, from the Swedish mountains, you can view the, the, what we have seen over the last 100 years, that we have had a, a, a decrease in, in, in ice. And uh, the ice is, uh, and this has two implications. And one, one is that the surfaces are exposed, that has been ice covered for, for quite a long time. And the other thing is that, that uh, these uh, archives of climatic informations, information is, is now vanishing from the mountains. So, so that these are the two aspects of this project. <clears throat> and I will just now give a background to concerning the ice, and then Kerstin will talk about the, the more about the project. If we look at a, a time a, a series of, of temperature here is from this last 2,000 years, we can see that we have a cold period here about 1,500 BP, and then a warm, warmer period here uh, uh, about 1,000 BP, and then we have this part that we call the Little Ice Age. And uh, th this means that, that w glaciers were, have been smaller here, and that they were growing here, and they were growing here. But glaciers are very different in, in their way of behaving. Uh, if you're in, in, in a very maritime uh, area, you, you have wet glaciers, and they are eroding, and, and, uh, which means that they are uh, destroying whatever is underneath. And, <coughs> and it's also that you are washing out much of the, the climatic information in the ice. And if, you, if we compare, for example, with the Ötztal man that they found, if this would have been beneath a temperate glacier, not only the man would have been gone, but also about five meters of the rock. So, so, it, so they are not really suitable for this purpose. But then if you go into more uh, colder peri areas, where you have permafrost, you can, you can, glaciers can look like this. Uh, this means that you, you, they are melting on the surface, but they are preserving everything that is beneath them because they are not sliding. They are stick, stick to the ground. And then, of course, if you go in the high polar areas, you, you, you also preserve things, but, but they have not really been populated. This is also from a high alpine area or a high polar area with, with, with glacier, typical glacier. This means that we have, um, we have two basically polar glaciers that are cold and we have temperate glaciers that are wet and, and warmer. And, but of course, then you subdivide these polar glaciers into two different categories. But of course, in the reality, you cannot really put, put all glaciers into these perfect uh, uh, groups. So we have this, what we call the polythermal glacier, which is w where most glaciers are, because so it means that you have some parts are frozen to the ground, some parts are uh, uh, wet and are eroding its, its substratum. And this is the way a, such a glacier may look like. You have, you, they, are typically with this, they are typical with these long uh, uh, gullies on the, on the surface here, which indicate that Water, uh, melt water on the surface cannot penetrate the ice. So, uh, so it's a runoff. And, uh, but at the same time, you often have uh, silty water here, so you can, which indicate that the glacier has also a, um, uh, a part where, where it's eroding. But, but th th this means that along the sides and in front of such a glacier, you ha have possibilities of preser preservation. And, Especially at this site, uh, a, a sled was found uh, about 40 years or 50 years ago, uh, which was from <coughs> just in the beginning of the, of the little ice age that has been covered by ice. It's now on a museum. And then we have, so we have done mappings of glaciers and uh, on, up in the, in the Swedish mountains to find sites. Uh, I c uh, time doesn't really permit to go into detail with this now. But if you, we now look into areas, we have sites that we have found uh, suitable for, for visited to visits, and, and this was also what we have done. So a glacier, a little small little ice patch or glacier like this, this uh, is what we would call a subpolar glacier, which, which 
doesn't really erode its substratum, so it preserves what's ever been covered. And then there are other sites <coughs> that this is a glacier which is famous in Sweden, we call it's Korsha Glacier, where, where the, we had the first measurements on glaciers. And you can see here is a medial moraine going here. And today you can see remnants of it out here, so it's almost nothing left. But this is a site where, where findings have been done that has been dated and published. And then there are some other sites that we had found and some of them have, we have visited. This one last year, and, uh, and you can see like this. This is a, a perfect place for, for, uh, to make findings. But it's, it's one w thing is that it, if it's perfect, the other thing is that it doesn't necessarily do any uh, findings anyway. But and or do you, you can also glacier like this is about four square kilometers and and half of the of the site is is below the freezing point, and then we have sites for f which are suitable for drillings, for and this is one uh, possibility. We, again, we can't really go into detail, but this is w one place that we have been discussing if we perhaps could do some drilling in the future. And then we have site, th this little glacier here on, on the summit of Kebnekaise is m more discussed in terms of, of global warming that you can see the, this down going trend on the, on the height. But this is also a site where you, if, but there is no reason to believe that any, there had been any uh, uh, human activity here in, in the ancient times. But if it would have been, this would have been a good site to find it. So I will end up here within one such a glacier and with this leave the word to Kerstin. Thank you. So uh, short of time, but I uh, will uh, do this a bit fast. Uh, so glacier archaeology, an unwanted area, of course. Uh, uh, Pelle explained why it's an unwanted area. We don't want the glaciers to melt, but uh, we want to find things that are melting out of the glacier, right? So uh, this area uh, or this research field started almost with the, the find of Etsy, who uh, was believed to have died in 5,300 years ago. And I mean, I, th I think all of you know exactly uh, a lot about this, this particular find. So we can say that this field started with him, but uh, people have been finding things in glaciers or melting snow patches for a very, very long time, and people usually don't know what they find, and they think that it can't be very old, so they think it's more of recent time. So this particular snow show that was found in, uh, on a glacier in, in Italy dated to 5,800 years BP, but the, the cartographer who found it when he was out working, he thought it was uh, maybe 100 years old or so, so he kept it for 12 years in his office before he showed it to an archaeologist, <laughs> and then it was dated. So these are the things that I think that all of you who are out there working there should be aware of. Uh, it's difficult to, to, to um, say if it's old or uh, new or old. So is glacier archaeology good or bad? Yeah, if you're um, Indiana Jones, of course, it's very, very good, but it can also be very bad. Uh, because melting ice in the Arctic is, it could be a nightmare because things are melting out really fast. And the, um, uh, we don't have the, uh, the resources to, to take care of all the things that are melting out. And also, we also know that the preservation conditions for the organic material that we are looking for from these areas are being destroyed when the climate is changing and the um, environment is changing for the preservation of these things, as you can see in this graph, for instance. So we have a, a large responsibility as an archae we archaeologists to take care of these finds that are melting out in order to... Um, protect the, our, uh, our heritage. So we have, there are lots of challenges in, 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 in starting projects and, and uh, regular inventories for doing this. In Norway, they've been doing this for 20, 15 years or so. Uh, in Sweden, there's absolutely no regular inventories except for the ones that we've been before, uh, performing uh, and also small inventories from the uh, county museums in Norrbotten and Väster, Västerbotten and also a little bit in, in Jämtland, but nothing... Um, organized really. 
these kind of things also should uh, uh, include uh, the, the local population in the areas and indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge as shown here because we also not only do we know uh, where the um, permanent snow patches are or the glaciers that would uh, pre preserve these kind of things we also need to have uh, the knowledge of how people moved around in this area so we should always include the, the uh, local population in these areas uh, and also there is a lot of ethic issues in, in, in this respect because people have been using these areas for a very, very long time period but also in quite recent times and this is an example of, a, of, of, a, of an individual, two individuals that melted out of a glacier two years ago in, 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 uh, in Switzerland where the, uh, the children of these two individuals still are still alive. They had seven, seven children, five boys and two, two, fee and two girls who lost their uh, mother and father and now they melted out two years ago. And these pictures, I just show the, I just show the shoe of the, the female here, they were spread out all over the world. So lots of ethics that you have to think of also when doing this kind of research. So what kind of finds do we find? Uh, this, these are examples that are from, from Norway. You can find all these, all these pictures on the webpage called the, the frozen um, secrets of the frozen past, of the ice, secrets of the ice. Uh, and these are Norwegian finds, and these are all connected to um, reindeer hunting. And you can see arrowheads, you can see up to the upper right there's a, there's a shoe, a leather shoe. To the lower right there are um, items that you use to frighten the reindeers, uh, to, 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 to force them to move in a particular direction. Uh, organic materials that usually not preserved in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, normal environments can be uh, preserved in these. This is a... Is a, is a uh, uh, part of textiles that was found in Norway and this is the actual find when it was cleaned and you can see uh, I mean when if you find such a thing up to that you see on the upper left uh, you wouldn't believe that it was actually particularly old but this is dated to 230 AD also before Christ. Uh, shoes, uh, items, uh, no, normal items that you use for cookery, uh, swords, uh, Viking Age swords. Uh, this is a walking stick with a runic inscription. Of course, if you see the runic inscription, you would think that it was, would be old. And these were all from Nor Norway. This is a Swedish find from, from Jamtland, an, an arrowhead. Uh, and this is, this is more interesting because it still has the shaft, the wooden shaft to the arrow, uh, found in uh, Lokkachoko in Norrbotten. And this is the sledge that Pelle was talking about. There were actually three sledges that, that were found. And uh, they were found by Walter Schütten in, in, in the 1960s. And now in, uh, you can find them in, in Aite, in the museum in Aite. We're, it, it's not only artifacts that we find, we usually mainly find ecofacts that can be used not only for archaeologists and, and the culture interpretation, but also for natural sciences. In this case, it's a thrush that was found in this condition. And no one would think that it would, would be very old. It turned out to be 4,200 years old. And there were the heart, the liver, and the lungs, and everything was still intact in this bird. Uh, also, other kind of eco facts. These are all horse remains, horse shit, you can see down there, that was melting out of the ice, medieval horse shit, if someone's interested. And now I'm just going to say something uh, about the, the projects that we've been involved with. We started out in 2017, and this is, uh, uh, this, this, I'm going to show you quickly some pictures from there. This is Marcus Fjellström, a PhD student at the Archaeological Research Laboratory. This is how we work. This is how we find the things. You can see to the right. Uh, it's kind of difficult to, to, to actually identify things. And this is the, this is the result of the datings from the, first, from the first year. And we found the, the, the reindeer that we found was dated to the migration period. <coughs> this is from Korsha, also the uh, glacier that Pelle showed pictures from. And you can see that we're carrying plastic bags. And you can see Anna Schütt carrying a stick. This is this stick, actually. And it's, uh, it's actually fine from um, scientific work at Korsha Glacier. And then it must be older than the 1960s when, they, when the um, glaciologists stopped using these bamboo sticks for measuring the glaciers. Uh, and uh, you can also see that we find modern things here, much more easy to date, because they usually have the date written on them, this can here. <laughs> Uh, and this is, are the radiocarbon dates that came from that particular uh, site, uh, from, that, from that year. And we had uh, reindeer uh, bones dated to the pre-Roman uh, pre Iron Age. And this is from the, this year's uh, um, expedition. We were up in, 
in Silitelma, and you can see also modern items that we find close to the glaciers melting out, maybe actually contributing to the climate change, these individuals. And, um, and here is also some, an interesting um, site because you saw the pictures that Pelle were taking. He was taking pictures of the glaciers from different time periods, and he wants to identify the sites from where the pictures were taken. This is actually, this particular site is where that, uh, there was a glacier expedition 100 years before we went there, and this is the site where they were. And if you lift the lid of this little uh, rock, these rocks here, you can actually find the um, food containers that that expedition used at that time. And you can see it, that they're also dated, actually, 100 years old. So this is just a picture of the people who took part in, in this year's expedition. That's Marcus Fjellström, it's me. It's uh, Pelle to the right, and it's Karin Angebjörn, who's actually working out here, outside here right now. And I just wanted to show, finish up with two more slides, because uh, uh, at this site we didn't find... Um, we, we mainly found scraps, and, and, uh, and we didn't find any, any sticks, but we find other interesting um, remains from scientific work. If someone can help us date this particular item, it's a weather balloon that we found. Uh, there are still um, batteries. We couldn't find a date on the batteries, but if someone can help us with that, we would be very happy, because what we also do is that we actually collect all the, the rubbish that we find along the glaciers of where we walk, and now then we're going to plot them on a on the map and, and see, we can actually date and see if it's winter tourism or summer tourism. Usually summer tourists don't bring beer cans with them, but people on, sk on skidoos do bring beer cans, so we can separate between winter tourism and summer tourism. But next year we're going to move further south. This has all been in, in, in Norrbotten. We're going to move to Västerbotten, because there we've uh, spent uh, some time doing excavations and um, on these excavations, we found uh, what, what archaeologists called um, chewing gums, archaeological chewing gums. It's actually a bird resin with tooth imprints. So then we know that people have been using, uh, chewing on these imprints, and we can radiocarbon date them. And we can also do DNA analysis on the saliva that remains on these tooth imprints. And in this case, when we did uh, more uh, radiocarbon dating, they turned out to be 8,000 years old, which means that these are the oldest remains of human activities in Västerbotten. And in this area, we're also going to engage much more closely with the uh, Sami population in order to identify, together with Pelle, identify areas where people have been moving around and also uh, where there are good uh, permanent snow spots to find remains. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very fascinating. Questions to Pedler, Orr, and Chastain? No? We will be there here. Is one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I know we will. Yes. I mean, how do you actually. When you find a stick, I mean, how do you prioritize where you're actually going to spend money on carbon dating? I mean, you must come back with a lot of. Rubbish. Dating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's the hardest thing actually, because because we can we cannot say we can when we when we do find something a bone for instance we cannot say if it's old or not. So we have to sort of make some kind of sampling within our samples, uh, and um, the oldest sample we found so far uh, from the first from the first expedition was. Uh, the first bone we actually did find, or it was actually an antler at the Ekman Glacier. That Pelle showed a picture from the Ekman Glacier. And uh, when the helicopter landed, we just went off the helicopter. Oh, here's a reindeer antler. We collect that. And then we decided just to date items from all the different places we've been. And it turned out to be the oldest. It's impossible. But this one was actually tricky. We, we started to find small pieces of it. And it, it, at first, it looked like wood. And then we realized, no, they, it has nodes. It must, be, it must be a plant. And then we found this big stick. And obviously, it was bamboo. So we don't have to date it, right? Thank you very much again, all the speakers of the morning session. There is coffee outside. We reconvene at 10.30. And Alistair has a comment. But first, thanks again to everyone.
I just want to let you know, uh, particularly um, uh, people here from the humanities, that there will, and during the closing remarks today, another joint project between um, uh, invol involving uh, cross-faculty collaboration, the Climate Change Solutions course is going to be presented by Arian Gustafsson. That's during the closing remarks, 4.30 uh, today. Han har också ställt in allting efter det här ljuset, så vi kan se att vi vill inte röra det liksom heller.
Men man pressar så många bilder på en slide. Ja. I thought it was exactly 30 minutes I do exactly 30 minutes. <laughs> Yeah. 
I also have a little fluff here, and uh, when I use sort of when the, the approach for theme, I'm standing. Okay, good. Because otherwise there's no time. Cushion. Let's take this immediate. Nicely, so. Is this to drink? Is there someone doing an actual experiment? That's for you. Ah, no, no. no. Okay. Yeah. Most people are like, who are playing? <laughs> 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 We're ruining some setup here. Sorry, I'm supposed to break the ice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've only heard it once that I got such a uh, raspy voice yeah. when I was talking. I suddenly realized my voice is, I, mean, I don't know, I was nervous or something mm -hmm. like that, but it con suddenly affected you know, how I should talk. myself so much for having this bad voice. <laughs> Sometimes you can't do anything about it, you know. No, you so can't. that's why it's always good with water if that comes up. <laughs> it happens rarely, but when it does and you just like you don't have any idea at all. Well, you just forget completely what you're gonna say. And it's like, oh exactly. you can do it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but in principle, I mean oh. this I think this room projects very, very well, yes. even without yeah. a microphone. Yeah, but the mic is not on. It's just, well, I mean, it's on. No, the small mic, they have it on, right, of course. It's not going to amplify anything. No, 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 no. But, I mean, I think the, the sound here is really good. Mm. It is not very large, but they like the room so much better than the uh, beer. Yeah. Although the beer is bigger, but it has... Yeah, the ceiling's too low. Exactly. Also. It's crowded, but it's not. Mm. But I like mm. that there is, a, I used the old film room uh, yeah. for some of the talks yesterday, just because I knew yeah, that I'm going to stay for the whole session. And then it's, I mean, it's nicer that people have that option where they don't have to, you know, oh, I, annoy I, I, everybody I, I, here yeah. by going in and out. So if you know you're just going to see one or two, you can go in there and mm. just mark. Yeah. yeah. And, and not uh, disturb anybody else. Mm. So I like that. Mm. And the yeah. sound is really great. So it's only that one guy who's talking about the uh, 
aerosol yeah. in the Arctic that didn't want to be yeah, exactly. filmed. Yeah, exactly. want to be filmed. Yes. But did so you hear that we didn't want to film it? Well, we ran in here after. <laughs> because I really wanted oh, to right. see that. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, we, they, we have said it before. I don't yeah. know that it's so much in Mark in our world. But it's only screen, right? It's not fake. It is fake, oh, okay. but I think there are still pictures. Um, yeah. Like you see big pictures or something. Yeah. They move from left to right, so yeah. you don't see big pictures, but they are connected. How much? Yeah, I, I think you can, yeah, you can. I'm not sure. No, but I was just wondering if it was only put in there, the then it wouldn't have been a problem for him to be in there. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it does. But often what happens is that when people are live streaming, they're ripping mm -hmm. the recording. Yeah. And so you, you can't guarantee, even if you don't take away the film, yeah. that it's been ripped somewhere else. But it's, shows up it's general it's so hard nowadays because anybody in the audience could have tried to sit and film yeah. or taken pictures of the, all the slides. Yeah. Uh, so it's, or do this like a recording of the slides. Like it's really hard not like to avoid it's things now. to yeah. So it's just better not to show stuff, but it's yeah. <laughs> so too sensitive. No, it's not too sensitive. You can blur it first. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to that guy. Hmm? Okay. Did you want to ask him? Or should I go on? I don't know what he sees with, because I mean, it's such a... Your, 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 I will sit here. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, I think it's easier that, as you said yesterday, that one person does it because there's no, like, I'm not, you know, I'm used to there being, like, you're sitting next to each other and you sort of have, you can do a ping pong, but this seems easier. But we can be here both for the presentation and then we can do the, do the like, individual thing. I mean, it doesn't matter. So this is for the for the for the questions. Yeah, that's for the questions yeah, in the audience. But I will order, order, so you, you don't even get that. You just you just have to have a small one. Okay, good. It is 15 minutes. We ask if you can come into the conclusion after 12, and uh, we will start to give signs after 15. There will still signs from down here, so you can see how much. Yeah. Time. <laughs> I, I, I never told you long. I always end at 8. <laughs> but uh, it's always good to go into lunch. So I mean, all of these sessions have that. I don't know, it's. Uh, I think in the past we have really experienced yeah. sessions in with people.
No. <laughs> no, exactly. No, I can't sit in there. <laughs> okay. stuff on you? Okay. <clears throat> I can also just put it somewhere. Oh, your hair. Um, hi guys. So, um, either you need to, or you need to call me up to do this. Uh, can I, we need to mention the one time talk, Asa's one time talk, mm -hmm. which is in the after your session. Can you talk to the person? It's fine to take a lunch and listen. I can do that. Can you do that? Can I do that? Well, her and I'm just doing it at the end of the session, just to remind. And what room is it? Uh, it's a good question. Arm and sound, would it be room <coughs> Oh, yeah, arm It says. I'm in your party. Bro. Hello everyone and welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, this mid-morning session uh, is going to be uh, hosted by uh, Anne Sorensen and Volker Bruchert uh, and uh, the session title is Carbon Sources and Sinks. I'm going to remind you that after this session at, at 12 o'clock um, there will be ACES, the Department uh, of Environmental Sciences and Analytical Chemistry, will have a lunchtime seminar 
in the Owlman room, which is where the streaming is. And it's completely fine to take your lunch, take grab a lunch and go in and listen to that. Um, and that lunchtime seminar um, is aerosol climatic effects in extreme environments. Thank you. So now I hand over to Anne first. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this uh, session on carbon sources and sinks. Uh, first of all, we were really happy to get a lot of abstracts for this session. So that also means that, unfortunately, not everybody who wanted got the opportunity to speak today. But instead, there's going to be posters outside uh, that also relates to this session. So if you didn't have the chance to go to the poster session yesterday, uh, please, in the uh, in the lunch break or if you're going to the seminar in one of the other breaks, go around and look at the posters as well. There's uh, a lot of uh, great uh, science related to uh, this session there as well. Um, otherwise, I think we should get started. We have six different uh, talks on the program uh, and we'll start with Yannick uh, talking about uh, a database for uh, Arctic rivers. <coughs> <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, so yes, my name is Yannick, and I'm a PhD student at ACES. And the database I'm going to talk about is about Arctic uh, ocean sediments, uh, not rivers, unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's no worries. Um, so I will talk about the Circum-Arctic Shelf Sediment Carbon Database, uh, which is a large-scale assessment and huge effort to understand the large-scale influx of terrigenous organic matter to the Arctic Ocean. And why should we bother about terrigenous organic matter in the Arctic? Well, we know that the northern hemispheric permafrost region holds a huge carbon pool, about 1,300 petagrams, as current estimates state. And uh, if you think of climate change and permafrost thaw changes in the cryosphere, uh, this carbon pool is under pressure. And there are two dominating pathways that were identified by previous research of how this carbon of permafrost is predominantly released. And first of all, we have permafrost thaw at the surface, and there is an increasing number of papers now showing actually uh, evidence for increasing permafrost active layer depth uh, from year to year due to increasing Arctic temperatures. And what's happening there is that we have the permafrost active layer, and the increasing thaw depth makes that the carbon, which is previously freeze-locked, is turned over by microbes, and this emits, emits CO2 and methane in situ. But there are also lateral fluxes resulting from that. There is uh, water, a lot of water in the Arctic, uh, which um, then results in the large Arctic river web, and this sort of integrates and drains uh, the huge areas in the Arctic which are covered by permafrost soils. So a lot of that carbon that's thawed out by surface permafrost thaw ultimately also ends up in the Arctic Ocean. In the Arctic Ocean itself, we have another phenomenon which is very, um, very predominant and very uh, well known, and that's the uh, erosion of Arctic permafrost coastlines. And this sketch actually illustrates of how that is supposed to look, and this is a nice picture of, um, of an Arctic coastline which is uh, under climate pressure. So we see actually uh, huge ice veins and ground ice in this Arctic permafrost, and uh, it's actively eroded. And this happens in parts of the Siberian Arctic, but also in Alaska. So those two dominating, uh, as previous research has shown, dominating uh, carbon release mechanisms uh, cause transport from the permafrost region to the Arctic Ocean. And uh, previous research has used uh, carbon characteristics, so carbon concentrations, but also carbon isotopes in Arctic Ocean sediments to trace back where the carbon comes from, and that to a large amount actually comes from permafrost. So as we've seen, there is a risk for release of CO2 and methane, uh, the so-called permafrost carbon feedback, and um, the, there might be also other uh, mechanisms and other sources of carbon we have to think about. And uh, one of the purposes of this project, the Cascade, is it to bring uh, the knowledge from, from this. So active layer thaw, coastal erosion uh, at a pan-Arctic perspective. So there are also other, uh, other regions 
in the Arctic. So this, this region here in the Eastern Siberian Arctic has been studied massively during the last couple of years. Uh, but there's also other regions which we sort of lack in understanding of what are the larger permafrost carbon pools which actually contribute uh, to the permafrost carbon release. Uh, this, this map shows you the distribution of so-called ice complex deposits. Ice complex deposits are those permafrost coastlines. Or this, is, this is what is happening, those permafrost coastlines, those deep um, ice rich and carbon rich cliffs uh, is what happens if this ice complex deposit permafrost is actively eroded. Uh, and this is deep and very old permafrost deposits that uh, developed during the last glacial cycle in the Arctic regions that were not covered by large ice sheets. So you see here in Alaska, but also here in Siberia, uh, Western Siberia a little bit, um, those, those regions have these ice complex deposits, whereas other regions were covered by glaciers, uh, none of those deposits. And then we have peatlands in other regions, such as in the um, Canadian Arctic, but also in the Western Siberian Arctic. Uh, peatlands evolved a little bit later, not during the last glacial, but after the last glacial, uh, at the beginning of the Holocene. Uh, and then this map also shows you the distribution. Actually, it's, yeah, you see that this darker gray shades here. Here you see a little bit non-permafrost part, but this darker gray, so basically the whole uh, circumarctic land region is affected by permafrost. So what we can say and conclude to this end is that the Arctic Ocean is the main sink of laterally transported permafrost carbon. And uh, previous research has used uh, the relationship between the carbon isotopes 13C and 14C to understand the source of carbon from uh, permafrost being transported. Uh, and as many of you probably know, 13C we can use um, to differentiate between carbon that was sequestered in marine organisms uh, and, and land-based plants. Um, and uh, the 14C acts complementary in a way that we understand whether the carbon is rather contemporary or strongly pre-aged, so it is old or young. And if we now think of what are the main carbon pools in the Arctic, permafrost, uh, marine organic matter, um, and if we, if we bring this into this uh, dual isotope plot, we see that the, uh, we can actually differentiate between the individual sources. Uh, so marine organic matter has the um, delta 13C value around minus 21. And then on the terrestrial side, we have a variety of differently aged uh, terrestrial carbon pools. The youngest and most contemporary one being the uh, surface of the permafrost. This is soils uh, under, uh, as, I, as I told you, under climate pressure. So the soils are thawing out material, which is relatively young compared to the other permafrost uh, carbon pools which we see in the Arctic, such as the Holocene aged peatlands. So um, this delta 14C scale here would translate into a 14C age of roughly 10,000 years. Uh, and uh, then we have the old Pleistocene permafrost, those actively eroded cliffs uh, in Siberia and Alaska uh, with ages of 20,000 years or higher. And then there's also petrogenic or fossil carbon uh, in certain regions of the Arctic. Um, which also have been shown to actually contribute to carbon in Arctic Ocean surface sediments. Um, and uh, what we can then do uh, is, if we have a total organic carbon of a sediment, given, yeah, for example, maybe one or two percent in many marine samples, that is actually the case. Uh, and then, we, if we if we know the delta 13C and the 14C, we can do a source apportionment. We do mass balance and can actually calculate the individual fractions. So. What does Cascade now do? Cascade uh, Circumarctic Shelf Sediment Carbon Database is a collection of surface and downcore data. Um, and it includes data that has been generated over the last couple of decades. There are many studies in the Arctic Ocean and in the Arctic region actually focusing on uh, marine sediments uh, in the individual shelf seas, but also in the deeper ocean basin uh, that have been using those indicators, those um, parameters to understand the source of the organic matter. Uh, and uh, very important is the organic carbon concentrations, but then we have the delta 13C and delta 14C, as I showed you in the previous slide, and CN ratios, and also terrestrial biomarkers that we use to understand source, but also degradation. Um, and I will walk you now through some first results of Cascade. So 
Oh, I, I should mention that, so this is um, based on data that has been generated over the last couple of decades. So um, I think the earliest records go back to the 50s and 60s. Uh, but when we started this mapping exercise and started mapping out all the data that was available uh, from our and from other uh, databases, uh, we could identify major gaps and we, were, uh, we started new collaborations with partners and actually filled those gaps so that we have a nice sort of circumarctic perspective on carbon isotopes and source. sources. So uh, very briefly now through the results. Um, this is the Delta 13C distributed over the Arctic Ocean and uh, those brown shades here indicate where we have major input of terrestrial organic matter and this distributes around the major Arctic rivers. Uh, here in the Kara Sea, for example, Op Yenisei, we have the Lena River here along the East Siberian Arctic continental margin, um, Kolyma River. This is also a region where we have this coastal erosion as I showed you before. Uh, and here is the Mackenzie River um, indicating major terrestrial organic matter input. Now if you look at the Delta 14C, so we see how old is the carbon. We see that in the Siberian Arctic again, so this resembles the region of where we had huge terrestrial organic matter input. The carbon that is transported to the ocean there is relatively old. Uh, while here in the uh, Canadian Arctic is very old. So it's close to actually uh, minus uh, 1000. So th those values are around minus 800, minus 900 per mil. Uh, however, here in the Western Siberian Arctic, um, the, the carbon in the surface sediments, even though we saw that there is terrestrial imprint quite a lot, uh, the carbon is relatively contemporary. So if we go now back to our source apportionment and remember of um, the individual sources and how they distribute in this dual isotope plot, we can um, map out and we can um, actually map out where the major sources, what the major sources are in the individual regions. And these are uh, very preliminary uh, source apportionments <coughs> that I will show you now. So it's very preliminary. We're still discussing uh, the individual end members um, for the individual regions. Uh, so this shows you where marine organic matter uh, is very important. Um, but the more, more, more important stuff is, of course, the terrestrial carbon. That's why we um, did this whole uh, source apportionment. And we see that those green areas here um, indicate organic matter from permafrost active layer material um, coming into the Arctic Ocean. And we see here in the uh, Kara Sea, uh, this dominates the surface sediments in the Kara Sea. And in the other parts of the Arctic, uh, those red shades indicate uh, ice complex deposits, so this is coastally eroded organic carbon. And here we have uh, a strong imprint of uh, petrogenic carbon. So major rivers, and these are the sources. Um, and what we also like to understand are the fluxes. So we use down core information in individual uh, cores, couple that with organic carbon concentrations in the sediments and uh, mass accumulation rates. And then we can actually understand of how much carbon is transported every year. And uh, the takeaway message, and I think I'm running out of time here, is that permafrost active layer uh, and ice complex deposits are the two dominating uh, sources of terrestrial organic matter in the Arctic Ocean. So future ways for Cascade um, are first uh, a database paper, which we will probably submit to Earth System Science Data. So this is an open access uh, format and discussion uh, journal that will briefly describe the database. And the second paper is something where we will perform this source apportionment and provide a sort of a big picture of terrestrial organic matter input to the Arctic Ocean. And the cascade will be available uh, on the Bullin Center database. Yeah, I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you, Yannick. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you. We have time for two, three questions. From the standpoint of climate, the most important thing is how much of this carbon delivered to the ocean gets oxidized or respirated uh, into CO2 and how much of that you know, makes it into the atmosphere. So are there any estimates on how much of that will be buried and essentially sequestered versus being accessible to, uh, to turn, turn in, to mineralize into CO2? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. Um, and there are estimates on this. Um, one way of doing so would be incubation experiments, but there's also other estimates. And uh, a recent estimate um, says that about, I think, 60% of the organic matter, um, so about, let's say, half uh, of the organic matter is respired and emitted as CO2. So 
when I presented you the fluxes, that is probably only half of that was, that was originally uh, released from land to ocean. But, 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 but some of that, that remains that you actually see as the net flux, some of that will also get uh, respired over the next 20 or 100 years. Also, in situ degradation in the sediment is, is an effect, of course, that we, yeah, on the long run have to take into account, but at the moment our database doesn't allow to make that. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, just a follow-up from, from uh, Ray's question. Uh, how far w are we from getting uh, a uh, budget also incorporating the the uh, sink, the, the carbon sink in, for instance, uh, warming creates more uh, more primary product productivity over the tundra and, and those things. So, so what's interesting for the climate is the net flux, how much is bound and how much is, is, is given off. How, how far are we from assessing that? A, a, a sink in the sediment you're talking about or? No, the sink in the, in the biosphere. So we have, of course, understanding of how much carbon is stored in the permafrost soils. Um, or maybe I don't 100% well, understand I'm, the question. I'm, I'm asking about the, uh, the, the, net, the net flux. So, so there, is, there is respiration and CO2 is, is given off. Yes. So there's also maybe a greening or there's more vegetation. Oh, okay. so, the, 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 so the balance between those two, which is, which is what the climate cares about. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the remaining grand challenges we have. Uh, understanding of what actually happens in the Arctic uh, is also to take into account the greening of the Arctic. Yeah, um, But I'm not uh, fully an expert on, on the topic of uh, how far we are away from actually having the big picture. Maybe someone else wants to comment on this. Um, is there a way of knowing if these, of the, if these fluxes are changing? So those fluxes... Uh, in the, one of the slides that I've now rushed through uh, showed uh, sediment cores, and those sediment cores are rather shallow, so they integrate over a period of um, the last 150 years or so, mostly cores dated by lead 210. Um, there's also other uh, cores available, radiocarbon dated cores, and those allow us to look into the history. Uh, so let's say at Holocene time scale, so even back to the last deglacial. Um, but it's very hard to compare. Um, and also those shallower cores, they, they integrate over a certain period. So um, I think to this end with the sediment uh, proxies and cores and time series that we have, it probably doesn't allow us to give a decadal sort of perspective on this. Or not yet. Okay, thank you very much, Yannick. Thank we you. have to move on. <laughs> so our next speaker is John Prithridge from MISU. He will talk about eddy covariance measurements of surface atmosphere CO2 in the high Arctic. Okay, hello. Um, so I made a slight change to the title of my talk. Um, so I've added in some of our recent methane results as well as the CO2. Okay, so this little, uh, this little panel here gives some kind of brief context to this talk. So the Arctic Ocean, relative to its size, is quite a, is a significant a large sink of CO2 from the atmosphere. And it's because it's a productive ocean and it's cold. Um, but also, as well as being a relatively large sink, it's also the, the magnitude of this sink is very uncertain. And this is primarily because we have very few measurements, both of the surface ocean concentration of CO2, which is driving the exchange, and of the flux itself. So that's what this talk is going to be looking at. OK, and when I say flux uh, from water to the atmosphere, there's several ways of representing that. This top equation is one of the more common ones. So the flux is equal to K, which is uh, the gas transfer velocity or some kind of exchange coefficient, multiplied by the solubility of CO2 in seawater times the partial pressure difference of the CO2 between the ocean and the atmosphere. And if we want to kind of model this exchange, make predictions or you know, parameterize it, the part we want to know is K, the exchange coefficient. We want to determine what that is. Uh, it's often parameterized itself in terms of wind speed, 
But in sea ice regions, we also need to take account of the sea ice kind of uh, reducing the exchange. Often uh, the flux or the gas transfer coefficient is scaled by the, linearly by the fraction of open water in sea ice regions. But there are some models which predict enhanced gas transfer in the presence of sea ice due to the enhanced turbulence caused by the sea ice itself. Now, as well as water atmosphere flux in the Arctic, there's also flux from the atmosphere into the sea ice itself. The sea ice is permeable to CO2, um, primarily through brine channels in the ice. And uh, this is a very temperature dependent process, but it's also dependent on the condition of the ice, whether there's snow cover, whether there's uh, the thickness of the ice and so forth. Um, the equation for this is similar. Um, we can model it like this uh, with the, just the addition of this R factor, which is the brine volume fraction. OK, in terms of what we do in this talk, uh, we are making eddy covariance measurements of the flux. So this, very briefly, is a direct measurement of the flux itself. Um, we measure the fluctuations of the thing in question that we're interested in. So in this case, it would be the CO2 mixing ratio, C. And we measure the fluctuations of the vertical wind velocity, W, and we correlate them together. And if we do this at a fast enough rate and for a long enough period to capture the full range of turbulent fluctuations, then we do indeed measure the entire flux. Uh, so typically for 10, 20 hertz for about 30 minutes uh, is sufficient. Um, we normally make these measurements at some height on a tower, say at 10 meters above the surface, but it's the flux through the surface itself, whether that be water or ice that we're really interested in. So we relate the two by making a conservation of mass argument and by then analyzing by modeling the footprint of the, of the uh, measurement we're making. The area of the surface that we're interested in that's contributing to the measurements we're making on this tower. And of course, if we're measuring the flux itself, using eddy covariance, and we also measure these other parameters, like the partial pressure of CO2, then we can directly determine K, the gas transfer coefficient, um, from our measurements. OK, so that's what we do. And this is where we normally do it. This is the Swedish icebreaker Odin. Um, and we've run a eddy covariance gas flux system on Odin um, during its summer Arctic expeditions every year since, uh, well, most years since 2014. Um, the primary component of this system is LGR um, FGGA cavity enhanced spectrometer, which is positioned at the base of Odin's foremast here, and it pulls air down from the top of the foremast, and we measure CO2 and methane with this spectrometer. At the top of the mast, we run this uh, heated anemometer, which measures the wind speed, and we correct those wind speed measurements for the motion of the ship. Now, this is a unique system. This is the only um, operational gas flux system running on any icebreaker. There's very few running on any ships as well. And one of the reasons for this, the challenge in making these measurements is that a large platform such as Odin, such as any ship, distorts the airflow, um, which biases the measurements. And we work with experts from National Oceanography Centre in the UK to run a CFD model of the airflow over Odin from a variety of different wind directions. So we can determine the bias um, from the presence of Odin itself to the wind speed, to the wind height, to the wind direction and correct for it. OK, let's see. OK, so I'll move on to some of our measurements. So these are methane flux measurements measured during the Sueros C3 expedition in 2014. This is an expedition to the East Siberian Arctic Shelf, kind of looking to characterize what methane emissions were coming up from seeps, from kind of melting hydrates on the, in the shelf seas. So we ran our flux system here. We measured the methane flux. And in this central map here, you can kind of see each, each of these measurements. And most of the time, the flux we're measuring was very low, around 0 to 3 milligrams per meter squared per day. Um, but we did measure the flux over some of the seeps that were encountered. And these are these kind of yellow points here. And there, the flux was much higher, up to around 600 milligrams per meter squared per day. If we zoom in on one of these uh, areas, you can see it here. So while there were some very high fluxes measured here, the seep areas, the flux areas here, were very spatially limited. The typical kind of area of one of these seeps is around 100 square meters. So actually, from our measurements, while the seeps were very high, they actually make an insignificant contribution to the flux that we measured over the broader area, uh, much less than 1%, in fact. So most of the flux was measured from this low but widespread kind of diffusive flux coming up from the, uh, from, uh, the shelf seas. Uh, 
Now, although our measurements are just a snapshot in time and in space, we can extrapolate them to the whole East Siberian Arctic shelf and we get an estimate for the methane emissions coming up from this shelf. And that's the one shown here, three kilograms of methane per year. And this is similar to some estimates derived in different methods, but also much lower than some other estimates. Okay. So as well as the methane flux, we also measure the gas transfer velocity during Suarez, and that's what's shown here. So on the x-axis, we have wind speed. On the y-axis, we have the gas transfer normalized by temperature and salinity. These dashed lines are a couple of parameterizations from the literature, kind of well-established values. And our CO2 measurements, which are shown in blue, agree quite well with these parameterizations, which is reassuring, because this is often not the case for ship-based measurements. Our methane measurements are shown in red, and some of them agree quite well. And then there's these couple of higher bins here as well. And these are from actually periods when Odin was sitting facing a seep with the flux footprint over the seep itself, measuring a very high flux. But then the waterside methane concentration is measured at Odin, which is away from the seep. Um, so we get this kind of disparity here. And it shows, again, the kind of spatially limited nature of some of these seeps. So those, that top plot was gas transfer measurements in open water. This is now gas transfer measurements in sea ice, uh, which was we did for the first time in the Arctic. So here we have sea ice concentration on the x-axis and then the gas transfer normalized by open ocean values on the y-axis. And again, our kind of CO2 measurements here suggest that either a linear scaling or perhaps a slight suppression of the gas transfer rate in sea ice um, is appropriate in contrast to this, this gray shaded region, which is one of these models predicting enhanced gas transfer in the presence of sea ice. Okay, I'll change tack slightly and move on to more recent results. So last year on Odin, we went on an expedition to close to the North Pole here, um, where Odin moored to an ice flow. So here's Odin's mooring. This is the ice flow it moored to, and a lot of meteorological instrumentation was deployed on the ice flow. In particular, um, measurements were deployed at this far area here, which we called the open lead measurement site. At this site, I built this up this flux tower here. So this is a similar uh, to the kind of measurements we make on Odin's foremast. Apart from here, I'm only measuring CO2 with this non-dispersive uh, infrared gas analyzer. Reason being that everything at this site had to be run on battery power. I should mention this instrumentation was funded by the Blind Center. Okay, so we were fortunate during this expedition that the, uh, the open lead remained open for the majority of the measurement period, roughly a month. Um, but it was a very dynamic environment. So this schematic here shows uh, the dimensions of the open lead, which I measured with a laser rangefinder, and they varied throughout the, um, throughout the period. And then this, the red lines are a flux footprint model, um, measuring the contributions uh, to the flux, and this varies mostly with wind direction. And then the plot on the right is a climatology, like an average of all this over the, uh, the measurement period. I can use these measurements to in fact, determine the open water fraction, the proportion of each flux that's measured with uh, a water surface as opposed to an ice surface. Okay. So this is a time series from the open lead site. The top panel is wind speed. You can see several low pressure systems passed uh, during the measurement period. We had 30 minute average winds up to around 13 meters a second. Uh, the second panel is the uh, partial pressure of CO2 measured in the open lead at about half a meter depth. And it remained under uh, significantly undersaturated throughout the uh, experiment. It was by about 80 parts per million. And then the third panel is this, this kind of footprint analysis, this open water fraction. And you can see, roughly speaking, the first half of the experiment, we're measuring mostly fluxes over the water surface, or into the water surface, I should say. And for the second half of the experiment, we're measuring mostly fluxes into the ice surface. And for the purpose of this talk, what we're really interested in is the fluxes into um, the water surface. And to, to determine them, we need to take these ice flux measurements, derive a simple model for them. They're very low, so we just do a simple temperature dependent model for them. And we can use that to, uh, and this equation up here, to determine what the flux is into the water surface. And from that, we can determine the gas transfer velocity into the open lead. And that's shown here again with wind speed against gas transfer velocity. And the red line is the regression to our measurements. And we see it's similar, but slightly suppressed relative to these open ocean parameterizations. I think this is due to the limited fetch in the open lead. Um, and I'll just, in fact, move on to the conclusions. So yes, so the main finding from this experiment was the gas transfer was suppressed, which has 
significant implications for the, uh, the global, uh, for the polar carbon budgets, the polar CO2 uptake. I just want to highlight we have this unique trace gas flux system on Odin. We've done five expeditions to date, two this year. The cruise track shown here, and we're building up a large database of these uh, direct CO2 flux measurements, and there's several more expeditions planned. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much, John. Very interesting. Questions? To connect this with the, the previous talk, I'm wondering, has the Odin, have you ever done eddy covariance measurements in these coastal regions where a lot of organic carbon is being you know, delivered to the ocean to see if you can get the, you know, directly detect the, uh, the, the remineralization carbon flux from this organic carbon? We, so the Suarez expedition is shown in this kind of red color. So that was qu quite close to the, uh, the kind of Russian coast. So we certainly saw, uh, <laughs> I guess it's debatable how close, but um, it va vaguely close. Um, and they certainly saw in the water side measurements this kind of these riverine inputs. Um, I guess in most of these, whether we could distinguish them in the flux measurements as such, uh, haven't done that analysis in enough detail to say, basically. More questions? If that's it, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Anders Alström. And this is uh, an invitation that we have extended to merge at Lund University. So Anish is coming from Lund University and uh, tells us about the work they do in their climate program. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invite. So um, I was asked to do something that related to the Bolin uh, Center. So the first thing is uh, my co-author on this work, which is Gustav Hugelius, sitting here of the Bolin Center. So this is, uh, I kind of forgot to change the title. So this is basically a work with a model that has been developed, a global ecosystem model that simulates the carbon and vegetation and uh, vegetation and soil carbon and all the fluxes or very many fluxes and, and pools of, of the terrestrial ecosystem, so land ecosystems globally. Uh, and and uh, in this work, we are basically changing it. This is the um, EPGES model. So it's the Lund Potsdam Jena General Ecosystem Simulator. Anyways, so it's, uh, uh, I want to start with how we normally do modeling and uh, that procedure. So what we normally do is that we have some kind of model. Here it's uh, basically a, a figure of the carbon cycle, just the pools and the fluxes we have in LPG gas. And we normally run this model uh, and we get some kind of result. It can be a time series or a map or something. And we then evaluate to benchmark this model result against some kind of observations or some kind of data set. And then we kind of say, well, this is a good model or this is uh, not a very good model. And then we do future projections and analyze the model results and so on and so on. And this kind of evaluation is something we say, we kind of want to use the best models and so on. So, uh, but it's still very difficult to do this. It's difficult to do correct benchmarking. It's difficult to know uh, where the problems are in the model and so on. So what we did in this study is that instead of, of basically comparing this way and we're simulating everything dynamically, where we basically only have climate inputs, in this case, we basically put the observations in the model. So we force the model directly with these observations. They are not really observations. On a global scale for the carbon cycle, we basically have no observations. What we have is various data sets that are model results based on local observations, and there's a ton of problems with doing that. So 
just to say. When it says observations, it's not really observations. It's maybe observation-based data sets or something like that. So this is what we do. And to do that, uh, we use something called a traceability framework. So this is the only equation I'm going to show. But uh, basically, this is work with, uh, by Ji Chi Luo and Jing Yang Sha of uh, Oklahoma University. They are not there anymore, but when they were there. So basically, if we look at this uh, equation, it looks very complex. But what it does, it's a matrix, uh, matrix, matrix equation. It can basically represent the whole model structure for in time also perfectly. And, and what makes it possible to do this is that basically all models, it works not only on LPG gas, basically all models, all carbon cycle models, as far as I know, have this structure. And the basic structure is they have these fluxes in the pools, and the, the, the fluxes from a pool is regulated by first order kinetics. Uh, so that basically means, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a concept from chemistry from the beginning, so it's, a, it's like a linear reaction. But in carbon cycle science, we can basically say it means that the flux from a given pool is proportional to the size of the pool. So basically, it means that if we increase the size of a pool, we increase the flux. And there's a couple of variables there. So that's basically key. And you also see that in, in the equation here. So the change in a carbon pool, or it could also be the change of your bank account, is basically the influx, how much money you get in or how much carbon you get into the pool. And then it's the turnover rate multiplied uh, by the pool size. And when these two terms um, have equal size, then you get a steady state and you have some amount of carbon in there. Anyways, this is the second thing that relates this very much to the Boleyn Center. This is not a new idea. Actually, uh, this is a paper by Bat Boleyn and Eric Eriksson from 1959. I bet somebody else did this before, but they basically did this. This is how they built basically global carbon cycle models. And what, what I have in red there is their land, uh, basically the land carbon cycle. And at the time, I think people put mo more effort into the ocean carbon cycle. And it was later revealed that maybe we should also look a little bit on the land carbon cycle. But uh, as you see there, they also have two pools. Or they also have pools, and they have the same kind of structure. And they solved it, this equation in the same way. Now, it's a little bit more complex, because if you compare here, they have two pools. We have, I don't know actually how many. Very many pools. So now it's become much more complex. And, and the second idea with using this is because models are so complex, we as modelers don't really even understand what they do. So even printing out all the data so we can see what actually happens in the model just creates terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of results that are, you know, it's super hard just to analyze how a model works. So that's basically the second uh, good thing about this method that you can better understand what's actually happening. So anyways, this is just to demonstrate it. So this is for LPG guess. So uh, we basically apply this equation. So we print a lot of data, and we basically populate very many small equations for every time step. It's, it's not that interesting, the actual way how we do this. But anyways, it works. So what you have in, in the red is basically LPG guess. Uh, the original simulation, we only force it with climate and so on. And in green, we have this uh, traceability framework. So you see some offsets. It's, it's basically perfect for every pool. There, there's some, some problems, and those problems are only the spin up. It's because we have a very tricky nitrogen cycle that kind of mess up our carbon cycle a little bit. It's very difficult to do a spin up. Anyways, that's the technicality. On the right up top there, you see the global, basically go, global carbon. And it tracks it perfectly. And then you have per grid cells, a locally one-to-one -one line. It's perfect. So we can basically take this simple equation and we can represent all the pools and fluxes and everything that happens in the carbon cycle in the model 100% perfectly. Uh, so what we can do then is the whole uh, purpose with this is that instead of, for example, using our MPP, it's the net growth of plants. It's basically the uptake of carbon from the atmosphere. It's about 60 petagrams per year. So it's like six times our emissions. It's, it's a large flux. And this is the net growth. It's uh, about half of photosynthesis globally uh, per year. So we can basically take uh, our model one, our simulated one, uh, where we, well, it's kind of difficult to simulate this. And instead of using that one, we put some kind of observations in there. 
So in this case, uh, and then we can basically solve the whole global carbon cycle for every location and we can evaluate the model. And what we have to the right there is an example of time series, basically of the, of, of the net terrestrial uptake of carbon, uh, which is around two petagrams or three petagrams, something like that. Uh, so what we do, we use a couple of data sets. So for MPP, we, we also create some data sets because some of them are GPP, which is, the, uh, which is basically more, more uh, similar to only photosynthesis without the losses of, from the plant's uh, respiration. So we have like, I think we have six of those. And then we have uh, soil carbon. Uh, so we have two of those. And from the soil carbon, we can basically calculate turnover rates. So that's in this first order equation, it's the turnover rate. It's basically the fraction, basically how long it stays, the, the mean residence time or the inverse of that. Anyways, and then we do the same thing for vegetation carbon. So we have from, from for example, from satellites and so on. Uh, or field es uh, estimates that they have upscaled to global maps. We also have vegetation carbon. So we also calculate our turnover rate for those. Anyways, and then we evaluate the model. So in this case, we evaluate spatial patterns. We basically make a whole map into a, a vector and we run a, a, like a correlation or something, uh, analysis on that. In this case, we have something called uh, index of agreement. Uh, it's just something that scales from zero to one. One is good. And what you have here is the agreement between uh, model and data in blue after we replace MPP. We have the agreement between model and data in red, uh, which is our original model. And then we have also the agreement between the data sets. So there's probably better ways of doing this, but what we want to say is basically there's three cases. Uh, so the red dot there, the red patterns, for example, is we actually have a higher agreement between the model and the individual data sets than the data sets have between themselves. So what does that mean? It's, uh, I think it means, it's very hard to say what that means, and I think a, a statistician can probably come up with a better metric, but it basically means a model is better than the data. But you can't really say that. But we still say that in this paper. So it basically means when we are above that line, how can we say a model becomes better? Right, what's our target? What's our true target to make our model better? It's very hard to say, because we have, we have no room to improve the model and evaluate it and say, hey, we got a better model. Maybe we can change this metric and, and we will get slightly different results. And then we can do this for different regions globally. And there's only one here in the semi-arid, it's actually where we see that we have room. So the original model is below this line, very low scores in vegetation carbon. And then when we change MPP in this case, we get a better model that's above basically the confidence we have in some way in the data. We can do this with soil carbon, very similar results, uh, more or less our model all the time. It's better, I can't really say it's better. I don't have a perfect word for it, but we, have, we can't really evaluate that the model becomes better anyways. Uh, we can also do this with uh, um, global global uh, net carbon sink, basically estimated from the global carbon budget. And uh, that's uh, like an independent uh, global estimate of, of the net carbon sink. So the total amount of carbon taken up or released by vegetation and soils globally. And we, we can just combine all of these various ways to correct it and so on with, with soil carbon turnover, vegetation turnover, and we get like 90 or 100 different model results. And, on the right there, you see basically in the color, not the red one, the red one is the original, our models basically uh, agreement with this independent data set. And then the various realizations. And in blue, you see that's the best one. So basically we can, when we just pick the absolute best realization out of these 100, we can get something that's much better than the model. But it's a little bit tricky to see. They also have these whiskers that are below the red ones. It basically means that sometimes we don't improve the model when we replace the data. In very many cases, we make the model worse. Uh, and this is basically spatially where we make the model worse and so on. But I need to uh, go to my conclusions. So the conclusions of all these technical work, I think is basically what people have known for a long time, but we may be putting uh, different words to it. So the progress, uh, when we try to make better carbon cycle models for the land is, is Partly the uncertainty in the data sets. How can we evaluate if a model becomes better if the data sets are so uncertain? 
And sometimes, in many studies, you see you only compare to one data set, one reference, and so on. And that really doesn't give us the full picture. And I think we need to do uh, much more benchmarking of observation-based data sets and basically come up with a way to find a better target for our models and then evaluate if our models are becoming better or worse and so on, if they're working. Yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. There should be room for discussion. Thanks, that was an interesting uh, talk. What about erosion and removal of soil? So, so that's, uh, <laughs> I've been interested in that in a very long time. So that, that, that can disrupt quite a lot of our calculations, uh, depending on the size. So we, we do assume a closed system so um, basically, if the erosion leads to a very different turnover rate, so for example, it de decomposes much slower or much faster than it would have done in the soil, then we would need to include it. And these results, yeah, we would need to include it. Or, or the results would change. But if, if, it, if it has the same turnover rate, then we basically capture it. But because nobody really knows yet, so I think that's very interesting with erosion and getting a number on, on the balance, just as we heard about the questions here before, the balance of those, uh, of that carbon too, yeah. Just a quick following up. When we are tuning a model or we are calibrating a model, we can do that on what we call monitoring data. But we can also do that on experimental data where we have made disturbances of the system to check whether the mechanisms are correctly described. To what extent have you tested the model on those type of, we can call manipulation experiments with disturbances? So I, I think uh, that you touch on basically one of the conclusions. This is what we should do. And you can do that almost globally too by looking at functional relationships. So uh, we have done that, and maybe this, this uh, I, I agree very much. But we, it's still valuable to look at large-scale patterns in the real world if we can, right? So I think we should combine these. But I think that's one of the messages. Just doing this very normal comparison to a data set is not that valuable. We need to look at the functioning, basically how it responds to CO2, temperature, changes, and so on. That, this is, I, I agree 100%. This is what we basically what also this study highlights, I think, yeah. Thank you very much, we have to move on, so. <laughs> and our next speaker is Perik Jansson from KTH, and he'll be talking about the understanding the seasonality of climate change for impacts on permafrost, snow, and greenhouse gas emissions in Arctic seas. Okay, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I was also happy to listen to the previous talk. And there was one citation, it was Erik Eriksson and Bert Bolin, 1959. Erik Eriksson was my supervisor in hydrology. So I was proud to see that that is still in the memory. <laughs> uh, my background is that I'm a hydrologist and I made my PhD at Uppsala University and was the professor at uh, Agriculture University and that was on agriculture water management and then later on at KTH and water and resources. But anyway, uh, I have always been interested in climate even that I think that I'm mostly a soil scientist. And today I will speak about one study that I've been doing in collaboration with a young Chinese student of myself that works with LPG gas model, but further continued studies on Greenland. And then he shifted to use the model that we have been developing more focusing on the soils. So, what's the mouse here? Yeah. The background, I would say, a little bit like general. When I started 
we did not have many models. We developed a number of models. And we had two different societies, one with data and another with models. And sometimes we met, but it was quite tricky. Today, we have a lot of models and we have also a lot of data. So we are in an area where we should like to make contribution by taking them together. And I would like to emphasize now the carbon and the carbon budget of an ecosystem. And then we can say that in principle, the carbon is, of course, based on some few principles, as was also demonstrated in the previous talk. But there is one issue, and that is that we have two fluxes that are quite big. We had the input and we had the output. And both are driven sometimes by the same forcing factors. So it is easy to go and mix them and say that, okay, if temperature goes up, photosynthesis, growth goes up, but also decomposition goes up. And how could we know about the difference? How could we know when we enhance one factor more than another? Of course, we can look more closely in the textbooks, and we can, of course, say that this you know, light is not so important for the microorganisms. And of course, the conditions in the soil are much more important for the microbes that are making the decomposition. So very easily we can say that if you are a plant, you have one beneath soil surface environment and one above. But if you are a microbe, then you are mostly only beneath. So that's a basic assumption. And those we have in our models. So the model I have been working with and actually, I sometimes feel ashamed to say that, but I started to develop that 1975. So it's quite long history. But if you look to the upper left, you have the coupling of water and heat. And I used to teach that we need to understand not only the water, not only the heat, but how they are connected. In the same, we can say we could not look to climate as a driver for the vegetation and for the microbes, because we know that there is an interaction, there is a feedback. Also, the vegetation creates a climate. It creates a climate in the above of the conditions in the atmosphere, but it also creates, of course, the climate in the soil. Today, those two models, one with the vegetation and carbon and nitrogen, is also connected with more detailed models for looking especially to the N2 emissions and methane emissions. And that is, you know, not the same type of feedbacks, but still, both are closely connected to the other two models. And it's easy now to say that we can play with these models. We can combine them in different ways. Sometimes we only run one component, sometimes we put them all together. I will demonstrate data now from one specific study. And that's partly a unique study, because as far as I know, it's the only Ediflux measurements that have been done throughout the whole year in the Arctic. In most cases, in the Arctic conditions, people have been measuring mostly in the spring, summer and autumn, but not covering the full year. And we had a long discussion whether this whole year should make a big difference. Those measurements are here on the eastern coast of Greenland. And Sorry, Western Coast of Green, I mix that up sometimes. Okay, anyway, it's a vegetated area. We have permafrost conditions. It's not a peat, but we have a number of peat conditions and we have an organic layer. And we know 
quite precisely about the conditions there during five years. And what we do is then, like many other models, we try to tune them, so we calibrate them. <laughs> and then we have data every 30 minutes from this Ediflux tower. But we have also data representing the soil temperatures, the soil moisture, and soil carbon. <laughs> so most of the data are independent input or possible to make what we call multi-criteria calibration. So of course we would like to know the CO2 flux, the net CO2 flux, but we can also constrain it on <coughs> other components. This shows only how the model fits with the CO2 flux, the net CO2 flux representing both the photosynthesis and the respiration. And you could see in the uppermost to the left that you have a type of diurnal cycle, uh, sorry, <laughs> annual cycle. Oh. So the annual cycle is reflecting both the short growing season and the relatively long winter season in this particular environment. And if we make a scatter plot, you could say that it's a mess. It's always a mess. But if we look carefully to the residuals, we can see that the model has been quite nicely representing it. The, the residuals are normally distributed. The residuals don't have a big bias within the days. The residuals don't have a big bias within the yearly course. So it's a relatively good calibration. <laughs> but I, I will not try to discuss the R square or such things, because both measurements and model are wrong. I fully agree with Anders here. <laughs> Sometimes we say that the model is good for checking the re reliability of the measurements, because it's very tricky to measure those things, and especially in these tough conditions. What might be interesting to see is that one particular winter, the outflux, the respiration, is higher than all the rest. Oh, sorry, oh, we, we, we continue here. Oh. If you now look to the right, then you see the accumulated carbon flux from those five years. And you could see this particular winter where you have the blue line that goes up substantially during a long period before it drops because of the photosynthesis, and then it goes up again. For all the other years, they are on a much lower level. So the most important differences was actually because of, of uh, the winter conditions. The summer were more regular. To the left, you have the full budget, uh, as has been expressed during those five years. But now I would like to also quickly make the next step, because this is what we can do by looking to the model during one particular period. But we can also look to a longer period. We can look to 30 years. And when I look to the 30 years, we should of course be interested to see what happens during such a long period if we can trace, for instance, the climate change. And in this region, it is quite interesting that you know, the climate transition is very st strong and rapid. We have a shift from minus seven degree to something like minus two. So we don't need to speak about scenarios. We can speak about the historical data and we could check how the conditions are responding to that. What's obvious is that those rapid change in the air conditions are not reflecting in the soil. The soil temperatures does not have any connection to that, more or less. No. This is the active layer. That increases. This is 
how the growing season shifts, and this is how the soil temperatures shift for the same period. Oh. And finally, we can see the water content, and we could see an uh, indicator for the respiration, how that varies with time. And here we have my final slide, sorry. <laughs> It shows that the carbon is here accumulating in the soil and it's accumulating in the ecosystem. The nitrogen is depleted and the nitrogen is the crucial issue for the long-term budget. We do not get a type of explosion or towing from a permafrost. The permafrost does not contain something in itself. It is the soil and the carbon. And the soil turnover changed drastically when we changed those climatic conditions. So we will be more efficient as a sink. We will not create source conditions. That's my message. Thanks. Oh. Oh, no, no. <laughs> We have room for one short question. So do you think that your main message as found in this site in Greenland would be applicable to a site where the deep thawing permafrost was very, very carbon rich, which is this not in this site as far as I know it? The main message is that the things are happening in the uppermost half a meter. If you are towing the permafrost at 10 meter steps, you could create land slices and you could create a number of phenomena. But the basic principles between the photosynthesis and the respiration does not change with that. The carbon balance is mostly a type of strong interaction with what is happening with the plant and what is happening in the decomposition in the uppermost, I would say, 30 centimeters sometimes. It's not deep, it is shallow. Okay, yeah, we can oh. <laughs> discuss that further because I very much <laughs> don't agree. Oh. 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 Thank you very much, Pierre. So we move on to the next speaker. This will be Edouard Pesquet who will talk about the adaptive role of lignin in plants to ensure geobiogeochemical cycles of carbon and water. It was from deep. Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Edouard Pesquet and I have a group which works on, on a different perspective. And each time I come to the Bolin Center talk, I'm very nervous because I, I'm not going to talk about the ecosystem. I'm actually going to talk about subcellular component within plants. So it's nice because the previous talk be, I've been able to introduce a bit the topic and I'll show you as a cell biologist and a molecular geneticist what we think the overall carbon cycle and water cycles are, which are just basically, as we've seen, a net flux between organic carbon and uh, mineral carbon. And this is based on the anabolic and catabolic capacities of the organisms in the biosphere. And all of this process is associated with water. And for plants, it goes for a water going from a liquid state to a vapor state and back and forth. And this creates a specific condition for plants to be able to evolve and adapt their biomass. So we've seen this already in the previous talks, is that this net kind of relationship between the mineral carbons and the organic carbon is a notion of flux, of rates. And in the case of the plant development, we are interested in the respective anabolic activities of the plants to build up their biomass, how this biomass is in the rest of the ecosystem going to be catabolized, what is the lifespan of the organism within the biosphere, how do they grow, how do they develop, and how accessible is the biomass, the different sources of carbon. So we're working on rates. 
And when we look at where all this organic carbon is, and if we would take the entire biosphere and grind it up to know where is the carbon, it's essentially in plants. So you're seeing we've got a huge proportion for 450 gigatons of carbon within plants. And 80 to 90% of this carbon is allocated in one specific cellular component. And this cellular component is called the cell wall. So you can see the cell wall here. It's surrounding the entire cell. And you can see it all around. And cell walls are extremely important because bacteria, archaea, as well as fungi, also have 80 to 90% of their carbon located in cell walls. And this year, the Bodine Center uh, helped us to organize a meeting dedicated on the understanding of the cell wall. So this cell wall, it's a composite material made of huge drops of insoluble polymers. Some are semi-crystalline and have tensile strength to the equivalent of steel for nanometer wide structure. So this is a compact but dynamic element. And the organization and the composition of the cell wall depends on the plant species, on the nutrients, on the developmental condition, the accessibility of water. So the entire state in which the organic carbon is placed is going to vary with the environment. So when we look at plant cells, uh, we can see that different cells adapt their cell wall, therefore the allocation of the photosynthetic carbon, to different places of this cell wall. Most plant cells, you can see in this scanning electron microscope, they have these outer structures of the plant cell wall. And if we would section through this, we see that we have a thin cell wall of about 150 to 250 nanometer. But the higher plants also have specific cells where they can store huge amount of carbon, such as these cells here. And when we look in their cell wall, they have thick ribs of secondary cell wall, which can be 10 to 50 times thicker than the primary cell wall. So you've got specific sites within the cell which allocate huge amounts of carbon. And these have been very important in plant evolution because 450 million years ago when plants shifted from a water to a land-based environment to sustain the dryness and the loss of density of the air, plants have adapted specific cells with high secondary cell wall content. And you all know these cells, they form for the higher plants in the biosphere, both a vascular system and a skeletal system. You all know this as wood, and we've got wood everywhere. But wood is also in a grass, it's in every single land plant that you're looking. It's just a different proportion. And from a cell biology point of view, this is wood. So what we've got is cells, and these cells, in order to be functional, are dead. So we've got dead hollow cells, and we just have the cell wall present. And these dead cells are assembled end to end and have different organization of the secondary cell wall. So they can organize based on developmental, climatic, and nutritional condition, the allocations of their biomass differently. And this is in order to enable for sure where is the carbon going to be stored, but also, how is the water going to be used during the plant growth? So both the carbon cycle and the water cycle are based on the development of these specific wood cells. Basically, water through the plant goes through a negative pressure from the roots to the shoots, and we have these specific wood cells which are dead and form these thick cell walls in order to sustain the negative tension. They can distribute the sap and the water throughout all uh, the vascular churn throughout all the plant. So we've got this great kind of structure. And most of the time, we think the adaptability of plants is quite limited. But they can actually change how they are going to configure and organize their secondary cell wall based on developmental condition. And they can either make very porous, lowly, uh, accumulating with cell wall cells when you've got lots of water which is available or restrict the porosity of their vessel and therefore accumulate even more carbon. This will for sure change where is the carbon allocated but also the growth of the plant. So what we have is this cell wall made of 
cellulose, hemicellulose, and then other type of waxy structure on top of it, which is called lignin. And these are quite important because I say they correspond to 80 to 90% of the carbon of all plants, and we can see that they're distributed in three different categories. Cellulose, which forms microcrystals which have the tensile strength of steel, quite tough, but they can still be a bit degraded. Hemicellulose is the glue that links the cellulose together. That's more soluble, that's even easier to degrade. But then you have a waxy, impermeable layer, which is called lignin. And lignin has been specifically evolved by plants during the colonization of the biosphere. So in my team, what we work is in reverse genetic engineering. So exactly like any reverse engineering, we take, for example, this computer, and I'm going to break it apart and saying, oh, is this component important? And we do exactly the same thing with plants, except we knock out genes. We take them away. We take one, we take two, we take three, four, five, up to 20. And you can see here, what we've got is two plants. These two plants are exactly the same age. One has been reverse engineered to remove seven different genes associated with lignin biosynthesis. And, and there's a plant, it's here. Okay. <laughs> so you're seeing that the overall synthesis of this biomass not only controls the lifespan of the plant, but also the amount of biomass that we're going to have, as well as the amount of water which is going to be channeled. So lignin, you've all heard of this, and most of the time it's used as markers for specific species. For us, basically, we're seeing that it's a mess. It's been more than 100 years we're working on lignin. We don't know what are the monomers. We don't know what are the enzymes that control it. We don't know how it's made, which cell types. We know it's highly plastic. And we can see that we've got multiple types of units which are interlinked with multiple types of chemical substitution. And we have a conundrum with lignin, is that this is a very directed polymer deposited in specific cells and reached more or less in specific monomers, but it is assembled randomly. So we don't have an enzyme controlling, and this creates a fantastic polymer where no other microorganism can actually degrade it. So what we do is we try to understand how this complexity of lignin has arose. So we take, for example, genes, and this is just a schematic representations of two genes, and we can insert pieces of DNA through the gene to interrupt the gene flow. So they can't be active anymore, as you can see with these little triangles. So you can see we, we can actually compare to our normal plant that we call the wild type. We can knock out genes and nothing happens. Okay? It still looks like a normal plant. And we can stack and accumulate mutations together. And then you're seeing that the biomass itself is reduced. We can use complex uh, 2D NMR to be able to see how is the lignin change? Do we have changes in composition? And changing these different genes is not altering actually the amount of lignin, it's altering how it's made. And this is quite interesting because we can see that this biomass, if this is, I, I think it crashed. I'm very sorry, this was my... Okay, so I wanted to show you that by alterating not the quantity of lignin but the composition, we can actually affect the degradability of the plant biomass. So these microorganisms within the biosphere can actually more or less degrade here, lignin. So, so we're changing around the genetic mutation and see compared to normal degradability of the cell walls, it can be enhanced. Not by the amount of lignin, but the type of lignin that we have. So to finish up, it's just to show you that uh, plant cell wall represents the, the large carbon synth and their recalcitrance, their capacity to be degraded is directly controlled by lignin. And lignin is answering to nitrogen availability, water availability, temperature, and it changes in the composition. So the biomass itself, in terms of the sink of the cell wall, will therefore be directly controlled by the plant to change its recalcitrance. So I couldn't have done this alone. I'd like to thank the Bullion Center, as well as my research team. That's it.
Nice. Questions? Yes. That's very interesting. Um, microbes and fungi can, of course, adapt as well. Yes. But the, the kind of great thing with lignin is that its polymerization is random. So this is very, very difficult to be able to get uh, an enzyme which will be easily be able to oxidize and adapt to this. So what you're changing is the types of monomers. Uh, the textbooks initially, when I started uh, my master uh, in the 1990s, we said there were three monomers. Now we have 87. So, and they assemble at layered structures which are different in terms of density, composition. So you're seeing the, the biophysics of all of this. Is, it's going to be quite difficult for uh, the, for the microorganisms <coughs> to adapt. Yeah. Just uh, there's sphagnums. Yes. Sphagnum mosses does not contain lignin, according to my textbook. All, all the bryophytes do not have lignin. Yeah. But their capacity to be able to expand yeah, yeah. is much less. Yeah. Okay, so it's true that the turnover of bryophytic yeah. uh, biomass is going to be much yeah. quicker. So it might be a more good strategy to survive in some environment, not to, to have lignin. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it could. Yeah. One last question. So uh, two, two related questions. What, when you mentioned microbial degradation, but I think fungi also yes. degrade lignin, and, and do the things you said about uh, the alteration of uh, de degradability apply also to fungal degradation? Second thing, uh, is uh, although it would be dangerous, I think, to g gene engineer lignin to be non-degradable and be a, a, a carbon storage. You actually see this as, as a remote possibility, or is it something that's actually on your radar screen to develop trees that don't decompose so that they are long-term carbon sinks? Okay, so for the first question, yes, when I say microorganisms are made as well fungi, and we can even extract uh, the hydrolytic enzymes of these microorganisms to be able to be testing. So this is what we use towards the accessibility to the cellulose. We use cellulase and see how much the topology of the biomass is inhibited or not by lignin towards its accessibility. Uh, the second thing, yes, uh, maybe not genetic engineering, but we could do marker-assisted breeding to be able to get plants which have the capacity to accumulate more lignin as a mitigation strategy. So you could basically change the type of biomass. Uh, we don't, in terms of the composition of the biomass, at term, lignin will always be degradable to a certain extent. And this is what we're trying to, to be able to estimate. What are the molecular determinants controlling the half-life? And yes, this could be after uh, helped for selection, but also for agricultural product. So that we could get straws with different types of lignin. And we don't even need to use the genetic engineering. Most of these processes have already been developed by plants in specific environments. So they live in the desert or etc. So we could go back and re-get a second generation in terms of our crop industry. I think we should discuss this, uh, continue the discussion after the session. And our last speaker of the day is Mehdi Darvishi, and he will talk about the impact of climate changes on Sweden's glaciers using the INSAR technique. Tarfala. Okay, hello everybody. I'm Mehdi Dervishi, postdoctoral researcher in the physical geography department at Stockholm University. Today I'm going to present the initial result of my study with the title of Impact of Climate Changes on Sweden Glacier Using INSAR Technique, recently funded by Bullion Center within the framework of the Arctic Avenue program. First, let's start with the case study and glacier in the Sweden. We started monitoring a region in the north 
of the three dens close to the Tarfala research stations, which is composed of five major glaciers, the robust and Isfala, the figure, and Stork Glacier are the biggest one. The Stork Glacier is a <coughs> polythermal gla valley glacier close to the Tarfala Research Station. The study on this glacier started in 1947 when the Tarfala Research Station was constructed. It means that this glacier is probably the most studied valley glacier in the world. The effect of climate change on glacier and permafrost is clear now and proved by the scientists. As you might know, the scientists, the scientists are finding that the glaciers can reveal some clues regarding the global, global warming because the, glacier, because the glacier is so sensitive to the temperature, temperature fluctuations. And this higher temperature causes, this higher temperature causes some causes the permafrost to thaw. It means that this processor can release many, can release amount of the, let's say, methane and carbon dioxide. It seems that the, the climate change has turned the permafrost to the carbon dioxide emitter. It means that we need to have a powerful tools in order to monitor the effect of climate change on glacier and permafrost changes. As you know, the remote sensing based data is a powerful and cost effective tool in order to monitor the big coverage of the Earth within the short time and with the satisfactory accuracy. On the figure on the right, on the top, we can see a glacier on the Alaska in the 1941. And the right one is related, related the same region with the same landscape. And you can see the recent one is related to the 2004. And you can see the landscape completely changed due to the climate change effect. And the other picture in the down, you can see which is related to the Svalbard archipelago. It shows that the, the recent study shows that the glaciers in the Arctic are shrinking by as much as 300 meters a year. And that's why it's so important to have a constant monitoring system in order to evaluate the effect of climate change on the glacier and permafrost. Let's say have a look on the glacier status within the Thuidens. And the Thuidens tallest peak lost the climate change. You might have heard this news from the media. It means that the Kepnekaise Southern Peak is no longer the highest peak in Sweden, which is located in the inside the Arctic Circle, 105 kilometers. This, the Kepnekaise Southern or the Kepnekaise has two peaks: the southern part, which is covered by the ice, and the northern one. And the northern one is free ice. And the recent measurement shows that. The, the northern, northern one is higher than the southern one. In the, the, the difference almost one meter and twenty centimeters, which is the lowest, which is the lowest height ever measured. Over the past fifty years, the Kevin Kaiser southern peak has been in, has been decreased by twenty four meters. But I think the competition between two rivals is going on, and let's see what's happened next year. We decided to use radar system as a test of visibility to monitor the glaciers where this area in order to make sure that this technique is capable of detecting the changes happen or even the, me the measure the height of glacier in this area. In this slide, I will provide a quick overview on the NSAR principle, especially for those who are not familiar with these techniques. The, uh, the NSAR product is formed by acquiring two 
consecutive images at the same at a different time but at the same area if we have some subtle or even tiny movement on the earth this move this movement on the earth manifests itself in the phase shift in the radar images and based on this shift we can estimate the movement on the earth and this is the idea behind the insar techniques Generally, NSAR techniques can provide two main products, line of sight displacement map and line of sight velocity map. And how NSAR works, when the backscatter signals from the Earth received by the sensor, it's composed of almost six phase components. The first, as you can see here, is related to the flat, Earth flat phase, and the second topography, and the third orbit, and atmosphere, and the noise of systems, and the last one is displacement information, which is interested for us to be extracted. But we need to remove the rest and just keep the last one. As you can see in the, the first row, <coughs> which is contaminated by some noise, and some fines and some phases com components which are not interested and should be removed. And you can see, for example, in the first row is the original one, and after removing, removing unwanted phase component, we have some improvement. For example, after removing flat earth phase, and this is after removing, after removing topographic, and after removing the orbital, and after removing the atmospheric phase, and here, after removing all these red cross components and unwrapping, and here we have the displacement map. So now, here the case study on the image on the right, and the SAR data we used in data processing was Sentinel-1A and B, which is the C-band sensor. With a time span from June 2017 to August 2019, with the time as, with the requisite time of six up to 12 days depends on the Sentinel O, if you want to use the Sentinel A or B. But with combination of two satellites, we can have the image with the requisite time of six days, including 133 descending mode and 135 sending mode including both polarization VV and BH. And here you can see in the center of the scene, this is the ore case study, including ore glaciers, and the green rectangle is related to the extent of the image in the descending mode, and here you can see the satellite pass, and here shows the line of sight of the satellites. So, and the red rectangle related to the ascending mode. If we want to have 3D displacement vector, we need to combine two different SAR geometry mode in order to extract or decompose its displacement vector. If we can do this, then in the final product, we have the displacement vector on the west and east and down up on the object on the surface. And here you can see the initial result. The result superimposed on the high resolution national dam of Sweden's two meters. Here we can see the line of sight displacement ascending. The blue color with the positive value means that the distance between the sensor and the object on the surface is increasing and the opposite is the case for the negative value and the red color. And here we can see the result of for descending mode. After combining two SAR geometry and decompose, decomposing the displacement vector, here we can see the displacement west and east and displacement in the vertical dis displacement down and up. And you can see the total displacement, for example, for this side of the glaciers is increasing, and for this one, decreasing. It means that how much glacier loss 
or gaining in the vertical directions. And this, for example, shows that this part of the glaciers is moving to the east, and this part is moving to the west. And here we have some results, extracted value on the cross section on the, over the glaciers, and you can see, for example, the, the rate of displacement is not even through the, through the glaciers from the top to the down, and you can see the variation is completely different. And, and he, this map, which is most important than the others, shows that the, the, red, the red region shows that this area experienced the mass loss, and only these two small parts experienced some gain within these two years. And here we, we can see a quick time series So this is the video file, but I don't know, it doesn't work. Is it the same on the next one? Yeah. Yep, I have two video files. Yeah, it's, it's working now. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so. Maybe it's just slow, like if it's like a big file. No, this one. It's really pure here. Hmm? Oh, you can see the time series from the June 2017. In the center of the scene, you can see the evolution of the glacier starting losing the mass. And you can see we have some other glaciers around the center of the scene. And you can see the changes of the permafrost within two years. And you can see this time that's referring to the date of each data acquired by Sentinel-1 data, almost six days. And you can see we, we had most changes in the center of the scene. <coughs> and then in the end, you can see the result in the 3D model of the things. You can see here in the middle is our case study, and the red color is referring to the or glacier, and you can see the valley is almost green, which refers to the stable part. And also, we notice that some other glaciers close to our case study here, here, here. Those experience some mass loss. In the end. Uh, the, the result of this study shows that the Sentinel-1 has a great potential for glacier and permafrost monitoring, and InSAR product can provide some input for glacier modeling, ice sheet modeling, and mass balance estimations for other disciplinary. And soft data shows that it's capable with the shorter visit time of six day to provide the high accuracy data in order to estimate the mass balance of the glaciers. And in the next step, we want to validate our result with the grand measurements and then calculate the mass losses of the glaciers for five major glaciers close to the Tarfala stations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Miri. For the sake of time and because we have the talk now by Julia Schmale in Alman Salen, I would like people that want to discuss your talk with you to do this after this session. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for coming to this session.
kunna matcha med vår icebreaker på Mike.
Det är för, från din gamla. Kan du uppdatera den? Eva, kom med datorn och äh, sticken. Mm. Det här... är, det, är det inte länkad eller? Nej, inte rätt. Är den där? Ska du låna? Ja. Du får bara visa hur man gjorde. Vi får bara stoppa den i fickan. Och så den här andra klipsen. Jag tror att det var ingen mer. Det är inte länkad. All right, welcome back after the lunch break. Uh, we have a two-hour session now, which has a um, geographical focus. It's a session on Greenland. It's a little bit longer because we had lots of activities uh, during the last summer in Greenland. And I will, when Martin is ready, hand over to Martin, who is chairing the session. And also we will start with his rider expedition. Thank you, Nina. So I will talk about the rider expedition. I will give an introduction to the rider expedition and I also will actually give some results. Um, one of the reasons I will give results is that um, also from the oceanography part is because Johan Nilsson who was supposed to do that, he is in Boston. And then we had Christian Strande who's going to do the oceanography. He actually got a daughter two days ago. So, so it's, it's a good reason for that he's not here. And uh, Matt Reagan. I'm also going to present some of his results regarding the sediment uh, parts. But after that, we have a set, uh, set of speed talks that I will introduce as they come along. So the first part, and then we will move on to another part of Greenland. So the first part here on this Greenland session will, will be about this rider expedition. So you will hear about what rider is and everything. So this is a glacier that is far up on the northwestern Greenland. And no one had ever been in the marine part there before with any ship. So we thought this was quite special. So we actually reached out to Explorers Club and asked if we can do this like a flag expeditions, which they have. And they said yes. So we actually carried one of these flags as well, expedition number 51, which we thought was extra fun to do. So you can see all the, the groups involved here or all the different uh, universities and um, 
organizations. Primarily, this was a Swedish U, uh, and US collaboration, but there were also Danish uh, participants and also from Canada. Here is the very long uh, list of scientific party. We were 40 scientists, so I'm not going to go through them all, but you will meet some of them here today. So this is the actual uh, whole group here on, on Icebreaker Oden in front of the Rider Fjord, which is, or actually it's called Sheeran Ospon Fjord, which is the fjord we went into. So what is then Rider Glacier? Rider Glacier is located on the northwestern top of Greenland here. And uh, you can see that you have uh, brighter colors here. This is flow velocity of the Greenland ice sheet. And you can see that they flow out in ice streams here in, in several areas. And Ryder Glacier is the second largest of all the ice streams up here. The largest one is Peterman Glacier, which we had an expedition to in 2015. So we have sort of specialized now on the northwestern corner here. One of the reasons that we do this is, of course, the Swedish icebreaker Odin, because we are uniquely equipped to go there. I think there is almost no one else that can go there because of this icebreaker. So we are in a good position to do this. Here you see Ryder Glacier's ice tongue. It has a floating extension of the ice stream that goes into the ocean. So this is a floating part. These are really important, these ice tanks, because they also resist, the, provide what is called a buttressing force on the streaming ice of Greenland. There are not that many left. I will get to that in, in a short while. But that's another one of these main reasons why we went up here. This glacier was first described in 1917 of Lage Kock and Knut Rasmussen, who had the second Thule expedition up here. Then they were not in the marine part here, they were walking around on, on land here, actually. So uh, the main motivation of this, I would say this is a very cross-disciplinary expedition. There were 40 scientists from many, many different fields, and you would actually hear a selection here a little bit later here. I tried to come up with some key words here. Rapid changes, marine cryosphere, sea level rise, human colonization, ecologi ecological evolution. So it really spans very, very broadly. Here is the long list of, of scientific questions we have. And I will mainly speak about the dynamics of the green and ice sheet or actually the marine coupling up here, which is the, one of the bigger projects that knit together many of these smaller components. Up here on northwestern Greenland, we have, or entire northern Greenland, we have three floating ice tongues left. Uh, a few years ago, there were five. Now there are only three. And um, they have actually been losing quite a lot of mass. Ryder Glacier has been actually sustaining a little bit better than the other. That was one of the reasons we went up there. Why has this one not calved off as much as the other ones? But it's, if you go back in only like a couple of decades ago, we had much more, several more ice, floating ice tanks up around the Greenland here. We had down in Jakob Sound here, we had a very important one, which lost in the, in the end of the 90s. And that, after that happened, there is a complete change of the environment. You get much, a lot of icebergs just calving directly from the grounding line of the glacier. This is not happening here. We have the floating ice tanks, tanks still. So... If I go into just trying to illustrate why we are so interested in this particular part of Greenland, another one is that we have what we call the marine coupling. That means that the Greenland ice sheet is pressed below sea level. You can see this is a map showing the bed elevation of Greenland, and everywhere you have blue, it's below sea level. And you can actually see three really interesting areas where you have a coupling to the interior of Greenland, which also pressed below sea level, and the northwestern part is one. So we call it these the, the three major marine couplings of the Greenland ice sheet. These are the areas which are so difficult to put a good prognosis of future sea level, sea level rise. These are the sensitive areas. This is where things can happen really fast. It's not just regular melting. It's the interaction with the ocean. So that is one of the major part there. How does the ocean interact with these parts? Because warmer influx of water is, is the main, I would say, threat, but that's the main reason why this glacier can really all of a sudden start to lose mass very, very fast. So that was one of our motivation. Come up there and actually do oceanographic measurements. Look how the seafloor looked like, because that's also very important. Because if there are thresholds in front of the uh, sills in front of the glaciers, which actually prevent the warmer water to come in, it can mean a great deal. 
And since we had absolutely no data whatsoever from these fjords up here, we had no idea if there even was a sill in front of the glacier or not, or if the water has sort of complete free flow in towards the glacier. So trying to constrain better models in the future for predicting sea level rise, that's another one of these big motivations. So we feed the results in for better numerical modeling. Okay, so um, another thing I used to bring up is that you always see that the Greenland ice sheet is about 7.2, 7.4 meter. If you melt the whole Greenland ice sheet, that's not really plausible that that's gonna happen in the foreseeable future, but a great deal can happen and quite fast. So putting constraints on the timing and how much is another one of these motivations. In 2017, when they had the Thule expedition, Knut Rasmussen and uh, Lager Koch went up and they did heroic mapping around here. And they, you can actually see Ryder Glacier here. And you can see the ice tongue floating out here. This is extremely important information for us is these historical maps, because that means that we get the constraint on where the ice tongue was back in that time, and then trying to project that and compare that with the satellite records, which comes in from 1979 about. So uh, remember this, and I'm gonna show it on another map here. I think we're gonna hear something about, or I know we're gonna hear something about the wolves later on in this expedition, because this is the, by far the most exciting expedition I, I've been to, and the most difficult challenge to even get there. And one of the big things were wolves. And we're gonna hear about that later. But when I started to read about the history here, it's, it's, it's actually one of the few times I've read that one of these persons, there were two, two of seven members that got lost or died during this expedition. One they think were killed by wolves. And you will hear later on why these wolves, they seem to be a bit diff different, these wolves up here. So, um, okay, so here is a satellite image. Um, and this is from 2010. And now we're first, first look at Peterman Glacier, which is the biggest of them, which was the focus for our last expedition. Peterman has lost about 40% of his ice tongue since uh, 2010. There have been these major calving events, so they broke off huge chunks of this floating, floating ice tongue. I, I swapped bet, swap between tongue and shelf, but we call actually these ones ice tongues when they are constrained in fjords. But in, when you're in Antarctica, we normally say ice shelves. But, so that it can be a little bit of confusion. But it's, it's literally the same thing, just a little bit of the surrounding that is different. So here in 2012, they, it broke up this very large, uh, big flow. And I've started to use what I call Manhattan units. It's because I lectured a lot in, in the States and they never know about Öland or Stockholm or anything, but everybody know about the size of Manhattan. So, to put it in perspective, we started with this Manhattan unit. So this is a Manhattan unit, and you can see that it's a quite large chunk that actually calved off there in Peterman in 2010. Another calving happened in uh, 2012, and then the ice uh, tongue got back here, uh, back to this red line here. And now it's about at this distance. It has expanded a little bit, but it's about back here. At the same time, Ryder has actually been quite stable. And if you go back the last 40 years, Ryder has been quite stable. If we go further back, Ryder has lost all of its part from here. This is the line which Lager Koch draw in from Ryder. It's pretty easy to put it into this map here. The fact is that these enormous icebergs, they're prob probably reminiscence from this last calving. We don't have satellite images, so we can't track them, but it must be so. So they're still entrapped in here. And that tells you something about the sea ice, which is the most difficult in the Arctic here in the Lincoln Sea. The ice, it takes a long time, or if it even gets out from here, from the calving events here. So these fjords can be very easily clogged. Okay, so that was one of the things. Why have these two behaved so differently? So we went up there. We had a full feather program with marine geophysical mapping, uh, coring, uh, we had, uh, we even used plankton nets to take foraminiferous. Helen is here somewhere. Uh, we're actually working with those data. And we had, we had such a broad spectra of, of science here going on. We had land teams that were looking at the raised beach levels. So we, every day we flew with a helicopter with teams into land. We had lake drilling. I'll show you a little bit from that. 
So it was, and, and we even had an archaeology component for looking for human colonization up here, and they did find some really interesting finds. And I came from a lot, my life of it, not to understand how they could live up here, but it's a beautiful area, but it must have been quite harsh. So here you can see in this area everything we collected. Sediment cores, a lot of CTDs, which are the white dots here, the stars are the sediment cores. A lot of land camps of different source. Uh, Multi-beam mapping. When we came up here, we had no idea how the seafloor looked like, so we had to start to map our way in, which wasn't that easy, actually. This is from Peterman, where we did a similar campaign in 2015. And now we had also a chance to go back and do more oceanographic measurements so we could compare these two areas. So here is, again is Icebreaker Odin. Just to give you uh, some hint of how it looks like in the Lincoln Sea, which is the worst I've ever been to in, in the Arctic. It's, it's horrendously difficult sea ice. This more looked like, almost like a glacier because it could be five, five meter thick sea ice and almost impossible even for Odin to go through. So we have to break up and make a little hole where we can get the piston core down. But eventually, inside of these fjords, it's much easier to move around. Um, but when we came up there, we know that there was a big risk that we were not going to manage this expedition. So it was a little bit of psychology with everybody that took part of it and also with the captain. We had lots of discussion, how are we going to do this? But everybody were, of course, very enthusiastic of getting in there, but you have to lower expectations. And when we came up to finally broke our way up to the fjord, we know these big icebergs existed in there, but we couldn't really envision it until you got there. So this is the first helicopter flight I made on the entrance to the fjord. This ice flow is about seven, eight kilometers long, and that was the entrance to the fjord. <laughs> and how you convince the captain to go there, that's... <laughs> That's not so easy. So we had a lot of discussion. How do we do this? And of course, he did not go in there. So, but the fact is that these icebergs, they are moving around. So we spend a lot of time of, of looking at satellite images that we got daily to track them. We put transponders on them. And we realized that they're moving around so much that the risk for us to be completely stuck is not that big even though sometimes we had to go through passages like this and then you have a break off and it looks like that. It's not, that's Odin for scale. So we had sort of these in between us and the entrance of the fjord. But Eric is the most fantastic captain you can work with and he was actually persuasible. So just to give another scale of these fjords because first of all, we had no data from there. And another thing a captain don't want to do is go in where there's not any measurements so you don't know the seafloor. There could be heights in here that he can run aground on. Uh, so we couldn't just go in. We actually had to map our way in like that with Odin's multi-beam looking at the sides systematically. It took us 15 days in here to, to map out all the areas. That is Odin there and that is Odin in Peterman Fjord. And then you sort of see the scales of these fjords. They're enormous, they're about 20 kilometers wide. So it takes a while to map them and to, to work with them. It's, it's really, really, really large settings. There is Ryder Glacier coming out with its ice tongue. And then we had this big calm piece here, the, the big iceberg here in front, which was moving around. So we wanted to map all the way up here, but that one was actually fixated here for a while, but then it moved out so we could do it, could get in there. Peterman Glacier, you have the uh, ice tongue out here. So just to show you a little bit how they moved around, there was a pattern to the, how they moved around, which is not completely resolved yet, why we had that particular pattern, but I think I need to do like this now. <coughs> but there you can see, these are the big flows, how they actually move around in the fjord. So they're really, really, really moving around here. So essentially, during our time, one of these could go through half of the fjord, and some of these went almost through the entire fjord system. So it was for us a matter of finding our way here, doing mapping, doing coring, putting out our stations, and doing everything we needed to do to collect the data. So here is Ulf Hedman from the Polar Secretariat putting out one of these transponders that, that broadcast the GPS signals so we could, could put track on them, because we couldn't fly every day with a helicopter because of the weather conditions, etc. This is uh, the ice tongue of Ryder Glacier. 
And here you actually see a one big new crack forming. So this will be a big calving event eventually here. This is not that far in. In Peterman, there is a very big crack that is so big that it's actually already could be considered that you have a new calving event because it's detached completely from the ice, ice tongue. So Peterman will lose another big chunk. It, in glaciologically, you can ask Nina about that, but it has already lost it <laughs> because it's decoupled from the rest of the ice tongue. Okay, so that is sort of the, the main part of the expedition, how we got there, what we had to do logistically. And I will spend the last 15 minutes here or so, or 10 to 15 minutes, to show some of the results. We just came home. It's not that long ago. We came home in, in September. So the results are coming and coming, but there are quite a lot that came already during the expedition. So I will show a little bit of the geophysics, marine geology geophysics, which was the PIs are Matthew Reagan and Brian Calder. I will show a little bit of the oceanography. The PIs are Johan Nilsson and Christian Stranne. I will show a little bit of the, uh, just showing because I think they're so beautiful, some records from Lake Service that we actually did with one of our sonars that we took in and I was rowing a little rubber boat <laughs> over the lakes. But it, the records are so nice. So they use them for pinpoint the coring targets. And, um, and then from there on, we move on to, to hear other results. So the first question was here, what is happening in terms of warm water inflow towards Ryder? There are no observations before, so we didn't really know. We know that Atlantic water comes in, or it actually goes all the way from the Fram Strait, recirculates in the, in the Arctic, and it finds its well over the shelf north of Greenland, come in the Lincoln Sea, and it goes in to come in here to Piedmont Glacier. That was known. We have about 0.3 up to 0.5 degree warm water that really goes in and affect and thin Piedmont Glacier. That we did know. But what happened in Ryder we did not know. So number one was that we could establish that warmer water is also flowing in here in the same fashion as it does in uh, Piedmont Glacier. You can see that I'm already here showing that we completely mapped Ryder. Uh, and I will get into that in a while. But you can see two prominent features here. First, there is a seal here, there is a seal here, but there is also a seal here, which I get back to. So the, the interaction here between the bathymetry and the warmer water inflow is very, very important. So that's another one of the results. So here is the, the detailed picture of that. So now we're looking at Rider here, a cross section, or actually you see it from the profile from that angle, and you see Peterman in a from this part here. So the ice tongue is here and the ice tongue is here. This is Ryder, this is Peterman. And here you can see there is an outer seal. When I see, say seal, I mean a shallower part of the fjord bathymetry. The fjord itself is about eight, nine, 900 meter deep and it's about 1100 meter deep. And you can really see how the glacier in the past has excavated the fjord here and created this massive seal out in the front. This is material that the glacier put, pushed up. The outer seal in Ryder is equally large as this one, but it's a, very it's a bedrock feature, and we don't find the sediments to the same way. So this is the first obstacle the warm water has to pass through, and then there are two passages here, one of 475 and one 375 meter. In Peterman, we have one of 443 is the deepest spot here. So warmer water is coming in over this hill. But then this was the, well, this was a new finding too, but this we absolutely did not expect. There is an inner seal in Ryder, a very big one, much shallower than this one, and really put the blockage to the water to the inside. So the first thing that we saw is that, yes, this probably make a whole lot of difference. And maybe this already is the ex explanation for the different behaviors once Ryder has got all the way back here. And putting together all the oceanogra oceanographic data, we see that it really has an effect. Here you can see the warmer Atlantic water coming in out over the outer sill. But when it comes to the inner sill here, which is shallower and provides a much bigger blockage, it doesn't really go back. There is a little bit of an entrance on the side here, and it goes in and it interacts with the ice shelf and the grounding line but we do not get the same water temperature as we have in, in Peterman. So we see that it doesn't have the same effect at all on melting of, of the rider at the present location. We believe this is actually the main key point for this 
why it has behaved so differently. So this is a, a paper that we have, pre well, actually completely com completed. Uh, we left behind some temperature buoys. These are buoys uh, made by the KTH, and it's Nina's project, really. They call the Lutus buoys, and uh, Nina's students, Abhay and Felicity, sitting somewhere here, probably. They named them to Martin and Nina because we paid for one each. <laughs> and that means that they, they very cynically were going to drown us and kill us. <laughs> so you can see the crosses here. We are left behind. But I do think in one year, Nina and I are going to resurrect and then provide temperature data here. So we, they strategically put it on the top of the seal here and then in the entrance where the water, warmer water comes in here on the side as well. So that will be very exciting if we get those records in a year from now. Um, another thing that was very surprising, very, very surprising, we have not resolved why, but it was immensely warm in the upper water in, in, in the Sherrod Osborne Fjornet Rider. These are surface temperature measurements down to a depth of about six, eight meters. We had actually up to six, seven degree warm water. This we could never even imagine. We thought there were all sorts of measurement problems, but this is actually measurements from the ship all the time. The white you can see are up in about half a degree, and then the red, or even less, colder, and the red here are even more than three and a half degree, and you can see how this sticks out. We have not really figured out, you one and Christian are working on it. They think maybe this has to do with that it was a very warm summer, but also that there is very little wind in there. So we had no mixing really, and, and maybe that is one of the reasons. But it's not resolved. But it turned out that we tried to look at some longer term satellite data, and, and there is an anomaly in this fjord over the last years. But this is immensely, it's a huge difference. It's hard to grasp how, diff how big a difference it is. Um, the other thing when it comes to the sediment cores, we know we have fantastic records. We, we want to go back and reconstruct the ice tongue and the ice um, stream behavior over the, since the Holocene, because that is when the ice retreated back in here. You can see how much sediment these, uh, even the ice shelf is or ice tongues are providing. This is the chocolate, very, very, very fine sediments. And we took transects of sediment cores, and Matt has already started to look at this, and he can see some very distinct packages here where you have more ice rafting, which most likely is when the ice tongue has been away. So you call directly from the grounding line. We have no dates of this yet, so we don't know when this is happening, if it is in the early Holocene, etc. In Pietman, we actually had a period in the early Holocene when the ice tongue was completely gone. And then it grew back again in somewhere around two, 3,000 years ago to become an, a permanent feature that goes back and forth. So this is ongoing work. I just wanted to show this. This, is, uh, the, this, this may look ridiculous, me rowing <laughs> with this device, but it created fantastic records so they could actually do uh, lake coring and pinpoint the best locations for it. We had uh, a radio-controlled little multi-beam mapping device that we could control over the lake and do multi-beam mapping. The idea was to send this before Odin, actually, when we came into unmapped areas, but it turned out it was a little bit too little for that target, actually. It felt like putting in something into a horrible scenario. We would have lost it, really. So it, it ended up that we did this along, worked with this one along the shores and also in the lakes. And there it was fantastic. So the lake team took some really nice sediment cores, which are they're going to look also look at uh, ancient DNA in, but also reconstruct climate from very, very different aspects. And this was one of my highlights. Uh, working with our small boat, we can come up to uh, very close to the outlet glaciers. This is uh, one of the outlet glaciers in Peterman Fjord. This is absolutely so fun. So it's almost as fun as surfing to do, go out and do this. So you really come up and do, we did a mapping in front here. We found lots of new discoveries. But one thing I never seen before was narwhals. We had, uh, uh, an event which obviously is very, very rare, so they, they want us to do something about this. But there was a massive, uh, large group of narwhals coming into Peterman Fjord. And we stood here in front and were mapping, and then all of a sudden someone says, are the seals there? No, they're not seals. They look kind of big for that. And then they're, they're narwhals. And they, they were so occupied with what they were doing, so they came in a big 
like almost like an army <laughs> towards us. They almost ran into the boat. So this one is like one and a half meter from the boat. And then they didn't really care about us. They just moved on and did their business there. So they are right in front of the outlet dishes, probably because of nutrients and, and all the activity there and whatever they are feeding from the bottom, etc. Okay, so that was uh, my part of the introduction, half an hour, and then we're going into going to the rest of the talk. So thank you. And th there is there is time for questions. Yeah. Okay. There is time for questions. <laughs> Well, no questions. Okay, then I think we move on. And um, the first speaker here is going to be Folke Brüchert, who's going to talk about water and sediment chemistry study during the Ryder expedition. Okay. Folke, you need this one, I think. Yeah, so uh, we were a, a team actually of, um, and I have, I have now listed a lot of people that were involved in, in the water and sediment chemistry studies that we conducted on RIDA. And this was, this was work, of course, that relied on, uh, on, the, on the logistical support of, of a large part of the scientific crew that was working on the vessel. And, and so I've, I've included those that were closest to the work, but of course also a lot of other people that are under the shipboard scientific party that, that were also participating in this work. Um, a, few, a few little pictures that you see at the top. Um, we were, we were, the work that I'm going to do uh, to talk about now is mostly that work that was done by three types of uh, um, sample collection devices. The one was, was um, surface sediment coring that we did with the multicorer. We did, of course, because of the water sampling, a lot of CTD rosette sampling, but we also had placed on Odin, um, a seawater intake system that was continuously pumping surface water into the vessel, and we connected instruments to that seawater intake, and uh, with that water we could take continuous measurements of pH, of the partial pressure of CO2 in the surface water, and we could measure alkalinity. And that gave us then a continuous record of these parameters as the ship was moving throughout the expedition, and that's of course a very, very large data set. Now, a little bit about the motivation that at least when I received an, uh, an email from Martin inviting who would be interested in participating in the expedition, and it just came about a year ago, and, uh, and I was like, oh, that's, uh, that's, that's an opportunity. So I had been working previously quite a lot on Svalbard and the Svalbard fjords, and uh, I hadn't been working on Greenland, and so um, the idea I had was knowing about the, the melting processes in front of glaciers, how could that be connected to biogeochemical processes? And as Martin had already said before, we could distinguish principally two types of glaciers, those that still have a very well-developed ice tongue and those that are grounded and are calving directly. And so with these very two distinct types of glaciers, we actually have very different um, freshwater, seawater interactions in these fjord systems. And what, we're, or what I'm particularly interested in is with the melting of these glaciers and the release of waters from land, from Greenland, underneath the ice sheets into the ocean, what is the impact of that delivery to the ocean coastal ecosystem? How are nutrients delivered? At what concentrations does this happen? And how does this reflect into the future the ecosystem state of an, an Arctic margin system? So this was one of the questions I had that I wanted to address. What are those nutrients levels? What sediments are deposited there? And how do they recycle, actually, nutrients to the seawater? Adam Ulfsbo from the University of Göteborg, who was responsible for the continuous CO2 measurements, 
He was interested in how does this glacial meltwater actually affect the carbonate system? What, is, what are the CO2 levels? What is the pH and how does that affect actually processes such as ocean acidification? So these were two um, distinct targets that sort of in the course of that expedition merged into one big program. And so together with, of course, Christian and Johan, um, we started to initiate a very, very large sampling program. There were over 50 CTD stations that we took water samples of, and Jonas Fredriksson was working bone hard the whole expedition to collect hundreds up to thousands of samples now that are going to be worked up. Not many have been worked up so far. Some we could already do, but uh, the data set that we still have here, that will take a while until we worked it up. At a selected of these stations, we went into the more tedious sediment sampling where we collected multi-cores, started to do poor water chemistry. And so I have just shown a little list that gives you an, an impression of what we're trying to do. We have these continuous pH, CO2, alkalinity, methane measurements from the seawater intake. We have the CTD bottle program by which we do everything in profile. Then we have the sediment biogeochemistry program where we're particularly focusing on the carbon mineralization rates. We want to measure the benthic flux exchanges of CO2 and nutrients between the sediment and the bottom waters and how it is entrained again into the seawater. And we want to, of course, do poor water chemical analysis. I'm just sort of give you a little panopticum of what it looked like on board. And uh, you get to see also what the material looked like that were actually brought up to the surface. And, it was dirty work because these sediments turned out to be soupy. I mean, soupy is a good description of them. They were hardly sediments. I have never seen sediments of that sort actually before. They were reddish brown, extremely red, and they were 90% water. We had a video system on the multicora, so we could actually take videos as the multicora descended through the water column to the bottom, and it was like a snowstorm a dirty snowstorm in these fjord system, extremely dense suspended sediment that then settled on the seafloor. But by far not dead, brittle stars and other macrofauna is present in these systems. And what we then set out to do was experiments in the containers. We, uh, there you can see Adam, for example, sampling from the CTD rosette, or Jonas collecting also water samples and rhizome pore water measurements. I just show you some of the contrasts that we observed. And what you see here is a, a microelectrode setup system by which we're doing high profile, high resolution profiling of oxygen concentrations in the surface. These are 100 micrometer resolution oxygen measurements through the sediment water interface. And you can see that the three right profiles are actually from the right of fjord, different distances from the glacial tongue. And what you can see are extremely steep oxygen concentrations that within a centimeter in these 1,000 meter or 800 meter deep sediments, you're consuming all the oxygen. These sediments are red, 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 red. You just think there should be so much oxygen in the system. These systems are anoxic within a centimeter down. And that reflects a lot of oxygen consumption. That reflects a lot of carbon is cycled through this system because it's respiration that you're looking at. When you go out into the sea ice covered region of the Lincoln Sea, you couldn't see a bigger contrast. You never run out of oxygen. This is an extremely carbon starved system under the sea ice. Oxygen gradients are very, very low. And these are factor six to factor eight differences in oxygen consumption. So these fjord systems are very, very active. They are already productive. They're turning over a lot of material. Um, we did more of this. We did whole core incubations. And Adam, of course, contributed with his data on the alkalinity concentrations. And what we see that we had much, much lower alkalinities in the fjord systems compared to the Lincoln Sea and the Narrow Strait, but also lower alkalinities compared to Peterman Glacier. Well, that, again, was corresponded to the finding that we found that these the CO2 concentrations in the Ryder Fjord were grossly undersaturated. These fjord waters are a very, very strong CO2 sink, which makes the water, of course, acidic and has a much, much lower pH. 
So it all kind of makes sense. These are very productive fjord systems. They take up a lot of CO2, it gets deposited, it gets recycled, oxygen gets consumed. So the system in itself is much, much more productive than somebody would actually expect. So just to summarize is what we know so far, I've just done a little list of that, and li that list is certainly going to grow over the next months and the next year. I think this is very, very exciting. It's an opportunity that just came along without me knowing it would come along, actually. <laughs> and uh, so with that, um, I want to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Volker. Do we have any questions for Volker? Yep. Ah, the whole <laughs> you said that these are very productive. Is, is it basically diatom production that happens there? Yeah, we have actually not done that. But yes, I would expect a lot of diatom production in these systems. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. We didn't find as many foraminifers in here no. as we no. do in the mm -hmm. outer part. Mm -hmm. So they're, mm -hmm. as you said, a different type of production, more silica production. And yes, yes. Mm -hmm. No more questions? Okay, then we move on to the next speaker, which I believe is, now I see it is Felicity, <laughs> who's going to speak about uh, the calving glaciers. I worked a lot on the boat with Abbe Prakash, and then on land with Nina, some people from KTH, and also had a lot of help from uh, Martin during and since the expedition. So I think this graph we've already seen before, but I was just putting it up there to uh, talk about ice ocean interactions, which is basically the motivation um, for the work that we did at Ryder and uh, like my general research topic. So there's quite a lot of uncertainty over future sea level rise projections. And one of those uncertainties is within the carving process. In a lot of uh, numerical models, it's a uh, parameterization rather than kind of physically based. And part of the reason for this is that there's a lot of satellite data that we have. And this makes massive headlines, like you can see in the one from BBC. But in terms of the actual individual events, there isn't that much data. Because when you're looking at satellites, you can't actually see how the carving is happening. And so we wanted to get really high resolution data sets of um, the carving at Ryder to see yeah, if we can uh, hopefully find something out about how, how the carving occurs. So we deployed a time-lapse uh, camera, which took photos every five seconds at Ryder Glacier for about 11 days, and then for a short period of time at Peterman Glacier. And so ended up with a lot of images. Um, there were some days where there was a lot of fog, so though it's like an 11-day time series, it's only about nine days of actual data, but it's 24 hours because it was light uh, pretty much all the time, so there was a lot of data to go on, and also some nice helicopter rides to set up. Um, this has also been talked about, but I was going to point out on the satellite image, the green dot is where the camera was, um, and the scale here is quite large. So we got riders about nine or ten kilometers across. So it's quite. We can see the whole um, glacier front from the camera, but it is obviously harder to see events far away. And then we have the two uh, Lotus boys that are measuring temperature, um, which you can see there. They're quite close to the glacier, and yet we should come up uh, next August and hopefully have uh, a lot of data on the temperatures. There's also a lot of data which. Um, Odin measures itself, all the meteorological variables, and was quite interested in looking at this to see if it related to the carving events. So these are all the wind roses, basically for the period where we had the camera at Ryder Glacier, and then for the whole period down in the bottom. And what I kind of wanted to show with this is that there were, on the whole, kind of two different kind of modes, I guess, more northerly winds and more southerly winds. And when we had the southerly winds, the wind speeds were um, higher. And you can see on here the wind speeds to the right and air temperature to the left during the same period. And then the, the period with the, the grey box, about, I think, three days or something uh, near the end, was when we had these southerly winds with the higher wind speeds, the higher temperatures. And also from all the carving events that we found in the images, 75% of them occurred during that period. So there seems to be some kind of temporal clustering there and potentially a link between 
um, the metrological variables and the carving. So these are all the carving events that we found at Ryder. Um, the colours are talk uh, the carving styles, which I'll talk about uh, in a couple of slides. But basically, there's a lot of red, which will be the main uh, carving style that I talk about. Uh, but yeah, this is how it looked. Um, it looks like we have a very good coverage of the glacier front, and we did. But when you convert the kind of pixel coordinates from the oblique imagery to the actual real-world coordinates using satellite images and uh, digital elevation models, you can see that there is one section in particular where we don't really have much data, um, which makes sense considering that the camera couldn't actually see that part of the glacier so well. But otherwise, the carving events seem to be quite well distributed across uh, the whole front of Ryder Glacier. So on to carving styles. Um, so looking at the actual events themselves, the, most of the events, 52%, showed this kind of sheet collapse style. And I've used the same descriptions as been used in previous papers. And this sheet collapse is basically where you just get this whole kind of well, sheet of ice just falling straight down. So it's not toppling forward, it's just kind of falling straight into the water. And there can be reasonably large events, so not large on the scale of these massive icebergs, but as you can see from the, the sizes of this one, it is of a reasonable size. And most of the events we found at Ryder were this. It could also be that the splashes are quite big from these events, so maybe they're just easier to see but we definitely found a higher proportion than has been found um, by some other studies where they're looking more at grounded glaciers. But, um, so that was quite interesting to, to see. And then these are some of the other types of carving that we found. You may notice it adds up to more than 100% with the sheet collapse. And that's because a lot of events you kind of started with like a smaller waterline event and then you had this whole sheet collapse happening afterwards. And I've classed that as one event and I guess it's... You could argue maybe that's two events, but when it's exactly the same place, I've kind of said it's waterline and sheet collapse or something like this. Um, and it happened quite a lot that you'd get these kind of smaller bits of carving followed by a much kind of larger event at the same location, which suggests, you know, and it's been found before that this, each carving will alter the stress bands a little bit at the terminus and lead to further events at the same time. And hopefully you'll see this in the video, which should play there. So this is 16 frames a second, and it's, so you couldn't see so clearly the different events, but essentially it kind of goes round this kind of triangle uh, every kind of five, 10 seconds, and then on to kind of like the next bit along. So it's basically five or six kind of separate carving events all happening five, 10 seconds after each other. Um, and again, this is probably about, the front of this is about 150 meters long. So these are a reasonable large amount of ice that is um, coming off. And then also with the images, you can track the displacement of features on the surface. So this is just showing pixel displacements. The arrow is showing the magnitude. This isn't the actual distance it moved. It's just a relative magnitude between um, the different points that I'm showing on this image. And at the moment, these are just pixel displacements. But the, the next step would be to use an elevation model to convert this to real world coordinates and then get this nice fine scale um, velocity fields. There are errors associated with it because of the oblique um, angle, but hopefully it will give some nice results. And then combine to that using some satellite data to extend the record back and look at a larger scale. So this is Peterman on the left and Ryder on the right um, from August, so when we were in the fjords. Um, and I'm hoping to get velocity fields back to 2006 to look for any kind of general trends, like look more clearly at how they've differed from each other. Yeah, and just see if there's... Um, if they're progressing in different ways, if there's any kind of indication of um, anything happening. Yes. And then related to that, when you do get these large break-offs that was talked about earlier, and you've got evidence that one might happen soon at Peterman and maybe at Ryder, it'd be, um, there's been some data from Peterman that, for instance, at the 2010 event, there was, I think, no speed up of the glacier after the big event, but in 2012 there was. And so it would also be really interesting to see is there a trend in like, the dynamic response of these glaciers to these big events? Is, is that changing? And how does that um, compare between the two glaciers at like, hopefully the, well, not hopefully the next big events, but when they happen, see uh, if there's anything um, to be found. So thank you, that was everything. Thank you, Felicity. We have questions. Yep, for Danny, then Ray. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you for a very nice presentation. I was just curious, how do you work with the, with the data? Do you actually sit and watch the footage and try to find the calving events? Or like, how do you, do you have nine days of just... The, the original <laughs> plan was uh, to use, there's been some code written for automatic detection. Mm -hmm. And so I started using this, but I was testing it against kind of finding a calving event. And it wasn't working so well, I think because of the scale of Rider Glacier, and it was developed for a much smaller glacier on Svalbard. So in the end, um, because I was worried about missing the data, it converted, with the help of uh, Bjorn Eriksson, all of the photos into time-lapse videos, which are a lot mm. quicker to look through than if you look through a couple of times, because the splashes are really clear on the videos. Okay. And because it's uh, an ice tongue rather than a grounded glacier, there aren't so many events that you can, it is possible to do it. But it would be nice to get it running automatically mm. so you could do longer time series. Okay. Thank you. So there, there are various attempts to parameterize ca calving rates uh, out there in the literature. Richard Alley has, has one of them. And they're not all exactly uh, aimed at this particular kind of situation. But I was just wondering to what extent um, uh, 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 there are plans to use this kind of data to uh, actually see how well the various pra calving parameterizations actually do. Yeah, I think that would be like, definitely an ultimate aim is to try and that use this data and hope it'd be really nice to run like a model of Ryder Glacier and see do we see the same type of calving events, the same frequencies. So that would definitely be something that I'd like to do and see if some work better than others and also compare it to different glaciers like grounded tidewater glaciers and see if there is a way to, to find what works best. But not yet, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Well, then we move on to Bjorn Gunnarsson, who's going to talk about, uh, well, I know what you're going to talk about. It will be about wood. And, bef <laughs> and before, I should say that they are the ones who got most nicknames on board. They were the carpenters, they were the dead wood, they were the woodpeckers, they were everything associated with wood. And every day we sent them out to different areas. And they came back and they said, we found more wood than ever. <laughs> so I think it just continues in a continuous stream. <laughs> Thank you, Martin nicknames uh, during the expedition. So we're, um, uh, actually is um, missing one name here, it's Hans Lindholm. I updated the, the version during lunch here. So, uh, uh, and uh, my colleague is from uh, Gothenburg University. Sorry about that. So what is uh, Arctic driftwood or driftwood? Well, it's trees that are um, growing uh, close by and uh, around the, the, the continental regions, uh, usually close to riverbeds, but also comes from logging in this area, especially from Russia, have we noticed. There's a lot of cut logs from this area, and about 30% uh, of all the loggings from, from Russia is actually uh, ending up as driftwood in the, in the Arctic uh, uh, basin. Um, so, um, of course, all this driftwood will sink into the, uh, to the bottom of the sea if it's not uh, incorporated into sea ice. So it's frozen into sea ice and transported um, uh, along the ocean currents uh, and ending up at uh, deposited at, at um, kind of um, shallow uh, and ice-free coastline. And it's quite important that it needs to be ice-free. Otherwise, there would no, not be possible for the logs to float into the shore. Um, and driftwood have been, is known to be in, in this area. So there's been quite a lot of studies from, from uh, all the uh, Arctic uh, basin here. And here's the, uh, some of the kind of findings that we ha uh, have. We have worked in, in Svalbard or Spitsbergen. Uh, and that's kind of very important uh, resource, actually, for people living here. Uh, and I have a piece here um, that I hope uh, someone can tell me what it is, actually. Uh, it's kind of not what we call uh, really driftwood, but it is a piece of something that has been used uh, for of, of people doing something. I don't know what it is. 
Uh, so, and we have a lot of uh, uh, different dates from this uh, uh, driftwood. And it comes from the recent part and uh, as old as 12,000 years old. And, and one important thing is here that we can't really say where it is from. Uh, no, it has not been uh, any uh, studies about the wood anatomy that could actually uh, tell you something about the region of uh, the wood itself. But we have a method of that doing that. So um, a little bit what we could use this Arctic drift board for. And that is to, uh, of course, uh, reconstruct the Arctic uh, ice variability. If we have a lot of uh, ice filling the, the Arctic basin here, then there will be certain periods that uh, will no finding of driftwood because the ice is blocking the, the shoreline, the shallow shorelines. It tells us also something about uh, the, the changes in the, the current uh, uh, a, uh, Arctic Ocean currents in, in this area. And also, in turn, uh, tells us something about the atmospheric circulation. Also, uh, it could also provide you with some information about past climate variability. Since, you, uh, since all these logs could be uh, placed uh, on a kind of geographical scale uh, and known with a known uh, geographical region, so that, that could uh, kind of extend the existing networks of different chronologies, dendrochronologies uh, in this area, and help us uh, extend the chronologies from this area. And, uh, and of course, that is used for uh, kind of uh, uh, northern hemisphere uh, climate reconstruction uh, later on. So, and and another thing, it also could say something about the isostatic uplift. Because if you find a log, for example, like 50 meters above the present uh, shoreline, it tells you about the, uh, and you can actually date that very precise within a year. Then you can have the kind of uh, the age of how fast the land was uh, moving upwards. And uh, as Martin said, we were really, really lucky. Um, uh, much of help of the helicopter, of course. I don't want to talk about the carbon footprint of uh, our study here, but, uh, including Oden, of course, but also the, the, the helicopters. We had something called the, the helicopter uh, uh, cutting, sort of landing with uh, different logs because uh, these logs are not found in kind of uh, piles exactly. It could be like 500 meters or even one and a half kilometers uh, uh, beside them. So it's a lot of wa walking. But we were able to find over 200 samples from this area where you have previously found around 60. Uh, and that's th this 60 is from spanning from 1960 to uh, until we got there. So we were really uh, lucky with that. And some uh, preliminary results shows that most of these uh, findings that the wood that we have comes from Russia. And that because we could know that already uh, from a, a kind of a wood anatomy that you could tell about the, the, the subspecies of different uh, larch, for example, or pine or uh, spruce. But also, um, we could use what we call dendroprovenance. Uh, not just by, you can actually date a log very exactly within a year, the outermost ring could tell you exact year of death of that uh, log 
but you can also use the network because we have around uh, the northern hemisphere lots and lots of uh, chronologies that we could take an unknown sample that we have, measure the, the ring width uh, in this case, and try to me uh, match that with the different chronologies around uh, this region. And then we could very exact say, okay, this log come from, for example, Yakutsk here, which uh, is one of the youngest that we have so far, 1995. And that means that it took 22 years uh, coming from that region, going for, uh, out in the river, incorporated into the ice and float around a little bit and then uh, ending up at the shore in Greenland. That's quite amazing, I think. So with that, I will end with a, a wolf picture, uh, as you promised. Thank you. Do we have a question for Bjorn? Yep. So it looked like in uh, one of those pictures there that you showed the log is actually slightly up from the shoreline. So do you get that from, you know, if you have very old logs and you had variations in sea level, there are some of them. Yeah, the, it, 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 yeah, it could be that, uh, but I think that you have a, a part of that is a, is a static uplift. One of the logs we find at 30 meters, I think, above the present, but it can also be from storms uh, or that the ice is pushing up the, uh, the logs. Picture is a very good introduction for the next speaker, which is Johannes Mosviken, who is going to talk about terrestrial ecology in the high Arctic environment. There. Sorry. So I felt obliged to have the expedition shirt. Nobody else had it, apparently, but uh, <laughs> I did. So I'm going to tell you some uh, observations I did during the expedition and what I did. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that much data yet, so I'll just I'll show pretty pictures. Uh, let's start with some brief background. Arctic environments are characterized by harsh climate and uh, low primary productivity. And there is a known relationship with decreasing species richness with increasing latitude, but also with altitude. And as we all know, climate change is altering the global temperatures. But due to polar amplification, we have an uh, almost double temperature increase at high latitudes. And this causes a lot of changes in species distribution and range shifts. And we're interested in how this reduction in habitat area and increased fragmentation will affect the communities, the high Arctic communities, and what ecological interactions will get affected by this. So as Martin mentioned before, this northwestern Greenland consists of different peninsulas. They're separated by these huge fjords and also the Greenlandic ice sheet separates these, so they are quite isolated areas. And we expect that species, most of the species has dispersed from the Canadian archipelago up into this area and that the communities in the, on these peninsulas consist of subsets of the regional species pool. So we did this by flying out with the helicopters and setting up field camps and tenting, but also did day trips. More specifically, we flew out to these two peninsulas. We also did day trips to the other peninsulas. The Ryder Glacier is here for a reference, and the Peterman Glacier is here. 
And I'll just present some brief methods and observations. We use a scalable stratified random sampling design using a one kilometer transect. And along this transect we have five sampling stations. And each sampling station consists of five square meter plots for vegetation mapping. Within these plots we have a 10 centimeter grid. We also note uh, the relative abundance using intercept sticks like this. And we note the vegetation coverage and the moss and lichen covered, and also the cover of uh, dead plant tissue. And the floor in this area is mostly composed of Arctic and Alpine plants, but also a lot of high Arctic specialists that only occurs in the high Arctic, and also great influence, for instance, this center species of the North American flora since it's so close to Ellesmere Island and the Canadian archipelago. The most important species, however, for the terrestrial ecosystem is the Arctic willow. This is the foundation for all the grazing species, such as musk ox and Arctic hare. And also the abundance of Arctic willow uh, provides a basis for the, the, the grazers and also for the carnivores. And the vegetation in the landscape is quite heterogeneous. This is mostly Arctic desert. And you find the most vegetation where you find moisture in the landscape. So these small streams and also the small depressions where snow can accumulate during the winters. And that's also what our data shows, that you have quite a big difference between different transects and between different peninsulas. And we also collected data, or my supervisor did, during the Peatman expedition, so we'll try connecting these data sets together and try to get a more comprehensive look at the terrestrial ecology in the area. In addition to the vegetation, we also sampled arthropods using normal pitfall traps, so just a small jar. There's, uh, we dig the jars close to the uh, plant plots, so we can connect, hopefully, the vegetation cover with the uh, insects in there or the art arthropods. We also use molasses traps, that is for flying insects. And we also collect a lot of pellets and scats and remnants of animals to look at food webs and interactions. We also did just visual observations of all vertebrates we could see, for instance, Arctic hare. And of course, a lot of muskox on some of the peninsulas. Now I hopefully will want some sound. Oh. So, as Martin said, this is one of the few areas where we don't really have any human settlements. And this is a great opportunity to find animals in their sort of undisturbed state, if exempt climate change. So we had the great fortune of meeting some uh, Arctic wolves, close up. And this is filmed with my iPhone, so it's less than 20 meters away. <laughs> and they were up close, like 10 meters. So this, this pack had probably never seen humans before. And they were very curious. And I want to thank everybody on the cruise, especially the, the land team who stayed out in the field. And a special thanks to my founders and Lou and Frederick, my supers, who were both joining on the expedition. And, uh, my last super car in. That's all for me. Questions? If not, I can have a I have a question, immediate question, because I know the big snackies, as we say in Sweden, were the wolves. Every time we flew out and do something, you had new encounters with the wolves. How many times did you actually see them? Uh, I only saw them twice, but the group in total saw them more times. So we did. We had to go to that area where the pack were. They had um, 
they, they had a dead muskox there, so they didn't really want to move from that. So, so you, you actually landed where the muskox were? Yeah, yes. so the first time we flew out, we, we landed and they just came up to helicopters, which is unheard of. L normally, wolves are terrified of helicopters, but these weren't, so <laughs> that's a bit special. Any more yeah. questions? Did you set any pollen traps or take any modern pollen surface samples? No, chance? however, we take soil samples. When we dig the small hole for the pitfall trap, we take uh, soil samples. Because, I mean, that could be really interesting to compare perhaps with paleoclimate records if you're yeah. going to analyze. And the second uh, land team, uh, which uh, Martin told you about, they did the uh, lake coring for DNA, but they also can look at pollen there. So. Yeah, because you want a nice comparison between the modern ones and what you're finding in the cores. Yeah. So exactly. that would be nice. More questions? Right, then we move on. And now we're going to move to a completely different area of uh, Greenland. We're going to the Ica Fjord, where Rickard is somewhere there. Rickard Julenskar is going to talk about the Ica Fjord project. Um, oh, this, uh, this one is not going to be straight. Ah, okay, Miss Vetter. Yeah, he knows. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to...
is really a very good introduction to this talk. <laughs> okay. so just remember the man banging on the ground. <laughs> okay, so the last talk will be Mining Legacies in the Southeast Greenland with Ninis. Do I need uh, yeah, we're I three think. people. Oh. Oh, I can just hold it. You can use this one, but you can also use that one. Okay. If you don't want to switch between. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Yes, yes, Is that good? It's challenging little oxygen in here, but uh, uh, we're three speakers, so we're going to challenge the speak talk uh, set up here, uh, but we like to contribute, all of us. Um, I'm Nines Rosqvist, and uh, we have Kalle Östelin and Jacke Jorsche from uh, Physical Geography here. So we will now go to, we will actually stay in the same place, just next door, the fjord just uh, north, north of the Ica fjord. Um, by accident, we were at the same site almost at the same time this summer. And I just heard Rick had mentioned he's going back, so if you need any hands. Uh, we're studying a project dealing with mining legacy because now we're in an area of Greenland where human impact has really been very obvious for a long time. This is close also to where the Norse first came to Greenland and started farming many years from now. But there's also uh, a lot of mining activities, past mining activities and potential new activities. Um, and we are interested in what you can learn from past extraction projects because the demand and prices of minerals today, especially the rare earth minerals that we need to the green transition, ironically enough, is increasing the interest to exploit the resources in the Arctic and in Greenland. At the moment, there is no mining activity, actually. Or during the past 20 years, I don't think there's been any projects that have been approved, but there's a lot of interest. So how do you study this? We are working in a, in a, a project across disciplines. Um, so we are the natural science component. Um, and there are social scientists, economists, anthropologists, and uh, a nice mix of uh, people. And part of this research uh, project um, staff went to Greenland this summer uh, to uh, study a few sites on the southwest coast. Um, and it included... Um, assessment of the sites, but also interviews with people living here. What do they see for their future? Are they pro-extraction or are they, how do they, um, uh, what kind of future do they see? Um, so uh, the, what kind of footprints does a mine leave behind? And what can we learn from that now that we have even better techniques, of course? Um, was there any uh, remediation after the mine has been closed? And uh, is there any repurposing of the mines? Can you use the infrastructure or even the buildings to something else? Can you, ex can you make a tourist attraction of it? And how, you can, how can you use these kind of infrastructures that are left behind? It's the same everywhere. It's not just particularly important for the Arctic, but this is uh, the focus of our study. Also because the environmental impact is, is usually very strong. So um, I'm not so sure. This, this rock is, uh, is a unique rock. It's one of the few that has been mined to it, uh, it's, uh, the end of it. Although uh, there's only been one mine in the world uh, mining cryolite. Uh, it's named cryolite because it looks like ice and it's mined close to ice. Um, and it's the place uh, up to close to where Rickard was, Ivitut. That's quite a, a famous uh, site for mining. And then we have an uh, old copper mine uh, in Josva. And then close to uh, Narsak, there is a potential rare earth and uranium mine, which is being discussed at the moment. So um, Jaik and Kalle will, will take you along a trip to those sites. Perfect. So it's fantastic to see what your colleagues did, because previous presentation was in this fjord and we were about three kilometers across the mountain in this fjord and I will also show some of the drone maps we did in that area so we've been doing very similar stuff for different reasons so this is a picture from one of the two sites from Josva it was a copper mine for only about 10 years from 1904 to 1915 and so at these two sites, um, I've been doing uh, drone mapping and making ortho mosaics uh, to get data for archaeologists and hydrologists. 
because the satellite images in the area, they're not really detailed enough, especially not for the archaeologists. So we made maps with two centimeter uh, per pixel resolution so that you can uh, much easier map features of archaeological interest in these maps. So this is one of the ortho mosaics we did for the Josva site. And then for Evitut, the, the largest site just next to the Ica fjord, we also made a um, ortho mosaic of the whole mining system. The big blue hole there is where they used to mine the cryolite material. Then everything else is where they put all the materials from the mining site. Um, and from this ortho mosaic made from the drone, we can also get very high resolution elevation models, which can help Jarke. Yeah, so, so the question we have is, uh, you know, which kind of environmental impact do we have then from these mines? So it could help us understand, you know, if you open mines again in Greenland, what will the future impacts be? Uh, and also if we understand the mechanisms, we can understand the impact of climate change and so on. So this is, uh, here we see the fjord uh, outside of the mining area. You see the open pit uh, near the, the houses there. And uh, actually, uh, lucky enough, even if, it, if it's rather remote place, there is measurement series in blue muscles uh, of metals. And you can see that there are really elevated concentrations of lead and zinc in some places in the blue muscles. And uh, it's still the case. So the question is, what is the mechanism now that you know, this historical mine is still polluting the, the fjord? And so far, uh, the hypothesis has been that uh, it's a tidal water effect. So you can see, of course, you mess around a lot when, when you do the mine. Uh, actually, lots of these minerals were shipped to Copenhagen, where it was processed. So that's kind of you know, surprising that it didn't have the on-site processing, but they needed a harbor. So they took a lot of material from the open pit to build the harbors, to build the, the infrastructure. And we can see that the highest concentrations of, of metals actually is, is, is then close to the harbor. And we have another hypothesis, and that is that, you know, it's, it's not only the tidal water, it's also local infiltration. Because we don't have main streams, actually, it, it goes around this area. And we think this hypothesis is testable also, because then we should have a correlation, for instance, with precipitation events. So we could see if, the, if we would return and measure things here, we could probably see uh, if things fluctuate and have a correlation with, uh, with precipitation. Uh, but uh, then, you know, we would be interested in also making uh, some assessments of the total amount. Where did all the stuff end up? So just a small part, of course, was shipped to Copenhagen. The rest is somewhere here. And to make an impact study and project into the future, you know, how long will the impact be, we would uh, need to do some mass balances of, of, um, of what remains of, of the waste rock. And then your model comes into to play again. Yes. So. so what we will try to do then is, this is a snapshot of now what it looks like now, but what we want to understand is what it looked like when they started, because we want to figure out where the biggest volumes of of waste rock is. So uh, this is a map from 1921 from the company archive, from the mining company archive in Copenhagen. And this is what the um, site looked like back then. So what we want to do now is overlay it with our ortho mosaic from today and try to see where they deposited most of the material and by that calculate how much waste rock we have and where to support um, Jerker's findings. W this can also be cross-referenced then from archaeology studies or historical studies from the company archive because they will likely also have all the figures of all the mined materials so we can get sort of a better verification about the mass balancing we calculate on the basis of this. Okay, so um, in this big uh, picture, this project, we mainly focus our work on northern Scandinavia, actually, but uh, this Greenland study was very 
interesting and the basic conclusion is that we don't, we don't learn very much at all from what we've done before. We have many mines in northern Sweden and Finland which were operating for a few years, 100 years ago, and it's still super polluted there. And even if the mining companies today promise that they will re-establish whatever was there before, there's no techniques to do that. You can't. Uh, and it's a very um, uh, actual problem these days because now there, there's been discussion of mining in Skåne and in other places where people are, are, uh, have emotions for the, for the landscape and want to have alternative ways of using it. So it feels very relevant to bring up this kind of... Um, this is far away, sure, but we have the same examples very much closer to where we live. Uh, one interesting project here is close to Narsak. It's, it's called Kvarnefjeld in Danish. Uh, it's been some test uh, mining here for uh, rare earth minerals and unfortunately also get uranium or maybe some people would want the uranium. Uh, but this site is located just upstream from a village and from a, uh, upstream of a fjord system which has been sustaining people for hundreds of years for fishing. Uh, then the fish disappeared because the water got warmer and then people were very pro-mining because they don't have any jobs. And of course, we, we then met with uh, young, um, young people in that village and they, or town. They really said that before they wanted the mine because they would get jobs, they thought. And then now the fish is back and they have changed their mind. They want to have the fishery back. <laughs> but it does, they can't because the infrastructure for handling the fish is not there anymore. So they're really... Uh, tightened up between this kind of ironic uh, management of uh, natural resources, I should say. So it's the same uh, in, in our countries that we have to make priorities. What do we want? How many minerals do we want? And at the same time, climate is shifting here, changing the patterns of precipitation and temperature. So it's really a challenge to assess the impacts of these kind of operations today when you have, a sh when you have shifting baselines. What are you going to compare to? It's going to be a different world in the future. And this was a very good example. Uh, so uh, there's some pushing for this mine, uh, and especially from Chinese companies. Um, so the Chinese wanted to buy the military station that also Richard used for his logistics, uh, which was very close to the Ivitut, cryolite mine. Um, and the Danish said, uh, because the Danish didn't want to have their military base there anymore, it was built there to protect the mine once upon a time. That's why there is a military facility there. And then the Chinese came and said, we want to buy this from you. Then the Danish said, no, we're going to keep it. So they have five people there now. But they're very pro-science, so very good sight. Anyway, then there is also interesting, because this area is also visited by the Hurtlirutten, so there is um, a lot of uh, tourists, wealthy tourists, coming ashore, looking at this legacy, hopefully learning something. Um, at the same time, there was one fisherman there uh, still catching fish in the fjord, which has been uh, very polluted once and is still probably. So this is, uh, this is very interesting to see what, what, what is sustainable in this sense. Should people go? This ship was on its way to the Northwest Passage because ironically enough, the discussion and the narrative is now that the Arctic gets more accessible and therefore we can extract more of its resources at the same time as climate is changing. So we feel that this project, with the, with the width of, of uh, science we're using, is very uh, rewarding and very interesting. Now we're, we're writing papers now, basically. And the cryolite is uh, to be an ice person, to have this, um, it's, it's a nice thing. <laughs> anyway, thank you. That was it. Thank you. So that was actually the last talk in this session, as unfortunately Margaret Hansen could not make it. Do we have questions? So what is cryolite used for? Oh, I forgot to say, sorry. It uh, was used to produce aluminium. It, there is a sodium aluminium fluoride thing. So first they used it to, to get extract aluminium out of the actual mineral, and then uh, it was used in the process of getting aluminium, and it was very important for during the war. It was a really, a, a, and a for long they said this was the only place on earth that this existed, but there are f a few other places that this mineral has been spotted, but, but not mined. But they took the whole ore away, 
the problem was that they the, the waste broke, they crushed, they did the crushing there, and uh, we picked up some samples to test for the, the contamination in the ground, it's huge. It's, it's zinc and lead, what the Jäger said. So the waste rock is the problem, the actual mineral is gone. They used it, they crushed it very finely, and they even had it on their tennis court. But at the end of the, the mining there, they even scraped the tennis court free from this material, because they really wanted to use everything they had. So it's really not, any, well, this was an unusually big piece I found, uh, illegally <laughs> transported. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Jär Jerke lost all his rocks <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, they scanned his rucksack <laughs> in, the, in the customs. <laughs> so we're sharing this, actually. And the copper, of course, the copper mine was copper. Uh, that was even worse. That was really, really high. Nobody's cared to do any remediation there. But this is, was for aluminium. Yeah. We have some more. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, I, I'm an ore geologist, so uh, I have a kind of comment on what you said. I, I think there'd be many mining companies in Sweden who would not be particularly happy with hearing that uh, the dealing with the environmental problems with mining hasn't changed over the last <laughs> centuries. <laughs> well, th I, there's always an environmental impact from yeah, mining, yeah. but um, I think there are very many strict regulations in terms of dealing oh, with yes. these things. That's, that's not what I meant. Mm. But there are lots of cases where mines have been uh, operating like 100 years ago, yeah. and it's still very polluted in the Absolutely. environment. So yep. Uh, because the companies themselves go bankrupt because mm -hmm. the prices go down. No, I didn't mean that. That, that was yeah. not my intention. No, I mean, it's, it's good. It's just it's a very, like you said at the beginning, you know, um, the use of uh, metals for um, green technologies is a huge question. And uh, we can import or export the environmental problem to countries like China because that's where we import all these metals from. So we have to take an aspect of the environmental impact, I would say. Yeah, great. No more questions? Okay, then I think we can thank all the speakers with an applause. Uh, before you go, uh, thank you very much indeed for a fascinating session, uh, uh, Greenland session. I just want to take the opportunity to, as there is just a, a few seconds before they've got the coffee laid out, uh, to uh, make sure that everyone's informed that there's a slight change of schedule for the final session of today. Uh, the final session is, uh, begins with forces. This is a, um, a new research initiative fo focusing on aerosol for forcing that has stemmed from the Blaine Centre, now led by two former uh, research area leaders from the Blaine Centre. That's going to be the beginning of the session, and the remainder, re remaining part of the last session is about the Boleyn Centre's outreach activities. Um, what's on the schedule is the cl uh, Climate Answers by Scientists. This is a group who take on the, who respond to the public's questions about uh, climate today among the Boleyn Centre, and it's looking for members, so it's good to be uh, here to maybe to contribute, and. Um, Ava will be presenting a new project, Interactive Research Briefs for the Public. This is a newly, fu a newly funded uh, project reaching out to the community. And uh, finally, Arian Gustafsson will be presenting the Climate Change Solutions course. Now, this is a, a cross-faculty initiative to uh, equip uh, graduate un uh, undergraduate students with the knowledge they need to uh, work towards uh, solving the climate crisis. So those two talks, that is Ava's and Arian, will replace the Boleyn Center database uh, talk, which is written in the schedule. So that is a slight change. So you welcome back. It will be an extended coffee break, but welcome back at 3.30 for the final session of uh, this year's Boleyn Days. Thank you.
Tja, ett, två, tre. Hej, välkomna. Ett, två. Ett, två, tre. Ett, två, tre.
Is that okay? Uh, you can use this one or this. Yeah. Can use whatever you want. Then So, yeah, now the only thing with not, if you use this, then you... Uh, welcome back. Welcome back to the uh, last uh, session of uh, uh, this year's uh, Boleyn Days. And now this la uh, last session has two parts. And in the first part, uh, we're going to uh, hear about a newly started research initiative, FORCES, um, which um, is going to be presented to us by Ilona Ripanen. Uh, Ilona was a former research area leader at the Berlin Center, um, and indeed also Annika, who is also a former research area leader of the same research area, and Matt, who's also the uh, scientific offi officer, is now a research area leader at the Berlin Center. Um, and you guys are super welcome. And uh, Ilona, do tell us about FORCES. Well, it's really a pleasure to see so many members of active members of the Bullying Center here. Um, and the reason why we wanted to come, I think we, we actually contacted Alistair and Nina and said that can we come? Because we wanted to um, give a case study or show a case study of uh, what can come out of the Bullying Center or what has come out of the Bullying Center because Feel, we feel that we have benefited as researchers really a lot from it and um, also it has had an impact on us and the Swedish influence on at least on the European scale in the form of, for instance, projects like uh, forces. Um, so another uh, thing that I wanted to highlight or thank Bullion Center for is introducing, introducing this uh, shared leadership. So I was just telling to Alice there that I was running away from another workshop where Annika was, uh, we were both supposed to be present just like here and I could just say that Annika knows what I think and she has um, trusted me with uh, giving this presentation for both of us. So this shared leadership is also something very valuable we feel within the Bullying Center. So 
Yeah, so Forces is a Horizon 2020 project that has recently started. Um, and we feel, feel that it re all really started from the Bullying Center. So we were, um, yeah, maybe I just tell you what it's about. So it's about really constraining the aerosol forcing uh, that maybe, as you know, is one of the biggest uncertainties at the moment for climate projections. So it matters really what we project the really uh, um, near future uh, warming trends to be and therefore the climate sensitivity, uh, what we assume about the aerosol forcing. And that's what we want to better resolve within forces. And that's obviously very much in the heart of the research area too, within the Bullion Center. And I think that the research areas, as they still are, kind of roughly organized, we have a few more than those days, uh, they came about uh, in 2013. And I was new, very newly recruited uh, at Stockholm University also because of Bullion Center actually. Uh, and me and Annika were then given the task to, to, to lead this new research area. And during this time we really realized that there is a lot of room for better uh, communication between people working with the atmospheric composition and details of the aerosol size distribution, aerosol composition, and then the more really larger scale climate modeling community. And we thought that the Bullion, first in the scale of the Bullion Center, that the Bullion Center research area too was a really nice way to bring these uh, collaborations um, about. Um, but then we realized that this is actually a problem not only within the Stockholm University community, but on a larger context. And we started to think whether this lack of communication would also be one reason behind the long-standing uncertainty in the aerosol forcing, besides that it's actually a really difficult problem. Um, um, and then we, we decided that, okay, we will invest some time into trying to put together an EU grant, um, which, as those of you who have worked with these kind of grants know, it's a lot of work for several years with potentially no outcome, but, but we thought that it would be a fun to at least try. So then um, towards the end of our time as research area leaders, we put together this like random configuration of scientists and <coughs> not actually a collaborator university, organized a trip to Brussels to meet some officials who we had no idea whether they have any influence or not. <laughs> But <laughs> we went there uh, and uh, I don't know whether this trip had anything to do with the fact that then there was a call that somehow fit our uh, goals uh, later in 2017. And then we started to form the consortium and put together the first step proposal and the second step proposal in the year after. And then finally now just Earlier this month, we had the kickoff of this project. Uh, and yeah, I would like to say that also this, the present research area leaders, Matt and Frida, are heavily involved in this new project. So we're super happy about that too. And then besides this timeline here that shows how we developed the uh, idea, uh, I have also forgotten to say one really like good legacy or well, how to say, good side of this shared leadership is that I also managed to have a baby in 2017 and there the shared leadership with Annika really helped because she did all the work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I did some kind of labor as well but. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I will tell a little bit more about the project. We, th we just thought that because we want also to for how do I say, uh, to be as open as possible. So if there are people among you who see things that relate to your research uh, that we want to do within the project are, or are interested in participating in some way, just, you know, contact us. Um, so we also just wanted to share information about what, what this project is about. So really the core 
uh, goal is to address key knowledge gaps in climate science and support the IPCC process. Um, and in our case, we targeted um, climate projections, improving climate projections uh, through reducing uncertainty in cloud and aerosol dynamics and cloud and aerosol interactions. And the consortium that we managed to put together, uh, which we are actually really, really happy about the group of people that are involved, involves um, 20 different partners from different uh, European countries and uh, Stockholm University is coordinating this. We are coordinating this and what did we exactly promise to do? So I already alluded to this. Uh, we made a quite ambitious goal of uh, trying to reduce the uncertainty in the total anthropogenic radiative forcing, which is largely due to the aerosols. So in the project, we have three objectives. So the first one is to identify the most important cloud and aerosol processes that control the radiative forcing and climate response, and then improve these processes in climate models. Secondly, then we, based on the work that's, that's done to reach objective two, we ultimately want to reduce the uncertainty in the aerosol radiative forcing. And thirdly, then quantify better the near-term climate impact and uncertainty ranges in support of the Paris Agreement. So we go all the way from really detailed processes to trying to output information that's relevant for policy decisions. Um, and this is basically the schematic of, of the three objectives that I already went through. And as an outcome, of the work that we will do. Yeah, on one hand, we improve the fundamental understanding of aerosol and cloud processes, improve climate models. We focus on three European climate models. So we use NURI-SM, and then we use the ECHAM, uh, or the MPI uh, model, and then uh, EC Earth, and partly also the, the UK uh, Met Office ESM. Then, make more reliable climate projections, and I already mentioned the reduced uncertainty. And I alluded already on this, why this is important, but here's an example illustrating it. That it is especially important for the near-term future to know how have, the, how have the aerosols in the past, the anthropogenic aerosols in the past, influenced the radiative um, balance or budget uh, of the Earth. Uh, here's just two scenarios, or example for two RCP scenarios. One where the aerosols are left um, at the levels of the current legislation, and the, that's the black one. And then the red one uh, is the case where estimates of maximal feasible reduction in terms of the air quality improvements for aerosol emissions have been applied. And there's the temperature evolution as a function of time. And uh, as you know, for the impacts of climate change, every tenth of a degree actually matters. So depending on what the aerosols will be in the future and what their impact in the past has been, uh, it's actually quite relevant um, to know exactly what they do in the climate system. And one of the big reasons why we also wanted to investigate the aerosol processes in more detail um, was that the models as they are today, this is this black line, are not doing particularly well in reproducing present trends in uh, aerosol radiative effects. So this is now the direct uh, effect. Then uh, the methods that we will use, we will go from process models to earth system models and from laboratory experiments to remote sensing. This has all the time been also, those of you who have been present uh, in the RA2 presentation throughout the years, I think that each year we have showed a slide like this that we want people from different scales to collaborate. Um, and then these different methods are used in these different work packages we've 
designed the work in such a way that the first two work packages focus on the process scale and then there's a data hub work package um, and then work packages three to six work on the larger scale. And the impacts that we expect, short and long term, um, we want to increase the confidence in climate models. Um, because actually you often hear also this uncertainty related to climate or aerosol climate effects being used to sort of hamper the credibility of climate models. And this is, we don't think that this is a relevant argument. Um, but obviously if we can reduce that uncertainty, we can improve the credibility even further and the confidence uh, in, even further. Um, and then, I mean, we are largely just driven by wanting to understand the system better. I would say that if we take me and Annika as an example, I'm quite interested in just understanding what happens when water vapor condenses in the atmosphere and how are, um, how do this, how do the thermodynamics and the kinetics of this process work? I'm, I mean, I'm obviously also interested in the climate impacts, but I'm quite driven by very fun, like the very fundamental questions, whereas I feel that um, Annika has all the time in our interaction sort of represented the more larger scale view. And this is very much the philosophy also of the group that we put together. We wanted to put together the people who are really interested in the policy relevant outcomes with people like myself, I would say, who are interested in just, you know, the fundamental physics and chemistry. And then uh, I think this objective three and the impact there, I think that this will be a challenge to us. How do we provide really true added value to decision and policy makers? And how do we reach the right stakeholders um, to, to give our messages to? And yeah, like one thing that I really want to stress what we want to do is in this project is to reduce complexity. So, I personally believe that, I mean, we know that in climate models you need to make very drastic simplifications of the processes. But I think it's very important that those simplifications are made based on top, bottom up um, process knowledge. And ultimately, the simplifications can be extremely simple. Uh, as an example, for instance, organic aerosols that I've worked with, I mean, we have got, it's, it's, in general, it's, uh, organic aerosols contain thousands of different compounds and there's no way you can represent each compound in a climate model. And in some aspects of how these compounds, what kind of impacts they have uh, on cloud formation, we have found that you can actually simplify a lot. So maybe two organic tracers can represent the whole complexity when we talk about their CC and activation, for instance. And this is something that is also doable in a climate model framework. And investigations like this, we want to, call, want to um, do more in the process uh, work packages of forces. So with this, I will conclude. Um, and <laughs> we are very much in the beginning of this process now. Uh, <laughs> this is our plan and then I think this will be the reality but we are very very um, inspired and excited to be working on this and yeah we just wanted to thank the Bullying Center because we felt that we, we feel proud and happy that we were trusted with the, the coordination of this um, and we feel that it would not have happened uh, if it wasn't for the Bullying Center. Thank you. Thank you, Ilona. Before inviting questions, I want to extend the thanks to the Boleyn Centre back to, uh, to you and your, uh, and your team. This is, a, this is our dream, the, the research that starts here um, and the research collaborations that start here lead to uh, big, uh, large-scale research initiatives that are clearly a benefit for society, constraining these models upon, upon, and the knowledge from those models are feeding directly into the, how we understand how the future is going to be making our forecasts for the climate reliable and denier-proof. It's fantastic work. I'm super impressed, Ilona. 
Um, and now I open for questions. I was quiet. <laughs> well, you're welcome to contact us. I mean, we obviously also just wanted to let you know things that are going on. So if you're interested um, in one way or the other, or you have questions or want to participate, just let us know. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on, um, we're going to now have a presentation uh, by Le uh, Leon Shafik about the climate answers uh, by scientists of the Boleyn Centre um, for Society. Uh, this is a newly started initiative, started this year um, in response to the large number of questions we get from the public and from the media uh, where we need to rapidly respond with a, um, a well um, reasoned uh, and a rapid answer. And Leon, it'd be nice that you tell us about this. You're plugged in, yeah. Good. That's lovely, thank you, Robin. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, like, uh, as Chris said, this is an initiative by the Berlin Center um, to try to. Yeah, I think so. Do you hear me well now? Hmm? It's on. Okay. okay. Here you go. Yeah. Sorry. So. Okay. Let's try this uh, once uh, again. Uh, so this is an initiative by the Boleyn Center, and and the aim is actually to uh, to be there for, for for outreach and for replying to to uh, uh, climate questions by by the media uh, for most of the time, and they need to be very rapid. You get, you, get a, you get a question and we need to have someone that can reply to the media almost immediately. Uh, so we are from, uh, from uh, MISU, uh, ACES, IGV, uh, Natural Geography, and also from, from Ecology, uh, Natural Resource Commissariat, and also from the Department of, of History. Um, so why did this uh, group start? And this is definitely not a surprise uh, uh, to you. Uh, we have all noticed the immense interest in the climate change and, and the related questions, but uh, and we do get uh, this is a request by the general public all, all the time. So there is definitely a growing interest and in, in need for climate experts, uh, and, and we at the Boleyn Center we think we we need and want to raise awareness and clarify misconceptions, but also serve uh, with with our expertise. Um, and with, I mean, for, for what just uh, Ilona said right now, that giving back to, to us to, as a scientist, this is actually, I think, a great forum for us as scientists to, uh, to practice our outreach and, and gain necessary skills, how to engage uh, better with the general public and, and actually with the, with the media. Uh, so how does this, this, this work? So the typical workflow uh, is actually that we get a, a question from, uh, from, from, from the media or from the public uh, or from TV. Uh, typically it's an email that is uh, sent to the coordinators, to Eva and, and Annika. Uh, and, and then they send us uh, this, forward this email to us scientists within this group. Uh, of course we are uh, scientists, so we're very happy to receive an, an, an email to, to be able to share our, our expertise uh, and immediately starting composing an email, right? Uh, this is typically sent to a few, uh, one of the, uh, the experts sent an email directly to, to the newspaper or to the, to the public or if it's student or, or, or uh, any other one in the public. But this typically, when it's the public, it needs some time, some iterations between the scientists before it's sent out. Uh, so it's not an immediate uh, uh, email that is sent out directly. There's some iterations within us uh, before it's sent out. 
or you just go directly to, to the TV and do the interview. Uh, so this is the very simple workflow that, that we have um, in, this, in this group. So I'll give you some examples on how, how the questions that we receive, receive. This is an example from a uh, question from Douglas Nuhieter about the fires that we've seen uh, in the beginning of, uh, uh, it was in uh, August, September. So Douglas Nieter is uh, looking for an expert to comment on the NASA map fires around the world. And they want someone who to comment on, is this NASA map reliable? And why are there so many fires? For example, that's a very uh, uh, simple example that we, uh, the questions that we get. Another example from, from, uh, from the public, this was a student actually, that uh, she studies uh, uh, sustainable development at Uppsala, and she has some question. In this case, it was about uh, uh, climate and radiative forcing. And, and this was actually, I was really happy to, when we, we did this, uh, it was led by, by Thorsten and, and Frida, of course, it's climate and radiative forcing, but, but we put together a very nice document uh, and she was very happy with that. Um, so, so this is what we are trying to, to aim for uh, in this group. Another example from, from TV, uh, during the World Ocean Day, they needed someone to be there uh, to talk about the oceans uh, immediately. Uh, and, and this is, uh, uh, and also I'd like, like, like to say that if you read the first one, this is why actually we are, we have this, uh, uh, this group. This, they don't know who to contact directly. Uh, so having this group that are ready to, to be there who can help with these issues is really actually uh, great. Uh, so what have we done uh, during uh, this year? Uh, you can see uh, the different outreach and, and interviews uh, from uh, high schools uh, to TV, um, newspapers, Nordisk uh, at SVTM, uh, and, and many more. And, and most of them are actually, Alistair has been, done a great <laughs> deal of these uh, uh, outreach and interviews, and, and Nina as well. Uh, and one of the things that came up during this, um, during our meetings is actually that we, the scientists, needed media training. That was something that we, we lacked. I mean, you go out and you do a, a, an interview, and if you don't have a proper media training, I would say, there are some issues that, that can, 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 something that can go wrong, definitely. Um, we think we still can learn quite a lot, um, but once you're there in front of the camera, things can get very complicated. But these are the very simple things that one should bring with you to an interview. Of course, you should choose and formulate your, your message, simplify the targeted listeners, viewers, readers, or should focus more on the effects on life people, um, and, and practice, practice, practice. But still, it doesn't, uh, doesn't matter how much you practice, things can, still can go wrong. So we have another, another uh, uh, this is a guide. This is supposed to, be, to act as a guide for, for uh, uh, when making an, an interview. You make sure that you do not babble, okay? That was the first thing that we learned from these experts that we had here. Um, use the time available, you know the time. Is this a one minute or six minutes? Uh, stay in your box, that's, that's very important. You know, if, don't go outside your, your expertise. Uh, uh, if, if that's what's comfortable for you, just stay in your box and, and define it in advance. I, when I did that interview on the World Ocean Day, they wanted to talk more about the plastics. And I just said, I cannot talk about plastics, sorry. I can talk about climate of the oceans and the Gulf Stream. I can tell you where the, where, where the plastics accumulate, uh, in which regions, uh, from a physical oceanographic point of view, but I cannot tell you uh, more about that. So I, I really define my, my, um, the region that what I'm actually comfortable with. Uh, what can go wrong? Many things can go wrong. If you're doing a, t a TV uh, interview, you, know, you, should ha you can have possible opponents, disagreements or disputes. You should be ready for that. Uh, you know, r reporters like uh, this type of things. You can start speculating. Uh, that can happen um, because reporters really enjoy speculation. And it can, it can lead you into that. Uh, so that's uh, also something to keep in mind. 
And the person question, define how personal you are comfortable uh, to be beforehand. I mean, talk to the reporter, uh, something that we learned is talk to the reporter, let them know that you're not uh, comfortable with any personal question. Other things that we learned which are to, to keep in mind during uh, this time uh, uh, is that, that the relationship between the journalist and expert is, is, is really built on mutual need. Uh, uh, they need us and we need them uh, and, and that's uh, really important to keep in mind. <coughs> Uh, and also, it's okay to say no. If you receive a suggestion uh, that actually you're not comfortable with, it's, fi it's fine to say that I'm not comfortable with this suggestion. Um, and in, in the long run, it's good to build a good relationship with contacts in the media who will, who will contact you again. Uh, and again, this is a relationship built on, on mutual uh, need. So you can do all these things, and you can remember these things perfectly, uh, but I want to raise one, one point that I actually uh, think it's important. Uh, do we need to think twice before talking to the media? Okay. Uh, this is something that came up uh, when uh, Frida uh, at our department uh, had to give an explanation uh, to in Expressen about the common climate skeptic myths. Uh, and she, after that, she's been receiving many unpleasant emails. Uh, this is one of them, and I, uh, Frida gave me the permission to share that. Uh, the subject is just, what fun Sisler do mea? Okay, that's the first thing. Uh, and I will not read all of this, uh, but I can just say one of the things there. Uh, Stockholms Universitet, då var det en läroanstalt, nu är det en broilerfabrik för klimatalarmister. Uh, det finns flera institut i Sverige som sprider lögner. SMHI är ett sådant. Um, och, and then you, you can read more, more about this, uh, what's actually. So, so it's, the answer to, to this, the question that I'm asking here is definitely no. Okay? I think our job as climate scientists is actually to, to be out there and to share our uh, knowledge. Um, and so no matter if the, the, there will always be unpleasant uh, skeptics out there. But I'm very happy to discuss this issue a little bit uh, further uh, after, after this talk. Um, okay, so what have we achieved so far in, this, in, in the Climate Answers Group? Uh, I think we have established a, a very strong group of scientists from the Boleyn Center uh, that are ready to help with any climate-related uh, questions. Uh, for us, I think we built a, a great forum for, for, for the scientists to develop important skills on how to effectively communicate science to general public and the media. And I want, we also have been thinking about future goal and that's to become more proactive, okay? Uh, you can produce excellent research with profound important findings, uh, but if the only people who, who know about this is the people around you, that's, that's not enough. I mean, you want to have that, you want to be able to um, uh, have more of an impact of your research, and, and, and that's, that's becoming more proactive. Uh, if you have a good relationship to journalists, you would say, you, you would call that journalist and say, hey, we have a great story here, uh, and, and with great implications, could you, could you write a piece about that? So that's becoming more, more proactive uh, in, in, in the future. And we actually have a, a planned breakfast meeting uh, next month with journalists to talk about these, these issues. Because one of the things that came up is that we don't know even actually how the journalists work. We don't know how they get, where they get the stories from and how they work out these, uh, these pieces. So, so this planned breakfast meeting is just to get to know them better, to, to, to get to know their workflow, and to introduce uh, us as, as the Climate Answers Group here. So thank you. And if you're interested in joining the group, you can contact the... the uh, Annika and Eva, and we would very much like to have more scientists from the humanities and social sciences, actually. I think we have the great natural sciences group, but we, mo we need more from, from the social sciences and humanities. So, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Leon, uh, for uh, not only your hard work, but the hard work of the um, all the team at Climate Answers. It's time for some questions. Uh, everyone. Yes. Uh, 
I think it's really a great initiative. And uh, I've been working at SMHI for a couple of months now. And I also wanted to share that there we had during Afika also a list of appreciating and warm comments from the public on all the work. And uh, maybe in counterproductive what negative no. we got here. And the public is also really grateful for all our work. And uh, I think that putting that out was really nice. And uh, they were also, uh, yeah, anyway, thanks a lot. And I think it's really good what you're doing. Any more questions? Ilona? Yeah, there. Yeah, thank you again for this initiative. I was just wondering if there's a plan of creating some kind of workshop or something to extend this training for the rest of the Woolene Center members. Like, because, I don't know. We could get these questions from anyone, anyone not yeah. just from the media. It could be just, yeah. I don't know, your aunt or your yeah. uncle. I was wondering if there's some kind of plan to do such a thing. I guess this is a question for you, Alistair, <laughs> or Nina. Now you've given us the idea. The answer to that question is yes. <laughs> uh, it's a great idea. We definitely need to do that. Uh, more questions? Thank you. Do you have any sort of... Uh, exchange or collaboration with Östersjö Centret, because they are, I guess, uh, a world-class organization yes. when it comes to yeah. disseminating knowledge in a format that's yeah. accessible. No, we haven't actually had yeah. any I think any, that would uh, be a great idea, contact. because but they that's are a good pros. idea, yes. Uh, yeah. And the other thing that comes to my mind is this uh, more negative aspect that you get uh, uh, kind of hopeless or hate response. There are also other institutes and centers at the university that have experience in that. Mm. Uh, the Turkish Institute, for example. Uh, everything that is hot draws that yeah, these yeah. days. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. I have three things. I think that, yeah, this is a really, really nice initiative. Then I have a question. Um, so those of us who might uh, receive questions from um, outside or from journalists but don't have time to respond immediately, can we forward these questions to you and who do we forward them to then? Yes, and Eva and Annika would be the, the, the kind of yeah, who to contact. Yeah. Great. And then a uh, third question, which is maybe not so much for you, but I was thinking of when seeing this email to Frida that Indeed, whenever something is hot and important and on the political map, then it becomes infected. And um, is there any functionality within Stockholm University to offer support um, to researchers who are dealing with media who get this kind of hot? That would be really, it would be really nice to have some th some functionality because that would also then I think lower the barrier for people to get engaged so that they know that they can get support if they. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to respond to that. So you've, if you get an unpleasant email, you can forward it to me as one of the directors of the Blaine Center, and I'll take care of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in a legal way. I'm just going to take these last two questions, and we're going to need to move on. They've already fly. Um, so I noticed that there are some common members on the committee list of this Berlin Initiative and Researchers Desk, um, which is a separate initiative to um, bring climate scientists of various kinds to talk directly to the public at stalls, particularly at protests. Um, do you have any plans to collaborate or attempt to not try on each other's toes or um, share training or anything like that? <laughs> uh, you can answer, pl please, Alistair. <laughs> <laughs> uh. uh, 
as you rightly notice, there's a large overlap in the names of the people working in Climate Answers and with the Researcher's Desk. So for those of you who don't know what the Researcher's Desk is, this is an, an initiative set up by two, uh, uh, initially by two people, Toya, who's actually in the audience with us today, and Mika, uh, a, form, a former student from the, ge uh, from the Geological Sciences. Um, this initiative uh, is a fantastic uh, uh, initiative. It set, put, puts researchers together with public audiences um, and actually a number of the events that you listed up there were actually researchers' okay. desks yeah. one. The, uh, I think the, the researchers' desk and Climate Answer are working very much in tandem and supporting each other. Um, would that be fair, Toya? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm just going to take a question and then we'll stop there. Hello. Uh, great presentation. I feel warm inside when I see this. Uh, I've been working with climate uh, communications since the 90s. And uh, I believe that uh, this is very important. Maybe we should add behavioral sciences because there's mm -hmm. so much how we behave that is not explained by natural sciences yes. yeah. that we lack. And that why don't people understand why, how we act according to the, what you don't see. We don't see the carbon dioxide. So uh, maybe that's an idea and yes. I can help with that So yeah, if you want. I think it's a good idea. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I could also add that the researcher's desk is absolutely excellent at involving the behavioral sciences and can also support climate answers with um, contacts with people. Uh, we're going to move on. Uh, I'm sure you've got loads more questions. Give an applause for the young people. Um, it's a real pleasure now to present Ava. I will say, not say Ava's last name because she always tells me off of <laughs> saying it wrongly, so I will just call you Ava. Um, and Ava's uh, won an award for uh, setting up a new communication project during the spring. And uh, it'd be lovely if you could tell us about that. I'll just tell you, Ava is, has, been, has just been with the Blean Centre for maybe five months working, mm -hmm. as a, uh, working in our uh, coordination team. And, uh, and has also, by the way, arranged the Baleen Days, which you're enjoying right now. So she is your hero. A big applause for her. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Eva Gulfe, or Gulfe in Swedish. Um, so, yes, I've been working here as a communicator and a coordinator uh, since August. Um, but from the spring, I will not do the same sort of tasks. I will work with uh, communication within the Bowling Center, but it's a specific project. So that's what I'm going to tell you about. Um, interactive research briefs for the general public. So I will tell you about the Hasselblad anniversary stipend, because they are the ones funding this project, uh, the project idea that I had. Um, the framework for the project, and this is mainly for uh, scientists who want to be involved. Uh, the framework is what I want to, uh, that's the message that I want to give to you. And the next step, or the first step, actually, because I haven't started really. So Hasselblad is a camera brand, quite an old one, and the founder was really interested in birds, and so his hobby was to photograph birds. And ever since, the foundation has supported um, scientists within natural sciences, but also photography. Um, and also, they used a Hasselblad camera at the moon landing. So this year, it was the 50th, it was the anniversary, as it was 50 years ago. So that's why they had these extra prizes and extra grants and stuff. And then they came up with uh, the anniversary anniversary stipend. It was going to go to one person who is under 30, actively working with communicating natural sciences, which I'm doing here, and I have done it before as well, um, and a person who has an intriguing idea for a communication project, which I had. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a picture from when I got the, the grant. It was really fun to get a grant when you only applied for something. I haven't actually done anything yet. But it was a nice thing. And Tina Umer is the other one who received uh, the stipend um, in photography. So my project idea. I wanted to do research briefs. Um, I wanted to do it because it's something I've done before and I thought it was so much fun. I did it at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, Swedish EPA. And 
Well, they finance a bunch of research projects every year. And at the end of these, very often, they want to communicate them to officers within, uh, well, within the specific field that the research project connects to. So in this case, it had to do with green infrastru infrastructure and uh, biodiversity and how to plan landscape, things like that. Um, and so this is one of the research briefs that we did. So the target group were these officers who work with this on a daily basis um, at municip municipalities within the EPA and also at uh, county administrations. It was a lot of text and it was supposed to just briefly give the main results so that they can be advised in their work. And actually, for this specific project, uh, Sarah Cousins was part of it, who is here at the Bowen Center, which was extra fun to know someone um, in that context. And I want to make these research briefs interactive. And the main inspiration for that is the Bowen Center database has this beautiful graph I saw a while ago. It's temperature data from I don't know how many years back, but you can go back and forth and look what the weather was like, what the temperature was like on a specific day. And I showed it to my dad, who is 60. He thought it was so much fun. I showed it to my cousins, who are five. They thought it was so much fun. <laughs> and I think it's very much fun. So that's something that really intrigues me. And I want to incorporate this in my research briefs. I want it to be a part of it. So this will depend on what kind of uh, pro research project the, the brief is about. Um, it will depend on the data that the research provides. Maybe it will end up as a graph, maybe it will end up as a map of some sort, or something different. That's just about being creative, basically. And <coughs> they are for two target groups. It's both for the general public, and then a little smaller, more specific one, is for specific age groups. And then I will try and follow uh, curricula, because if I do that, teachers can incorporate it in, their, uh, in the classroom. If I don't follow curricula, they will quite um, likely feel that they don't have time to put something extra in, the, in their classes. I will tell you more about the target groups. So these will be uh, published at the Bowling Center webpage. The webpage will be redone shortly. It will look a bit different. And then my hope is that at the end of this project, we will have research um, that is communicated in a short and concise way, and that there's a library of this at the webpage um, that anyone can go in and look at and understand easily. And it will also be part of the House of Science newsletter. So the House of Science, they take on um, classes to their house and they uh, hold lessons where they talk about natural sciences and they have a really broad network. So this newsletter is read by um, several hundred teachers, I think, and they have promised that the research briefs can be communicated there, which is really nice. So the target groups. The general public sounds super broad, and it is. And uh, my hope is that the ones who read it will not have to have any higher education. That means that all scientific terms have to be explained carefully, no abbreviations at all, and it has to be visually attractive. Um, when you go in, you, you're supposed to want to read more. Um, and the school groups that is very specific. It has to be tailored to suit the age of the pupils and also tailored to suit specific uh, curricula. So the framework. Uh, the results of the project that the scientists bring to this uh, communication project, those results have to have been published already or ready to publish because this project will be during the coming spring. So I want to release them right away so it doesn't matter if it's a bit of an older project, if it's older research. Um, most likely the general public doesn't know of it anyways. So 
and a mutual cooperation has to be possible. Um, with that, I mean both that I, I'm, I'm going to have to compromise a lot. Perhaps I will make suggestions uh, of a way to communicate something where the scientists feel like I'm making it too easy or I'm giving the wrong image. And uh, the same goes for the scientists itself, that they have to compromise and we have to meet halfway. I also, with mutual co cooperation, I also mean that this project will take some time, not a whole lot. Um, I will want to have quite a few meetings with the scientists involved. Uh, so it's not just to leave me a paper and then go. I will have questions, I will, have, I will want to discuss. So, yeah. And the next step. The project starts officially in January. I have started to think about what I want to do and uh, what I want things to look like already. So uh, you're welcome to contact me now, but I will officially start working with it in January. And the goal is that these research briefs will be presented at the Bolin Center Climate Festival, which is in May. So if you would like to be a part of this, please contact me. This is my email address, and then we can discuss uh, how your research can be incorporated is in this kind of uh, research brief. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hear from some of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva, and also congratulations on receiving the award. Thank you. And we're very glad you're going to be staying here with us to um, take this work forward. I've already seen a question. I know that you can work enormously hard, but how many do you think you can produce? What is, how, what is your target number? How many projects do you want? I have a hope that it will be somewhere in between 10 and 15. That's great. At the EPA, I did um, six in uh, about five weeks, and that worked well. So contact Eva quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great project. So, is it you who's gonna make the cool and attractive visualizations yourself? Yes. In in design or is something else or what? I haven't decided quite yet, but that's part of the grant that I will be able to download whatever suitable uh, program, and also I will very likely take a course in some uh, design. Okay. Stuff. Nice. <laughs> um, and, and this is going to be our last question. Is, is Hey, awesome presentation. Um, when you're talking about targeted age groups for children and the school groups, have you got a particular age bracket to, that you're aiming for? I just know when we've previously, in my previous work, produced this educational toolkit on climate change for children, um, we focused intentionally on 9 to 13-year-olds because that's the best sort of group to, to really target to create change. So is there a, is there a target group here? Um, not specifically. I know that the, curricula, uh, the curriculum can mention specific uh, terms that are connected to climate science. So ecosystem services is part of fourth grade, I think. And so I will try and look at those specific terms and map out where I can go with that. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, we're now going to move on to a no another really uh, excellent communication and education uh, initiative, uh, which has been uh, led. This is a course. This has been uh, led by Arian Gustafsson, and it's uh, called Climate Change Solutions, uh, an initiative coming from California. And uh, I'll hand over to you, Arian, to tell us about it. Thank you, Alistair, and thanks for. Uh, at the coffee break yesterday asking me if I could step in and do this in the final session. <laughs> uh, uh, which I was, um, I'm very happy I did because uh, this morning at our department meeting at ACES, I was supposed to talk about this course and I had forgotten. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was very lucky because that I remember and, and um, I get two chances today. <laughs> yeah. um, I just would like to comment first that I, I think uh, the uh, the session has been uh, really, really good and interesting. And I also like to personally thank the Bolin Center 
has given me a lot for my own research and uh, also education and personally. Uh, I was more involved in the first five, six, seven years from 2005 and forward with Johan, Clem and Martin Jokosen and others. And now I feel more like a very happy uh, foot soldier in the Bolivian Center Army. I'm very happy to, to carry the flag forward. And I think you're doing a fantastic job, Alistair and Nina and everyone. Uh, it's it's uh, impressive how, how to see how it's developing. Also now in education. Uh, I think what I'm, we're going to talk about is a little bit of an unusual course, at least for me. Uh, it's a little bit different than most other courses that we have been teaching in our departments. Uh, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about uh, the, uh, the first time through that we're just uh, finishing right now. So this is uh, the course uh, uh, it's called Climate Change Solutions, Bending the Curve. It's a short course. It caters to students from all disciplines at the university. Uh, and as you'll see, it's also team taught by teachers from across the university. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's offered in a hybrid format. So there is a lot of online material for the students first to take in. Toya is one of the students, for instance. There might be someone else here. Uh, and uh, uh, that ends with a little quiz to see that everything is there. And then we meet in the classroom and that has been such an experience. I never had such a classroom feeling in other, in other courses. Um, it's uh, been super engaging in the classroom. Uh, and also outside the classroom, I understand. Many of the students have been keep on meeting both before and after and they started uh, uh, communication groups on uh, various social media and so on, so it's really taken off. We didn't know, this was like an experiment. And uh, it's really was thanks to the Berlin Center, which I will mention soon why that happened. Um, it was actually last year's Berlin Climate Lecture that gave us the, uh, the seed for this, Ramanatta. So we had this new course, completely unproven, unheard of, no marketing, and we had almost 300 applicants, which is a lot for our kind of departments. To see. Uh, it says something good about the interest for the topic. And we were able to admit 50 or so and pretty much everyone carried through in a very good fashion. Uh, so it was very good. Uh, the other uh, outcome of it, and here's a, by the way a photo from our very first gathering. You see Alistair there in the corner and, and uh, some other teachers from across the faculties. It also served to catalyze interactions of the researchers and teachers across four faculties around the climate change challenge, which I think will have uh, benefits uh, beyond this little course. And so I'd like to share some of that with you. But I'd like to say a little bit what, where this comes from and some of the influencers behind this course. Uh, these are two key influencers for me. That's different influences than what my teenage kids have. I wish we could turn the, teen, the, the influence that my ki teenage kids have into this. But maybe you guys have some idea how to do that. I, I don't have that right now, but it would be something. So anyways, Bert Bolin, as you know, fantastic. Uh, when I was taking and understanding the, the uh, carbon cycle as a PhD student, we were taught from his book. And as you know, he has had huge impact both in biochemistry and climate change and in taking the science to solutions, or trying to make solutions out of it. Um, the other one here I listed is Ramanathan, uh, which many of us have collaborated with, who is sort of following the same path. First a fantastic scientist, and then taking that into real actions, including initiating this climate change solution breaking the curve uh, protocol in the University of California system, which has the support at the highest level of the president of that university. Huge resources, and I'll talk some about that. Uh, so, Stockholm University, like all universities in my mind, are extremely conservative organizations. And maybe that's good in many cases too. It takes time to change. But here, we got this idea over a cup of coffee with Ramanatha a year ago, plus a few days. And uh, now we've finished through the course the first time. So it was pretty quickly marched by, by this army of people and some others, taking it into approval by the faculty and so on. 
Uh, and as you see here, the, here's the, the teachers this first time through. They're presenting many different uh, departments and the competencies. And that's a little bit the, the key for this type of course, because it's very, very broad. Um, so you see some are classical departments here in the house, but also several other ones that contributed quite heavily, uh, which was uh, uh, fantastic. We were team teaching. We tried to team teach across from natural science to social science to humanities and law, being in the classroom at the same time, interacting with the students. Um, maybe Toya can say something later how it worked out. <laughs> um, so the idea with the course was to focus, sort of have a positive outlook with this very serious challenge that we're facing, to see what can we do. And there are lots of things we can do. Looking at scale, first we start with the science. What's the state? So we had Frida do that largely. And I was helping out a little bit on that. And then look at scalable solutions across many different disciplines to bend the curve of climate warming toward carbon neutrality and climate stability, sustainable development. So the idea is to provide students with, a, with, a, with this, an introduction to this grand challenge and not be overwhelmed, but realize that there, there are structures. It's not chaotic out there. There are ways that society is handling this challenge in different, different parts. So sort of map that out a little bit in our minds, which is to give some hope, I think. Uh, Alistair, who's been central in this effort, can also comment. Uh, to that. Um, there was a, a, the climate change solutions was created by the University of California system and we're one of the first sort of guinea pigs outside that. So we're gonna feed back information to them. In the end our teachers were quite ambitious and many of the sort of uh, uh, curricula that was provided to us by the University of California was completely remade. So we used uh, minor components of that, maybe most of the stuff already the first year was created from scratch by our teachers, or adapted. So the curves to bend, you know them. Um, CO2 is higher than it's been for many hundreds of thousands of years. The CO2 level in the current atmosphere is increasing, keep on increasing, and that's the, the, the the plot to the upper right there is uh, from the Keeling, father and son. And the son, he was here also as a Boleyn climate lecturer just a few years ago. And the question is if we're being thrown out of the stable climate that we had in the, in the Holocene. So this, bending these curves is a massive effort. And someone, uh, which I, 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 I subscribe to this too, uh, on a personal level, it's a serious challenge. And, uh, here is one way to look at it. How will we be looked upon in history, our generation? The one that had the knowledge but did not act? Or the one that bent the curves? It's a little bit sharp, perhaps, but it, it boils down to something like that. And of course, we're not expecting any, not any single individual will be a big hero, but it's, it's a communal effort. To do, and it's a serious, serious uh, issue. So um, I think the one in green there is, is is more fun to work on. So I don't know if there's a point here, but maybe I don't need it. But you're probably familiar with these curves. How are we going to get there? So the state of the situation now is that we have about 600 gigatons carbon or so, maybe 700, um, left to emit until we're crossing serious thresholds in the Earth's system that will be irreversible and have large consequences. So we keep on emitting 40 gigatons per year or so right now. And on the upper left there, the yellow line there, is a suggestion that in order to limit us to 600 gigatons or 700 gigatons, we have to start bending that curve in the year 2020. And then we have to, to decrease it by half every 10 years until we reach climate neutrality around 2045. So it's a tall task for humanity. Uh, and it's not enough because um, that's the black line over here is that curve that we have to follow then. And at the same time though, we have to engineer carbon sinks 
to the size of at least the emissions, annual emissions of uh, China and the US combined at the same time as we're decreasing the emissions. So it's a serious task and it has to happen now. Of course, if you don't reach two, it's better to reach 2.7 than 3.7. It's a different world. Yeah. So the course is, uh, is then presented and organized according to six clusters and 10 different solution classes to bend the curve. So that's here. So number one is the science solution. Science is in the center by meaning. It's all rest in science and we need to continue to hone our knowledge, both of the climate system and our interactions with it. Uh, then of course there are a lot already of uh, uh, technological solutions and there, there needs to be. There are many different kinds of them. So we, we're covering them in the course too. But as we see, even though a lot of things are happening, really, there are, but they are, according to the WMO, that happens at the rate of about a factor of five to six too slow right now, still. But it's not enough with science and technology. We need to do all these other things in society too, likely to make this positive shift happening. So anything from societal transformations, behavioral sciences or behaviors, governance, finance regulations and so on. And we're going through that with different teachers at Stockholm University then working together. So that's the organization. And this one I put together rather quickly this morning. Um, but the visions for taking this further is uh, to offer this hybrid course again next year, a little bit upscale, uh, develop the, the curricula. And then the big challenge is of course of scaling this effort. And the scaling can be in several different dimensions. One is to do that to different participants and audiences. We've been discussing doing it to grade school students, to the general public, to decision makers, there are interests. Um, and I put in your suggestion over FICA yesterday, Alistair, that now with Stockholm University and our, our president has signed off, I don't know exactly the right words for, for what she signed off on, but it's a recognition that there is a, 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 there is a serious situation with the climate. The climate emergency. When we sign off on that, we need to do something more than just marginal things as the capital university of Sweden. So one suggestion Alistair had that we, maybe we should offer this type of course to all our employees. It's one of many ideas and I, I, I like it too. The other one is to go global. And uh, uh, of course we need to, it really means going global. And um, I think it's possible. There is a really good portfolio now. Uh, we need to hone it still. I was having saved up a lot of different good reasons. I, I took the airplane to China a few weeks ago. And among many other things, I met with some of the leading universities in Beijing and Guangzhou and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And there is interest also in China to take on and teach this type of package. Um, the way we can possibly leverage and scale it is we talk with the hub directors of Future Earth. Uh, there's also been contact with the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network you know, of Jeffrey Sachs and Johan Rockström and others to, uh, to try to, to spread it wider. Um, so that's a few ideas of the direction of this, but uh, we are very, very happy to receive suggestions and reactions uh, to that. And I'd like to share at the end here that there is also uh, paid by Bill Gates uh, this free book out there um, now, um, Bending the Curve, that is possible to, uh, to look into for anyone that is interested. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Arian, for an inspiring presentation of what is definitely an inspiring course. I've taught one session on it, and I confirm everything. It's a great team of students to work with, and I certainly look forward to this course expanding and getting bigger. It's really good. But uh, time for a question or two? Thanks. I might be wrong, but I think in your list of people involved, um, I couldn't see any engineering people. Is that true? And if so, why? Because you specifically want to focus on like the human human humanities as well, or yeah. why not? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's correct. Uh, 
so we, we tried to march pretty quickly to get it off the ground this year. And we don't have any, any engineering school at Stockholm University. But it's possible to take in. But the level that this is taught is also rather fundamental and rudimentary. It's, it, it doesn't take any prerequisites as long as we enter the university. So we had also students with a good spread. About a quarter of the students were from the natural sciences, a quarter from the social sciences and humanities, another third or so, some from law. So uh, uh, we had this, this good spread, and that's, that's one of the points um, to have in the course. We had a lot of discussions and interactions, and then we had representation from different backgrounds. Engineering would be good to add, but uh, the material is not so complicated that it was not possible to access it without an engineering professor in the room. Yeah. I can take one more question. Otherwise, I'm absolutely sure Arian will be happy to talk to people over the dinner and everything. Thank you very sure. much indeed, Arian. Thank you. Thank you. Just in just a second. So, um, Marlon Shilander is just going to is coming up here to uh, give us a reminder and a little bit of an update on the mentoring program. So, Marlon, would you be so kind? Well, now Alistair has said everything I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks Oops. for stealing the show. Uh, if you guys missed. Uh, my little blurb or presentation on the first day. We have a mentoring system at the Berlin Center. Uh, we pair junior uh, researchers with senior researchers, and uh, we do it on a yearly basis. So happy new year. It's time to get new mentors or sign up for a mentor. Uh, you can do that online by going to the mentoring system uh, on the Berlin website, and you will find an online form to fill in. And so uh, if you'd like to have a mentor, please sign up. If you would like to be a men yes, if you want to be a mentor, uh, we would be really, really happy to have you because the more mentors we have, the better we can match uh, with the wishes of the people signing up for the program. Uh, so deadline is December 6th. Uh, you have a question, Molly. <laughs> yes, um, I have been particularly happy with the mentoring program, and I was wondering if there is maybe a possibility to give Special thanks to our mentors at the sec next Boleyn Days in some sort of way, have a prize or whatever. You can just bring money. <laughs> <laughs> we're good with that. Um, yeah, I know, uh, I think you mailed about this with Ahota. Uh, and uh, yeah, we haven't really developed, I mean, we're doing this because uh, we've all had people who've helped us. Uh, so we're not, not in it for the fame or glory, really. It's just more for helping people. Thank you, Marlon. Um, let's turn that off. So we come to the end of the 11th uh, Boleyn days. And uh, I want to, as I've made a tradition now, mention just a few things I've learned throughout these uh, spectacular um, sets of talks. I learned lots, of course, um, and I'll just highlight six of those things that, uh, that spring to my mind when I was putting together this presentation, as you will understand, as I'm going to show pictures from the previous talks at lunchtime today. Um, I, I learned that we're able to visualize um, the, uh, the formation of atmospheric aerosols in the Arctic Ocean. Watch them, watch them grow. I learned that at the Eocene Oligocene transition, we have good reason to believe that the, clo the, uh, the closing off of the Arctic Ocean um, led to Atlantic overturning, which drives the present day climate that we enjoy in Europe. I learned that we can look at dust layers and peat bogs to learn about past storminess um, back in uh, periods of up to 10,000 years or longer. 
I learned that in the Boleyn Center database, um, we have maps from which we can, do, uh, we can look at uh, carbon fluxes to the Arctic Ocean. I learned that we can use uh, objects, archaeological finds, to, do, to look at and study how glaciers have moved in the past. And I learned that I can myself apply online <laughs> for money to make my own wetland. <laughs> and uh, I can do it as a carbon sink. And I thought proactively, I actually will apply to do that. And I'll put it in the middle of the runway at Arlanda Airport. <laughs> and, and why I'm figuring I a double carbon sink by the reduction in air traffic. <laughs> But this has been a special year uh, because we're witnessing, a, we're witnessing the first stage of a societal transformation. And there's more I've learned this year. And I want to share two things I learned about, two things I learned about climate in general in 2019. And both of them are going to be quotes. And the quotes from a meeting in Lausanne. Um, the meeting was called SMILE. Uh, it was organised by the youth organisation Fridays for Future. Uh, it was a conference of about 450 young people who travelled by train to, this, uh, to the city of Lausanne and met to decide where this, uh, uh, where this uh, movement will go in the future. They opened the conference with two key phrases. Um, and, the first, and I'm going to tell you both of them. The first one is you're never too old to learn. Now this speaks to me as a rather old climate scientist, past 50 now. And I realized, what did I learn this year? I learned the meaning of this curve, this curve that we look at as climate scientists. Um, and we look at it and we see a gradual increase in temperature from 1880 to 2018. It's a fascinating curve. As scientists, we, we, part of the thing we reach out to is the simple fascination of watching change. And then when we extend the time series to 2,000 years, we see it's really a radical difference from a very stable climate over the past 2,000 years. And then when we add the um, IPCC um, forecast for business as usual, we see a curve that both stuns us and um, drives our research I learned the meaning of that curve this year, that it's not just a graph. Um, it's an existential threat. It is defining our future. And Arian talked about bending that curve. Um, and that is what we're really here for. The second thing I learned at that meeting, and the second key phrase that was used at the, end, at the introductory speeches was, you are never too small to make a difference. And of course, that's referring to Greta Thunberg and, of course, the many, many other young people who sit at places such as, uh, for example, Mint Tory at every Friday. But I'm also not too small to make a difference. And no one in this room is too small to make a difference. That phrase does not just speak to young protesters. It speaks to us all. I was pleased that the Berlin Centre was willing to put together this to state that the concerns expressed by these young protesters are justified. The Berlin Centre's board put itself behind that statement, which is important to stand behind these young people and, pass, and say we, that what they're doing has science behind them. Stockholm University, one university in Scandinavia, in a small part of Europe, in a small part of the world, is not too small to make a difference. Um, the rector of Stockholm University signed the SDG Accord, the university and college sector's collective response to the global goals. This was a statement of a climate emergency. It had three points, and I only lift up the most important one. The most important one, the Stockholm University has committed itself to going carbon neutral by 2040. That's an enormous task. Stockholm University is, however not, however, not too small to make a difference. Uh, and we will be carbon neutral by 2040. The rector has already called in the Berlin Centre, 
representatives, SRC, to talk about how that's actually going to become a reality. Um, there'll be a meeting on the 3rd of December, uh, open meeting to learn more about uh, St Stockholm University being carbon neutral by 2040. So those were two quotes from Lausanne uh, from, the, from the Young People's Movement. Another quote, and I hope you know who it's by, <coughs> serious but not hopeless. Um, it was, of course, said in Swedish. It was written in Svenska Dagbladet, and it was written in the beginning of 2008. Uh, it, it was written, Alvarlig, Menente Hopeless. It was written by Bert Berlin, uh, after whom this, re this uh, research consortium is named. Uh, Bert Berlin did so many things for us. Um, he gave scientists a voice through the IPCC. A brilliant researcher. He plot in, a, in a paper published in 1959, he plotted this figure. This figure shows carbon dioxide in parts per million. Uh, how it would be, he, how he uh, forecast it would increase uh, by the year 2000. I'll add to that figure the measurement data from ice cores in Mauna Loa. A phenomenal prediction, a phenomenal forecast, a phenomenal scientist, and Bert told us to get out there and talk and communicate. So why are we here? What's our role as climate scientists in the enormous challenge that we have in front of us? Of course, we should do the obvious. Of course, we should look at every CO2 molecule we release and ask, is it necessary? And if it's not necessary, we do not release it. Of course we do that. But we have an extra thing that we can contribute to the fight against carbon dioxide, the fight against global warming. We can create, we are here to create and to communicate the fundamental knowledge that must guide the decisions which will define our children's future. That is why we're here. Every single paper that you write is a part of that. Never underestimate your scientific contribution and the value of that. There would be no IPCC report without the hard work of you as scientists. We're now switching to a, a time where we really have to think a lot about communicate. Uh, you've heard a lot of communication initiatives today and we all need help and support to do this. Um, over the past year, I've given a lot of public lectures about climate, and I've learned something. I've learned that what's actually needed to be taught is the stuff that we all know, every single one of us as climate scientists, the absolute basics. Every one of us can, can lecture for the public on climate. Every one of us can communicate. None of us needs to be afraid of doing that. And by spreading knowledge, we are defining our children's future and making it a good one. This is a view of Brunsviken. It was taken um, just before I went and applied to be one of the directors of the Berlin Center for Climate Research. That puts it, in, that puts it back in the winter of 2012. It looks beautiful. I don't, I'm not sure that my grandchildren will see this. I'm not sure they will see Brunswick and Frozen. We have a choice. Arian said it very well. I'm going to express it in a slightly different way. We enter a new decade, and I ask us to make a New Year's resolution. This decade is the 20s. At the end of the 20s is 2030. That is what the SDGs are referring to. At the end of, tw at the end of this coming decade, we have to have halved our carbon emissions. I ask us to make a resolution to make the 20s the decade we bent the curves of climate change. So, those are my concluding remarks. I will now move to the practical details of the evening. Thank you. 
and of course to announcing the winner of the poster competition. So what happens? I have, according to that clock, three minutes left. I actually have seven minutes. Um, so you will have to sit here for seven more minutes. Then you will be released and there will be a welcome drink in the Northern Hull foyer just outside. Um, you've got a period of time for that, hour, hour and a half. Sometime between 6 and 6.30, you'll be called down to dinner on the bottom floor of the building, uh, the room called U1, which is the student area generally. Uh, there will be a dinner um, served for us, uh, and that will be followed by a Cayley um, and a pub. The pub will be hosted by the Geology Club. Um, at 11 o'clock, we will throw you out, or you can help tidying up. I'm going to define the word Cayley um, because that is uh, a word that maybe oh, many of you now know what this word means. You've been here before. Cayley is a Gaelic word. Its approximate meaning is a social gathering with dance and music. It is about participating and having fun. It is not about getting it right. And you will probably find it easier after a couple of glasses of wine or beer. I wish you good luck and I expect to see you on the dance floor, uh, which for you lot will be indoors. Uh, because none of you listen to me when I'm actually calling the dances, uh, I, will give you, I will give you the geometry of the dances. Um, we will be doing a dance called Strip the Willow. It's a Scottish dance. Um, the when I say strip the willow, there will be four ladies facing four men. Uh, the caller will be me, so you will see how that's structured. That's the easy one. You'll be sets of eight people. Uh, when it comes to the dashing white sergeant, I will refer to you being the spokes of a wheel. The wheel will be the pillar in the middle of the U1 uh, dining area. And a wheel looks like that with like spokes sticking out, just like a bicycle wheel you will form an orderly structure, as shown. Um, <laughs> it's a great dance for the, for the uh, lady who would like two men or the man who would like two ladies. You are in sets of three. Depending on how well you do with that, we may do an eight some reel. That will mean you will form a ring of eight um, and the caller will be somewhere. Um, if uh, I'm feeling very brave, which I probably won't do, but if I'm feeling very brave, we will do a Swedish dance. And that's a very, very long dance in terms of length, not time. <laughs> uh, and you can see the structure. OK, that's all your Cayley training for this evening. Uh, so it is time to announce the winners of this year's Boleyn Centre uh, Best Student Poster Competition. So, in third place, uh, winning a prize of 5,000 krona for research, um, not for anything else, <laughs> for research, is poster number 14, The Future of Arctic Sea Ice by Evelyn Decker, winning 10% of the vote. Thanks. In second place, um, with 11% of the vote, is poster number nine, local adaptation to seasonal cues in a range of expanding butterfly by Mats Eatonen. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Mats will be uh, gets ten thousand krona for research. And winning uh, the first prize of for the best student poster, um, a prize of twenty thousand krona in research money, um, is poster number eleven. Drier and wetter. What does it mean in climate change studies? 
by Nina Roth. But I thank you all for your posters, all for your contributions to making these a really special Boleyn Days. And I end by welcoming you back to the 12th Boleyn Days in 2020, November 18th, 19th. Thank you very much.